and Muzz got mad at me, the coach said, he goes, Jesus Christ, why don't you just wear two nines? And I went, okay. Please, please, please never do that. Yep. So. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 468 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney, from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka, here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. We're a couple weeks into the season, Halloween is on the horizon, boy's a little gussied up for it tonight. Let's see what's going on. Gee, let's go to you first. Producer Mikey Rally, what are you, a lobster, a, a crab? Yeah, a way to go already. You got bug? it. <laughs> what a guess. Oh, I didn't see his fucking mitts. What a, what a guess by R.A. Could have been I a tell crayfish, you what, crawfish. It is the year of the warthog, folks. It's he was the- able to guess that a man in a giant red costume with claws is a lobster. <laughs> could have been a crayfish. It's the Halloween a, special, a no, boys. No, no what, else, what, a, what it could it have been, R.A.? Tell a us. Cra- a crawfish slash crayfish. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't see the, the obviously, I see the, if I saw the claws i know it was a lobster okay. i don't know a, a bed bug uh crab lice bed I don't bug. Know, one of <laughs> ra's on when he was stick handling one of ra's <laughs> favorite food groups the the lobster lobster oh, rolls man. everything, lobster, everything lobster. you eat lobster related uh, what what's the reason g why a lobster uh, I just I love wearing a nice suit, a nice comfortable suit like this, where you can throw a t-shirt and sweatpants on under it, so you're comfortable all night. I've always been yeah. a big advocate of finding a nice, comfortable Halloween costume, and you know, gotta rep New England, you know, lobster, you know. But yet, the the you see the person, and you're like, hey, that's funny, he's dressed as a giant lobster. I got I gave you the chuckle when I hopped on, but the comfort aspect I can roll with, and I and I really respect. And I've always wanted to do a Halloween special. I'm a big costume guy. I love dressing up. This weekend, I went to a Halloween party. My girlfriend didn't really want to dress up beforehand. I threw a hissy fit. We ended up driving to Target like 10 minutes before the party. I got a nice little ensemble. But big Halloween guy. Very glad we're doing the Halloween special this year. So you're like, you're the girl in the relationship. You were the one bickering about the fact you were going to show up not dressed up. Boys, I am such... A girl, the girl in this relationship. I'll send you guys a video. I'm I shocked. needed a. Does uh, Alana put the strap on? On? Does she, ba- ever, honestly, biz. <laughs> when I ever. when I send you this video, I Thank needed you. to put like a install this like clothes hanger thing on my wall where you needed to drill and do all this shit. Okay, you're not a handyman. I'm not the handyman, so she was doing it. <laughs> Task well, I'm rabbit, like, bro. She, she's Task got the, rabbit. What, what the what? Task rabbit. People oh, call. I always go for Task rabbit. That's but who you call. Yeah. Alana's well, I actually got, got a guy who came from TaskRabbit, and then now he's like my personal guy. Hey, Alana's got the tool belt with the, the matching uh, strap on. <laughs> just, give, just giving it to G, the girl in the relationship. I'm like setting up a charcuterie board while she's like has a cigarette in her mouth. She's like drilling into the wall. <laughs> she's I'm a, chewing. I'm a pussy. She's like, the fucking- Mike, what do you want for dinner? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> do, you have a, do you have a birthday month, Mike? A birthday month or a birthday week? Oh yeah, big oh, birthday month. Just guy. a straight diva. Oh. He's painting his nails on the watching TV. She's Michelle doing all the Grinnell sounds pretty nice actually. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, it's a tough one. My dad used to call me that. Hey, I mean, <laughs> hey, since we're kind of on this topic, uh, pull Yarvi. Oh, Holy shit, did he go all in on that costume? That's probably that'll go down as the best hands down. And to go even further, like I actually think that he's probably more attractive than the actual Ice Spice. Like if you wit, I'll throw I don't it even over know you. Ice Spice. I think you're going to say he was hotter as a girl. <laughs> like I thought I saw the 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 picture that was tweeted out of So him you were probably like, what the fuck like, is this? I, I didn't know. I, I just was like, whoa, this guy's into some <laughs> freaky shit, but I didn't really understand that there was into. an actual couple or whatever who what who, who are the originals ice spice and who's the guy pete pete davidson, pete davidson. so who is ice spice a rapper yeah she there, i mean the female rappers they turn over so quickly now but she had this t- uh, what was like the she, song g uh, was, uh i can't i can't munch, say the word I'm a munch but it's or that, something that uh, a munch i'm a munch you know or it's it's i i didn't like it it didn't catch on for me but it just it caught a wave and i think she's had a few other hits in the meantime I don't think she's as big as Cardi B. I think Cardi B reigns queen right now of the female rappers. Uh, uh, what's it, uh, Who's the guy who does Sunday Conversation? Caleb. Caleb, he, Sexy Red was so good. Who? What's her name? He, he did it with Sexy Red, and it was so funny. That's the girl who's like, my coochie pink, my booty hole is brown. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Teaching, uh, teaching uh, the real, kids colors. 
Yeah, some real poetic stuff coming out of these female rappers <laughs> these days. <laughs> the booty, the booty hole brown. She doesn't, she doesn't bleach it like some of these other girls. You guys those- gotta watch that because Caleb was like, "Is your booty hole brown? Like, why is it brown? It's it's just an unreal. It's absurd. It's it's just, so it's just absurd. But uh, going back to Ice Spice, and she's just um, she's a she looks different. She just has a very unique look about her. Uh, 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 I don't know. I mean, I guess I won't comment whether it gets you going or not, Wit, because you're married. But Ra, I guess I could, well, you kind of are too. But I feel like you can get away yeah, with but, this stuff. I mean, with, with guys, we always got to look. Don't touch. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, did I can't say it made it move for me, but you know, it's just that one. <laughs> that her in are you talking no, about I mean, Pooey Arvey or the actual <laughs> Ice Spice? <laughs> I'm talking about uh, finding Nemo, his other costume, the fish in the fucking fishbowl. Ice um, Spice. Where does yeah, Pooley I mean, RV play? Uh, Pooley RV, he was in Carolina. I did, Is he back he in Europe? That's Europe, a great I question. I think he might be Jesus. in Europe. Biz, isn't Lizzo on the downswing, though? Like, uh, after all this, like, so crazy Lizzo, ac- accusations? So Lizzo, I don't know what, ex- I don't know, apparently she was getting involved in some weird stuff with her backup dancers and, and saying stuff. I don't know the Lizzo drama. Uh, I'm more involved a little bit more in the, the gangster rap side of things, but uh, not really irking into the to the females business. But like I said, Cardi B, she reigns supreme. She's always rocking the new Her- Hermes bags, just spending it. I bet you I bet you Cardi B's probably pulling in 40 to 50 sheets a year. But is she happy? I, I can't argue that with you. But I know for a fact that you don't know that. <laughs> like, I can't that, prove you wrong, but I know that was completely you mean like, made up in your head. You mean like kind of like the, the, the Notre Dame fun fact that we're going to get to with Logan Cooley later that, that oh I was dead God. wrong on? But, hey, listen, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story, for fuck's sakes. Come on, salt and pepper all day. You guys ever see that Cardi B video where it's showing all her Ferraris and Lambos and then she's like, yeah, I don't even have my license. I can't even drive any of these cars. (laughs) Financial (laughs) financial education 101 here. (laughs) Paul, biz nasty, biz Are you like the naked cowboy? Is that you get up for Halloween? No, when I got on, are you broke, broke back busy again like I was at the NHL Awards? No, I don't have my jacket on. I'm paying homage right now to Joe Thornton. A oh, legend okay, of the okay. game who announced his retirement with that. I mean, it looked like a cowboy hat. And, of course, he went tarps off. I think everybody is aware that Joe Thornton was the type of guy who liked to walk around the, the, the locker room in the buck most times and loves having his tarps off. So to a legend of the game who we're going to celebrate later in the podcast and give him his flowers, as we should, uh, I figured in the first segment, uh, I do have another costume that I'll come in with after the Logan Cooley interview, but I figured off the hop, Jumbo Joe, whip out the cock, four goal special. We love you, brother. What do you share with the fucking costume changes during the podcast? <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, since uh, since I had Jeff do all the work, who's my uh, basically my personal assistant and controls my Friday. entire fucking life, uh, he sent me one, so I just want to make use of it. And I figured, like I said, what, what, what the fuck? You don't want me to change into costumes? Oh, I, the more the merrier, buddy. Just now, cracking your eggs over there. I guess we could probably hand it over to Wit first, but I, I'm still trying to guess what you got on, all right? Yeah, well, let's we'll get to that. Like the okay. wit dog, what's going on? Are you any particular pirate wit or just a uh, generic? I butt can't. pirate. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a butt pirate. Um, <laughs> I see your dirt star. I I do. Uh, <laughs> I, I I I leave it up to the wife, right? And both of our boys are being pirates. I think this is Ryder. It might be his third year being a pirate. Um, and then my son Wyatt, he just will. He just wants whatever whatever Ryder's doing. So he's obviously a pirate. So she ordered me this for trick or treating tonight. Ha. Whoosh. And I actually realized, oh, my God, when I signed on and saw G and, and Biz uh, and their costumes, I forgot to get dressed. So I ran down, put this thing on. Fits like a glove. I'm not going to lie. I don't know if I'll be able to make it the whole show with the eye patch on. It's kind of a grind right now. Um, but it, it's a pretty good look. It's a pretty legit costume. I mean, this knife is like, I mean, this thing's heavy. It's got the spikes on the knuckles. I mean, this thing's a beast. So I'm raring and ready to go. Halloween time, fun time of the year with kids. It, it's a blast. It's an Can absolute I ask blast. You- can I Had ask a good you a weekend. favor? What? Can you just keep the eye patch on till after we talk about the Heritage Classic and the Edmonton Oilers, and then and yes. then I think we okay. That's that's all Deal. I ask. Deal. Joe, uh, Biz, one of the other great costumes. Uh, Joe Pavelski's wife. She went as that Stars fan who got suckered by the guy with the kid with the mullet who was mouthing off to the big guy, and he <laughs> cracked him. She she went as him, and Joe went as like this Al fan Mike Mullet with the big mullet. But she actually got the hoodie underneath the, the game jersey with the shine. Like that's a fucking hilarious costume. That guy yeah, looks yeah, like, I mean, like a, a human Joe Dirt. I remember. Yes. That. 
that's a great great way to describe it because I don't know how many like what percentage of our audience that listens to the just the podcast forum and I mean even the ones who uh, end up listening on YouTube but like how much they follow the, the the social media and all these trends that are going on and what's happening but so the backstory was what RA this fan that showed up to a game looking like Joe Dirt who actually. I think it was during a, a TNT broadcast. Wait, but this he he I don't think he, but that's that was him dressed like normal. Like he wasn't trying to dress up. No, you, no, no, of course. Okay. Right, but he looked like Joe He's Dirt. Just I mean, a we're real talking Joe Dirt. We are talking about Dallas Stars here. He probably came from an hour out of town, right? He just fucking wheeled <laughs> Where in. Where Dolman may live, no ironically enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's his that's his roomie. Uh, but before the game started, he was the guy, you know, when they show the fans in the hallway, like, oh, yeah, like we're, we're ready to go before puck drop. He was one of the guys. And then later on, it was a clip. He was being an asshole in the seats. I think he used a racial slur. And then, boom, this guy from a seat behind him bops him right between the eyes. And then Pavelski's girl had both eyes black. So she absolutely hit hit that one out of the park. And I would say the other one circulating around online that I thought was money and I'd never seen it before was uh, uh, the Randy Johnson and then the bird. <laughs> I, I, I like that. The dead that bird. Is, I hadn't seen that before. So the dead bird and there's a, an iconic video of Randy Johnson. I mean, you must live under a fucking rock if you haven't seen this one where he pitches 100 miles an hour and just drills a bird on the way to the mound. And uh, that was that was the a bird good one. explodes. <laughs> um, <laughs> It my exploded. my favorite costume I, I got sent it uh, Brian Yandel sent it to me was somebody dressed up as the as the slide and the cop remember that cop went down the slide <laughs> remember that viral video biz that I ended up deleting because like I was asked to delete it and then it had forty five million views the cop went down the new slide in Boston and like basically broke his friggin' femur yeah. like and in, in clavicles oh. do you remember you don't remember this yeah. business no, like, Clark no, Griswold no, fucking can you send it to me oh my i'd like to watch it and so give like a, the a, costume is like this this kid's like the slide and then his buddy's like all mangled and he's the cop like attached to him it's pretty <laughs> good actually kind of reminds me of uh the clip that just went viral of uh of newsome the 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 california oh, go governor <laughs> where he just he was at a school you know they do these like photo ops like hey i'm you know worrying about education and He's outside and uh, dribbling a basketball, and he's trying to spin on his finger, and he misses twice. <laughs> and then he starts and he, like, dribbling. Trips. The, oh, just complete offensive foul drills. The kid. And then he's like and rubbing he, the kid's back. And he's, I'm like, oh yeah. And then he's he's like, in China for it. that too. That was in China. Yeah. Was it? Oh, that was in China. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So tough. Now we, uh, yeah, not 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 what a, not a, a good governor st- of a state need to be in China for? I don't. I don't know. Joke. Wouldn't that be a? Wouldn't that be like? Makes no like, sense. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what I'm trying to say here. I get <laughs> nothing. China fix California. It's the eye patch. It's the eye patch that's fucking Arr. you up. You can't put a thought together. Arr. But all right, we 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 have to guess what you're wearing here. I I will go first. I would say that you look a little bit like Eminem. Doom, 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 doom. Um, I I mean I well I don't I got jeans on too. That's I guess that's part of the the, the uh, costume. It's not really relevant. But so okay, so I'm jeans wrong. On. Okay, my le- guess le- leather is leather jacket, blue shirt, green t-shirt. You rip. are your drug dealer. <laughs> no, we're talking about Halloween, Wed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're dressing up own, as your supply. He's his own drug. <laughs> this is no. so off the fucking rails. No, uh, it's, wait, uh, G, it, G, no, no, G gets a guess. Come oh, on. Oh, absolutely. No, no, I know. I don't know. I, I mean, I would have said Eminem from, from uh, 8 Mile, but you Sam. already said that. So I, I honestly, R.A., I have no idea. I, I knew none of these would get it. Uh, one floor of the cuckoo's nest, Randall P. McMurphy. Oh, yeah. I see it now. Yeah. Oh, Doc, there's not a man alive when you're looking at that little red beaver. There's Jack no Nicholson, correct? No. Absolutely, man. One of three movies to win the five major Oscars. So my wife's like, no one's going to know. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. I'm going to know. It's a fucking Randall P. McMurphy. I'm curious so. to know how many people who are watching our YouTube uh, would know who you were coming in. Now, probably um, about. YouTube's the younger crowd. Younger say, generation. Like maybe one percent. Maybe maybe like ten people. If you are one of the ten, give yourself a round of applause. Now, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Is that the one where he ends up in that winterized cabin area, and he he he's the crazy person where he busts no, down that's the door? The, that's the Shining. All oh, work and no shining. play okay. makes Jack. He's a in belt, a mental uh, institution boy. in this one, biz. Yeah. He, oh, yeah, he goes whoa. to a nut house because he doesn't want to do jail time, and uh, he he kind of fucking upsets the apple cot a little bit. But it was based on a, a book in the '60s by Ken Kesey, uh, and it's like if you kind of put it in the time when it happened, you know, it was a lot of like kind of like 
uh, what do you call it, metaphors and stuff, because, you know, a lot of society was kind of revolting against the government, and he kind of revolting against the head nurse, Nurse Ratchet in it. So, uh, terrific fucking movie. One of Jack's best performances. I think that really solidified him as a, a true I don't know if, star um, as an actor. I don't know if it's, it, it, things have obviously changed, but that was a, a prerequisite for having to read for school, that book. I mean, ev everyone, did you have to read that book for school, G? No. Yeah, but you really? went to like Burlington Public Schools. So I, I think for maybe some good schools, that was that was a, a must read. But I do remember um, reading it because Miss Ratchet, it was like the name was just perfect. I wonder if it's led into being, you know, certain women called Ratchet because she's so mean and miserable. And then like, you know, that's what you call so-called not maybe good looking women. So I don't know, but I, I do respect the costume. Now that you said it, it's a good look. Thanks. Appreciate um, that. Yeah. Oh, you nailed it already. You're the fucking warthog. Um, I another funny one I got from a buddy. So uh, I don't know if wait, have you ever been to Vancouver? Like obviously, but you played yeah. there, right? Did you guys ever ever go out there? Yes. Did you notice how outside the bars or clubs there, the limited ones that they have, and they're all within a very short distance of one another, but they have all these limos that park out front to where if you want to go to the next place, like sometimes like these, you know, you take a limo. It's pretty ridiculous how close proximity everything is, but yet how many people end up taking these limos? Well, there's this, this famous one in, in uh, Vancouver where if you're from Vancouver, you know who Limo Leslie is, and it's this Asian guy who dyes his hair blonde um, like an eastbound and down, like the, who, who, uh, Will Ferrell. So he's just this guy who hangs out outside the bars and he ends up talking you into a $150 limo ride that's like two blocks away. And it's like so me and one yeah, yeah, there you go. So uh, one of our Asian friends, because the guy's Asian, he went as Limo Leslie, and uh, everybody had a, a really good uh, laugh in the group chat because he's kind of like one of those guys in town that everybody knows if you if you see him. So uh, eh, maybe it was funnier in my head, I guess. Let's go fuck myself. Join the club. Can you give me a fake? Give me a fake fucking chuckle next time for crying out loud. <laughs> I was waiting for the punchline. <laughs> Limo Leslie, but you know what? I don't care because there's people from Vancouver. Right now, who are like, I know Limo Leslie, he ripped me off for 200 bucks. <laughs> Biz, but did he you did sell me a Coke, vi uh, a Coke vial. <laughs> did you ever see the movie, Biz? Cuckoo's One Flow of the Cuckoo's Nest? No, and, and it's, and it's going to be on my list. And before I told my awful story about Limo Leslie, uh, I was going to say, uh, have you had a chance to see the one that Scorsese just dropped with Leo. Like I, I feel like every time Scorsese comes out with a movie of that length with that amount of good actors, regardless of maybe the reviews coming in, you have to go watch it. I have not seen it yet. I have all intentions of going to see it. I just ha haven't okay. knocked it down yet, but I, I no, do that's plan good. on seeing it. That's good. Yeah. That's yeah. good. I heard it's a pretty, like, there's some dark moments in the movie. Like the gory. premise of I heard it's very about. gory. Like, yeah, gory and just like, you know what these people were doing to these like native americans i think it's i think it's a pretty dark film i've heard it's good i think i'm actually gonna wait for uh it to to come out where you can watch it at home it's 345 i mean that yeah that's, that's an investment. long dude that's a that's a couple adderall maybe a couple yeah, red that's bulls like, <laughs> that's a tough one dude does yeah it is it is long and i guess there are, there are a couple theaters and they put their own in, intermission in which you know they weren't allowed to do. They're like, well, I gotta have a ten minute intermission, like halfway through, and the fucking studio called them up, like, nah, -uh, cut the shit. That's not how we do it. Like, you know, because that, you know, the directors make the movie. They don't expect you to get up if they if they want you to. They'll put their own intermission in. So they just got a little pee pee whack and put their own intermission in there. But. People just pissing all over the seats nah. and the. You, you got uh, <laughs> who's our, who's our buddy who came on the pod just pissing in bottles. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> Maple Leafs, Leafs, huh? Leafs legend, help me out Rick here. Live. Come on, Rick, Rick Vive. Vive, Rick Vive, Rick Vive, the bottle pisser. <laughs> I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna do one today in honor of him. I got the empty okay. uh, body armor bottle, so in honor of him as well. Another Leafs legend, Joe Thornton, Leafs legend, Oof. as well as him. So here comes uh, the pisser bottle. G, uh, sandbagger coming shortly, right? Tell the fellas when it's coming. Well, the crowd. Yeah, when Wednesday, six p.m. Huge sandbagger. Uh, Jack Eichel, Noah Hannafin. I'll let these guys kind of take over. Ra makes a makes another appearance. Uh, very excited though. Wednesday, six p.m. Eastern time on the Chicklets YouTube channel. What I had a blast doing this one. I mean, I, I, I it's hard to talk about them before they come out without giving certain things away. Um, R.A. with a performance for oh the ages God. as the round goes on. I guess you could leave it at that. Um, my brother Colin Whitney makes an appearance. Uh, what else? 
beautiful golf course, Granite Links, amazing day we had. I, I, I think we just, we let everyone watch it and we can maybe address some things after. So hey, I will say a beautiful course where you have a skyline of the city. And you were talking about this beforehand, how much like traffic it gets from the driving range to the oh. fact that they have 27 holes there. I will say one of the nines we, we played, you called it, uh, did you call it a mouse trap? It's a mouse trap. It's just so hard because you never see the green. So it's all these blind shots. And, and that made it extremely difficult for a non-golfer like myself. So for all you people who fucking bitch about my handicap, shove it up your ass. <laughs> uh, um, G also, oh, God, Biz. Well, I was just going to say yeah. quickly, like, obviously getting Jack after he won a Stanley Cup, it, it seems like his personality really came out on camera, which was was awesome to see. And you know, especially after early in his career going through all the bullshit in Buffalo, like, it's it's good to see him at the place where he's at. And uh, it was great to get to, to golf a full round with him. And what's awesome about what Pasha do, did and all the rest of the guys who, who helped film these things behind the scenes. So Sean Apuzo, we got Elliot Fish, uh, we got Logan who ends up coming on the road, uh, Pasha who films and also edits this. We started putting the, the, the GoPros inside the cart so we don't necessarily have to be interacting with them to, in order for them to kind of be putting on a show. And uh, between him and Noah, it, it was great to see their, their personality shine. So join and the RA, I'll give you some credit. Um, I watched the cut of it. Pasha sent it over and – you asked uh, Eichel a question um, pertaining to their Stanley Cup run, and it was a really good kind of answer, an interesting answer to hear in terms of um, them dealing with adversity. So good journalistic question there in the midst of being waffled. Uh, I was impressed. You can whack, whack back a half dozen nips and, and press those guys with nice <laughs> questions. I can't wait to watch it. G texted me the next day. I was like, dude, like, uh, that was uh, hilarious. Like he goes, I was shaking my hands with the camera. So like, I mean, I remember like the most of the day I had fun. It's not a little slow. I thought, and then we like, I just remember you kind of ordered me to get buckled and stop being a goofball. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Pasha, yeah. Came, Pasha came over to me and is like, get him fucked up. So every two seconds it was pink, Whitney, nip, pink, Whitney, nip, pink, Whitney, nip, pink, Whitney, nip. And you got fucked up. It's like yep. uh, release the secret weapon. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, also, G, little Chicklets TV debuted the other night with our Buffalo behind the scenes. What else we got coming up soon? Yeah, we got the Sandbagger coming up. We also have the college hockey series that we're working on that's coming out soon as well. But usually Wednesdays, 6 p.m. is where you can find us dropping new video content on our YouTube channel. Like RA says, like and subscribe. It makes a big difference for us. Seems like a lot of people are shifting over to our YouTube to, to check out the pod. Like every week over week, it seems like we're getting more viewers who like to watch it. Uh, we got to sit down with Vakoda Live, which people people are still raving about that interview. Just incredible story. So another great find by URA. But uh, if you're out there, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. We just passed 300K. And I think another shout out is deserved for all, all our uh, our staff behind the scenes who, who do an incredible job and crush it for us and make sure everything's running smoothly. So we got a great team and, and that's why our shit gets done. And uh, I think that's pretty much it for the house cleaning. Maybe other to mention... I think that that Shady Lady and Pink Whitney collab is just near sold out from the merch perspective. They only People had double XL left because I was at Ryder's hockey game yesterday and I had four people come up to come up to me like that shirt's awesome how do i get it i said ah you got to check it out there was only a limited amount of them and then they kind of went on in front of me and there was just double xl left so um some big daddies out there will be pleased well i like to i like to wear those ones a little bit oversized so i actually like the double xl as a um, i'm what six two six three 210 pounds so it's fun. It's got some, it's, it's a little bit baggier, more of a, a, a comfy type sweater. So it was good to see that people received that well. And gee, um, you'll probably know more than me about this, but coming up, uh, we have a ton of merchandise that's going to be dropping on Black Friday, which is just around the corner at insane discounts. So uh, make sure to look out for that at which, where, where do they go for that? It's barstoolsports.com slash chicklets. You can always find our merch there. So that's pretty much all the house cleaning I had. We have one more house cleaning uh, thing that we need to bring up. A pretty big announcement. I'll send it over to the merman to make this one. What's up, everybody? Big game tonight. Always get into the locker room early. Grab your coffee and make sure to always check the game notes. We got our host, Colby Army Armstrong. Myself, Merles. Our producers, Mikey G. Grinnell. We got Sean Poos Apuzo. Let's see the stats on these guys. Yep, the, the game notes. We're going to have the chat. We got the Beer League Heroes. We got Ride in the Bus covering all the leagues. We got Show or Mindy, who's going up and down. All the special guests we had. 
all Biz, Wit, R.A., Mr. Ice, Vegas Insider, all the NHLers we had on. We give you the inside scoops. Army's working for the Penguins TV. We're going to have a lot of inside scoops around the league. And the real reason we're all here for the winners. There's going to be winners nonstop. Everybody putting their bets in the chat. If you want to know when it, the best time to do it, it's going to be Thursday, 11 a.m. on the Spit and Chicklets YouTube Live. You get in the chat. You throw questions at us. You give us your picks. We had a blast year last year. Um, Singzy, still in Army's basement. He was in the chat. He ended up on the show. Great times by all. And then this year, Fridays, we're going to have it on podcast form. So wherever you listen to your podcast, Friday, Game Notes. The boys are back Thursday, 11 a.m. Everybody rides. I mean, talk about some huge fucking news for the Chicklets world. We're talking about Chicklets TV. We got a sandbagger dropping. The podcast itself is humming. And now we got the arm dog and Merle's back. And I love this setup, G. So the, the plan is on Thursdays, because of the response last year during playoffs and the live chat and everybody likes to be buzzing, especially in the middle of the day. Maybe some people are a little bored at work. They want to have a fun lunch break. So they hop on at what time on Thursday live, and then it drops on Fridays as a podcast on our channels. Yeah, so on Thursdays, it'll be on the Spit and Chicklets YouTube channel at 11 a.m. The Game Notes guys will go live. And then it will be on their own podcast feed in the morning on Friday. So they will have their own podcast feed, but the video where you can watch live, where you can join in on the comments, that is on Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And it's, I, I got to give it to Singzy. We, we told Colby, you know, we were talking about recording the, it, as, it as a podcast weekly. He couldn't do it. He couldn't give up Singzy. He couldn't give up the chat. So get in the chat every Wednesday, every Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern time. So another reason to subscribe to the YouTube, uh, just over, we just hit over 300K, as I mentioned again, earlier. Please. Well, I'm fucking pumping our fucking guys' tires here. You want to try? You want me to hand it over to you to tire pump? Huh? I could tire pump. I'm I could jumbo tire Joe pump. right now. I could do whatever I love the fuck game I want. Notes. Game, game notes just has a completely different element than what yes, we do. That's more what I was more than to. anything, I would say it's it's about kind of what's going on that night. Well, that was the playoffs, but they're just covering different type things. They'll probably go into some college hockey things, some junior things, yep. a little bit more than maybe we would. And they have a gambling aspect. And obviously, Barstool isn't owned by a gambling company anymore. And I'm hopefully at some point we're back in with with some company and we could see what we do in terms of bringing action to you guys. But Merles is a degenerate gambler. That's yep. just how it he's, works. Yep. He's so he's degen. got the lines. He's been hot as a pistol at all over in Europe, apparently. So obviously, us having game notes back, I enjoy it because I get to listen to it, and I love it. I can't listen to our shows, can't hear myself talk, but I listen to those two, and I get to hop on once in a while. And I love the fact that it's live because it just, it like Biz said, Thursday now at 11 a.m., everyone has something to look forward to. Yeah, so usually you got Tuesday, our pod drops, and then Wednesdays we got videos coming out, whether it's Sandbagger, Chicklets TV. You got Thursday live action, and then if you missed it, boom, we hit you on Friday. That's what we want to do. We want to provide our, our our viewers and listeners with more content. And another thing, too, is uh, they do a couple fun segments. What's the Beer League one they do? So they do Beer, beer League Heroes. Beer yes. League Heroes. So that's the cool thing is like we're kind of mixing the once a month podcast that we did with the daily show because with the month, once a month podcast, we had Riding the Bus, Beer League Heroes, Shower Mindsies, all these cool little segments. Those will be incorporated on Thursdays into the, the weekly show. And as a last reminder, uh, we just hit over 300K <laughs> on our Spit and Chicklets YouTube channel and Ryan Whitney can kiss my ass. <laughs> or, or Ryan the Pirate. Arr. 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 Fuck off, me, matey. <laughs> Get out of my face. Arr. Before we go any further, I got to talk about Pink Whitney. I got to talk about this epic NYC trip that you could send your buddy and three more friends on. And I actually, Biz mentioned the Pink Whitney appearance in Edmonton at the Ice House. Shots flying. He actually said that many people were enjoying a little bit of uh, soda water with their Pink Whitney. If it, was, if it wasn't on the ice with soda water, it was shots. So whatever way you drink it, we're happy you're drinking it. We love to drink it ourselves. I like, as I've mentioned, the energy drink in there when I'm a little tired. I love just ripping a couple shots with G when we're watching games and streaming games. You know? Winter time's cold. Winter time's around the corner. If you're in Canada in many places, it's already here. And what better way to warm up from the inside than a little pink wit around the fire? And also, as I mentioned, the NYC trip. If you have a buddy who loves to party and loves Pink Whitney, you got to nominate him. 
You got to nominate him or her, and they could win the Pink Whitney New York City trip. One lucky winner will receive an epic New York City trip for them and three friends, complete with a tour of Barstool headquarters. You can go in there. If you love some certain Barstool personalities, you can give them a hug. If you hate them, you can tell them to your face, I can't stand you. But you'd be in the headquarters, and it's all because of Pink Whitney. The secondary prize winners will receive Pink Whitney party packs with everything you and your crew need to take your shot and throw the ultimate house party. It's easy to enter. Go to pinkwhitney.com to enter your info. Nominate your life of the party buddy and describe how they always make the party next level for a chance to win the ultimate Pink Whitney New York City trip. And of course, make sure to head on over to your local bar and order up some Pink Whit. Uh, all right, boys, uh, let's shift over to the NHL. Crazy big news this week. We were all wondering why Shane Pinto hadn't signed with Ottawa yet. Well, he was under investigation by the NHL, and they suspended him for 41 fucking games for activities relating to sports wagering. Uh, the league found no evidence he bet on NHL games, uh, but the union helped negotiate the, the suspension. Uh, the league considers it clo- a closed matter. Obviously, something had to have happened uh, with like to suspend him this long, but does it feel like... Maybe he just is being made an example of here. Like he didn't do anything maliciously or probably didn't, maybe didn't know he did it. And now they're going to string him up just to let everybody else know. Don't fuck around with this stuff. Is that the vibe you get with? Uh, it is. Um, I, I, I think it makes a lot of sense for most people who watch hockey, um, whether they gamble or not, to see all of the gambling around the league. And and the I mean, let's not let's not lie. Like the, 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 the picture a lot of articles used of him when the news <laughs> broke of bet 365 on his helmet on his helmet yeah it's just all time i yeah. like I, ironic what's the yeah, word yeah hit the pinto parlay baby let's go <laughs> <laughs> so i think ra like people are like what the hell if you didn't bet on hockey what's the big deal i mean we from from the time i played whether it was pools every week or betting on sunday nfl or saturday college football guys bet they like to bet they're adults it's their own money I think what you said is true. I think the NHL is so paranoid about their involvement with gambling and their involvement in terms of having to have these games like be so clearly refed by the letter of the law, even though we've had issues with refs. But all, all of those <laughs> things like added up, they can't have any sort of um, people wondering or, or panicking that there's like guys betting on games. So it's like we're going to lay the hammer down on him. And apparently I was reading, they the league wanted it to be longer. So the PA probably what? got a little bit of, what? They wanted it to be longer than half the fucking season? Yes. And 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 I think the PA got a win in getting it a little less and also getting it where the games from the first game of the year count, even though he hasn't been signed or playing. So in the end, right, he'll only miss whatever it is, 35 games. I don't know how, I think they played six well, games. Well, fuck, he hasn't, he hasn't signed yet, right? Yeah, that's what I'm confused about. Well, like, that's my, that's the biggest. Like, I mean, I got a million things to talk about about this, but I mean, talk about your negotiating power and where it went to where it is now. And Ra, you mentioned that potentially it's a reason why he hasn't signed. From my understanding, they were just made aware of this a few weeks ago, so it went from like a little bit of a holdout regarding to like what he thinks his salary should be and what their cap situation is at to all of a sudden you've now as an agent reached this problem to be like, uh, maybe we should just take what they originally offered. I, yeah, he's basically, I mean, there's no need to sign him now because he can't play and it'll count counts against the cap. It's, it doesn't do anybody any good to sign him right now. Really. So if I anything, mean, it, it did delay some time for Ottawa. And I was actually wondering if like, how does it work with, do, like, let's say he ends up signing a three-year deal where they structured it where this year maybe he only makes a million bucks and then the next two he makes, he's like a little bit more backloaded. Can he avoid the money on the suspension or does it come down to what the AAV is? So these are all questions that I have for for how this is going to play out from his pocketbooks perspective. And Well, he, I mean, so say he wouldn't be getting paid until game 42 of this season anyways, right? So it does make sense. Like, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Will they not sign him until right before he plays? Although, yeah. do you have to be signed to be practicing? Because they're going to want him practicing at some point if he's not already. I don't know. I don't know what's going on with that. I mean, it's an unprecedented case, right? Like, we've never seen this before. We've never seen this go down. So I don't know in the end how it ends up working out. But he's taking a hit to his to his bank account no matter what. Oh. <laughs> he's getting crushed. I would love to know what the Pinto Parlay was that he put the money on. Now, uh, I think we need to explain, and you might have already already, and I was just in my own fucking head. Um, 
it was it, is it not considered proxy gambling as to basically what the uh, allegation is where he was out of state or out of province of where you're legally allowed to gamble and he had a friend log into his account to place the bet. Now you've already addressed the fact that it's been confirmed that it was not hockey related. So that's where to me, it's like, why the fuck does it matter? But given when you sign up and you click all the, yes, I accept proxy gambling is the illegal aspect in which when he did that and his friend logged in, automatically it sends an alert to the gambling company and then people are made aware. And it just so happens that this guy plays professional sports and that is the ultimate no, no. So he but I don't up understand hitting. how would it, what, what would alert to what if the kid was in the state doing where it's legal or was this all through a bookie? Because, because it's probably attached to your device. And yeah, knowing that it's a different device that's logging in, it then tracks it. That's to me. And once again, RA, you read, and I don't know if it's been confirmed that there's confirmation that it wasn't on hockey. So that's where I'm like, uh, like I feel like if the it was as as little as it seems, I get I get why it could be a pro, considered a proxy bet, and that was the offense itself. But why were they pushing to get it further? of a suspension if there was no hockey involvement. So I that's think as Ari said, because they want to nip this thing in the bud, dude. They want to make an example out of him to make okay basically scare scare every other player around the league. Which mind you, there's gotta be some players shaking oh. in their boots when the when this news broke. Hey, but that's kinda right. like that's yeah. kind of like me when when the Yans is like, hey, I'm pretty sure that Jack 3D is illegal. And I'm like, what? What do you mean? And then I looked into it later, and sure enough, I could have tested positive for substance abuse in the National Hockey League. And I think that that sussies what? Is that automatic 20? So there's like know. you just said, there's probably a lot of guys being like, wait a minute, you can get sussied 41 games, and then now they're getting rid of the burner phones. But R.A., right, was he gambling through a bookie or legally? I believe it was legal because I, I think the company actually snitched on him. I mean, hey, say say what you know about the lo- local shops, but they're not going to fucking rat on you when you fucking bet. Yeah, them. exactly. Because, yeah, they, they know who it is. So I think they may be, uh, pay a little extra attention to it. And like Elliot Friedman said, uh, according to multiple sources, one of the major issues leading to Pinto's penalty was along the lines of proxy betting, where another individual or individuals have access to a legal account in his name. Uh, companies like FanDuel specifically banned this practice. The state of New Jersey fined DraftKings $150,000 back in March of 22 for allowing large and illegal proxy bets. I guess you're just not allowed to have people put your bets in for you. And if they know he was playing in Ottawa and their bets being put in a Long Island, even though you know it was a legal place, uh, he wasn't there. And I mean, but but even that 41 games for that, it just I that's, that's, where, that's, where, that's, that's where it gets a little. Jive. That's well, where I don't it gets think a little. Anyone agrees with how long the suspension is? It, it's like, what are we doing here? Sure. It, Did you by, see the one guy's tweet that had the suspension listed out and then said, brought to you by FanDuel Travel? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bet oh, yeah. 65. <laughs> that Trump oh. wire, I think. Oh, great. <laughs> oh, that was great hilarious. Account. That is so good. That is. So, uh, I had a few other things written down here. Uh, like Overall, though, Ottawa Senators, that's not the only reason that they're getting the start of the podcast here. They're the headline hogs. So with that also have came some rumors. Now, Wit, I don't know if you've heard this rumor, but I had a legitimate Ottawa Senators jock sniffing account saying that they believe that Dorian is going to be out soon and his replacement is Shirelli. Some people hearing me say this right now are like, you're a fucking internet loser for reading all these rumors. Now, in the same breath, have you guys not heard the same shit and the same rumblings? There are a lot of rumblings that Dorian will be out. And I think the main reason being, I mean, they're four and four right now, so it's not an ideal start, but, but it could be a lot worse. Um, look at Calgary, um, but it's the new ownership, right? So it's a new owner that, that comes in and like, they got fans that want DJ Smith gone. They got fans that want Dorian gone. And maybe he actually takes a step back and doesn't rush into anything. Or maybe he's a type of owner where he's like, I want some change. I want my hand, my finger fingerprints all over this thing. So I think like where there's smoke, there's fire. We've heard a lot of rumblings about Dorian probably being out. I think there's probably Oiler fans. Oh, there it is. His first bottle hose. Uh, Good yeah. job, Biz. Look how hydrated I am. Biz was peeing I hope I don't while mix, speaking. I'm going to put this a little farther so I don't mix him out or mix yeah, him up. Um, it's it's hard. I, I don't know, man. Like any change, whether it be a trade or a coaching firing or a GM firing eight games in, it's like you got to give it till 20 games, right? I mean, December yes. 1st, right around then. It's. I mean, it just seemed to be a little bit of a rush. Now, Ottawa who is adamant about starting better this year, considering every year they have poor starts and they're out of it in February. 
they are four and four. Shabbat's out a month. Randstrom's out. A, I, I, have they announced how long he's out? They haven't put a time, but he's definitely caught. Thank God that animal warrior Brady Kachuk is actually okay. It looked like he buckled his elbow or shoulder. Not only did he come back, he came back and fought. If he was out, all bets are off for that team their entire season. But it, it just seems like there's restlessness in Ottawa. And I don't really blame the fan base. But as I've kind of reminded people with the Oilers, even though I, I lost my mind and tweeted out they stink, I took it back. Be patient. Four and four. You're just Let's emotional. See what they do through twenty games. It's it's like I just can't I just can't get away with with burying teams right away unless they're exactly. the Sharks. Um, <laughs> even though I said Capitals are horrible and they've won three in a row. Oh since yeah, they're that. buzzing, who, baby. Um, I'm back. But hey, but uh, uh, San Jose though, oof, what do they got? Nine, nine games played, nine goals for. Maybe that I think that the best AHL team could beat them in a seven game series. I think right they now. might go down as a. Top five worst team ever, ever in the league, and, ever. and I love Mike Greer and I love Dave Quinn. Good. I mean, there's just not much. There's not much there. So they do? have six number seven defensemen. So unfortunately <laughs> for San Jose, you know what though? Macklin Celebrini's waiting. They got Will Smith last year. Yep. They have another tough year, then they get another one, and things can turn around quick. But it's going to be a grind for those poor bastards in San Jose, man. Uh, but to go back to what you were saying though, uh, and it's it's Michael and Lauer. Is that how you say the new owner's name? Yes. Yeah. It's it's his welcome to the jungle moment. You know, you, you you take over the team. You know, it's it's exciting. Fans are coming up, taking pictures. All of a sudden, uh, gambling allegations, sussy 41 games. Uh, now there's rumors about you potentially trying to can the GM eight games in. And now Shabbat's out of lineup. So this is a, a, a major, major point of adversity for the Ottawa Senators. And I'm very interested to see how they handle it. Because we said this before the season started. started. I think we had Buffalo, Ottawa, and then Detroit as that third team in that bubble where there, there was their time to step up and finally show us something. Detroit's looking real good real early. And all of a sudden, I don't know, Buffalo in, uh, in Ottawa, a little bit shaky. Little shaky, boys. Buffalo's turned it around a little bit. Darlene's on a nine-game point streak, by the way. He is fucking laying <laughs> He's guys like hammering out, guys too. Hammering guys. Hammering guys. <laughs> and uh, d d uh, one of the guys helping turn around, too, is Tuck. Who I think that uh, I think one of the the elements that the Buffalo Sabers lack a little bit is that toughness and grittiness. Where probably a big component is to them picking up Greenway last was that last last year at the deadline they picked them up. Yeah, and and you know Tuck kind of being one of those other guys where if you look around, there's not many guys in the locker room who could do it. But he he got in that dust up the other night and he, he's been throwing the weight around too. So nice to see him elevating his game and and doing other things besides scoring and, and setting up plays. So. I offer you some question marks, but they have a tough game, actually. Uh, we got them Wednesday on TNT against Philly, who's been playing their dicks off. And so yeah. is Montreal. It's been a oh god. It's been an interesting start to this season. I mean, I I I think I think Ottawa's gonna get it going. The no Shabbat could be a real kick in the dick. I'd I'd like to think that Corpusalo really starts figuring it out. Um, but all three of those teams, they've had really moments of looking great, especially Detroit. But even Detroit's had a little, you know, Boston kicked the shit out of them. And there's been a couple little setbacks for all three in terms of those are the three that are looking to make the leap. And I go back to, uh, to something that Paul Maurice said about Montour. And it was when he first got there. He goes, I just told him to go. I took the reins off him. And with Shabbat being out, sometimes it's a blessing in disguise for this Sanderson kid who... He, he looks incredible right now, and he seems like to be that guy who's going to be a, a number one defenseman in this league. I mean, he's fucking pretty close to getting there already, but for him to step up in this moment and kind of use those extra minutes and see where his game can go, if I'm the Ottawa Senators, I ain't holding them back on ice time. I'm saying fucking take the reins off and let him go. And then you got another guy in Chikrin. So they're okay back there, and uh, let's see if they can weather this storm off. Yeah, this kid Greg's been getting a lot of play in Ottawa with, with no Pinto. He's been doing all right. I think he's uh, second or third in rookie scoring so far. So okay. uh, just another note on the Sharks, Biz. I, I mean, I think we got to give a, a little round of snaps for uh, Cockadin and uh, uh, who, uh, Mackenzie Black with the two goalies. They both hit uh, 907 save percentage on that team. That's pretty impressive. I know it's probably something that from the 80s or 90s, but on that team, as much as they're getting dummied, uh, those guys are playing their asses off. I watched a couple of Sharks games, so just want to give them a little shout okay. out. Give the goalies right. a little bit. You always show and, a little love for the goaltenders. The, um, just to wrap up the gambling thing, like guys gamble. A lot of guys around the league, when I played, and I'm sure it's no different now, they love throwing a little action around. And I think there's no problem with that as long as you're betting responsibly. As, not your, as long as you're not betting outside your means, it's just 
a rule's a rule, right? And I, I, I guess if, if, if you're going to want to play in the NHL, even though the rule may sound stupid to a lot of people, it's a rule you got to follow. So unfortunately for him, he gets the brunt of the punishment. He gets the, the pee-pee whack to make sure and try to scare other players. But that's a kick in the dick for not only Pinto, but for the Sens. I think we yeah, can yeah. all agree there's a life lesson here, and it's get a bookie. Right, it's RA. I mean, you're. <laughs> hey, guy, the lo local guy's not gonna drop a dime on you. I'll tell you that. Oh, man. did we lose him? No. Oh, there he is. They we lost you for a sec. It's your uh -huh. shitty internet again. <laughs> no, guy, I went FiOS, man. FiOS been oh, hauling ass. You? Yeah, I don't know what the fuck's going on tonight. Uh, the Heritage Classic was Sunday night biz. Uh, both teams come in slumping. Uh, Oilers won five and one. They had lost four straight. Calgary, same thing. They lost four straight. Two teams going down, but. I don't know, Whit, did your team uh, get a little burst of life last night? It's only one game, but did you see something different? Connor McDavid come back, had an assist, uh, 23 minutes of ice the time. The sun is shining in Edmonton today, We're back, is baby. Not? We're back. Oh, yeah. We're back, guys. Arr. And all you haters, it's one game 82. Something changed, guys. Yeah. Something changed. And let me tell you, that Minnesota game was the most angry I've ever been since I became an Oilers fan after I got booed out of town and then stuck with them, and I was almost ready to quit. I really was. To get dominated in the third period like that by Minnesota was completely disgusting. I wanted to throw up, and then they go, go home and they lay an egg. Jonathan Quick shuts them out 3 nothing. They get booed off the ice. Things were down. Things were ugly. Oof. It was nonstop rain or, edit or shit snow, whatever you want to call it in Edmonton. And then everything kind of, as Biz said, the skies, they became clear. They became sunny. It maybe, it maybe got to, it maybe got to four degrees. And, and Connor McDavid came back. But Connor McDavid was not the guy in this game that carried the mail for the Oilers. It was a Vander Kane. He put him oh. on his back. He put him on his back. And after that quote with Scott Oak and Hockey Night in Canada, he was pissed off about his ice time. He went and got in a fight. He kept playing pretty well. Even in Minnesota, he was one of the bright spots. No one was good against the Rangers. And then he shows up to this outdoor game. He has a goal and two assists. He goes in, runs someone over, and then says, what are you going to do? What is anyone going to do? That's what he said. An unreal clip that which is, I mean, talk about a slap in the face to the Calgary Flames biz. Oof. That's 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 straight up calling out the entire team. Nobody here can do shit to me because I'll dummy any one of you. So Oof. Evander Kane stepping up, picking up that team, and getting McDavid back, he looked phenomenal. He had the first chance of the game, I think a couple minutes in, a beautiful rush that I thought he beat Markstrom, but it, it, it went wide, maybe through his legs. But he was buzzing around all night. Leon with that beautiful pass to Hyman. Hyman has like six points in three outdoor games too. The guy just a honey badger. So <laughs> that is the Edmonton Oilers hockey that we need to play. And to win a game like that in front of 55,000 beautiful yeah. Edmonton Oilers fans, it, it, it just can change the entire vibe of a season. And what they did was they played the way Sidney Crosby's played his whole career. They played like grinders. They are, they have superstars. They have ultra skill, and they grinded. They played like the, a, a team with no skill and no ability to create. And the only two goals they gave up were on five on threes. They gave up two like minute and a half five on threes. That's unacceptable. You got to stay out of the box when you're already in the box. And they scored two as the guy was basically getting out to make it five on four. Other than that, five on five domination. Skinner looked great. Wasn't even tested that much. Evan Bouchard can be a star in this league. He's got to keep it simple he's got to be just play that easy game i tell all these young defensemen i meet play the easy game guys don't do what i did you see a man open pass it to him don't give it that extra dust off and that's what the oilers are doing they're playing with speed they were playing in the other team's zone they were playing physical and they had a bunch of guys show up who hadn't shown up in quite a while so onward and upward yes right now we have five points through i think nine games not ideal but to just smack around the shitbag flames who really, really stink is a great feeling. So let's go Oilers. And now we be turn. We, I said, now we turn into a wagon. And I'm sorry for almost quitting. Arr, what a breakdown wow. from the... Wow. Pirate wit. Holy I love shit. outdoor games too, man. Oh, I, but I just look back it. at getting to play in one. Obviously the one where Crosby scores the shootout winner in the snow at Ralph Wilson Stadium. I love watching them. The the the, the audio of the game. You hear the yeah. skates cutting into the ice. It's just it's a great event. 
Um, they did a, a fantastic job. It was 20 years since Montreal beat Edmonton 4-3 to at the same stadium, I believe. So I just really enjoyed it. Oilers uniforms, incredible. Oh, Flames, so horrible. Nice. Oilers unis, just the big number in the middle. Oh, I thought the Flames were nice too. Yeah, of course you did. They're one of no. your 19 teams. No, no, I'm not on their wagon anymore. Now, uh, it, it, could, it seems as if though the Edmonton Oilers have put life back in you. Wit. You were a little bit depressed last week, but you just seem like a different person right now. Yes, because I, I the start is so bad, and it's exactly what I hoped wouldn't happen, but it's such a long season. It's a long grind of a year, and the Oilers always go through a shitty part of December, and I think they just got it out of the way in October Got out of the year. system? I really do. I would say from how the, the, the whole week looked like it was going to play out to, to potentially Connor McDavid not playing, that was devastating. People were rattled. He actually talked after the game and thanked the training staff. Like, you know, these guys are... These guys are basically Kobe beef by the time these trainers are done massaging them and getting whatever he had injured ready to, to play in that game. So I think there was a big sigh of relief on Saturday when he ended up skating. Um, then they ended up coming out in those, those awesome uniforms, like the oil guys. Right off the, uh, right off the rig. <laughs> right off the, <laughs> the – a couple of rig pigs coming off. <laughs> and uh, I, would, I swear Connor McDavid must own the Nickelback catalog. He's Did he say that the, they were one dude, of the greatest bands ever? Yeah, one, Nickelback but did he is meet one of the Canada. Greatest. It doesn't matter. His they I, are probably they're they're top three greatest Canadian bands ever with the hundred percent right. And I get what for, you're saying though, Biz. Every time I feel like Connor McDavid is on a mic now, you get like him being like he's, he, he's Nickelback. The, he, he's he's Nickelback's manager. Like, he, he must be. He talks about them ever. He, he talked about them at Boots and Hearts. But uh, for a band who used to get shit on, where now I feel like they've came around now, where everyone feels like they they could admit that they love Nickelback, where it was the easiest band to shit on in the world for a period of time. There now, Ra, being an American, were you aware of that? Like, were you, were you aware of how much they got shat on? Yeah, I feel like it, they went through a Fred Durst type shitting. Yeah, it's it like almost seemed excessive. I mean, I, I don't think they're not my cup of tea, but I don't think they're like a, a bad band or atrocious. I don't know. People just like goofed on them, and you know they didn't like get mad about it. They, I mean, the Canadians they were just like, okay, no, no worries, and they just kept beating the beating the drum playing the instruments. I I thought they always kind of got a bad rap just because I don't know people just kind of kicked them when they were down. They did. I, I like some of their like jams. Them, love, I think love it, their be jams. it became the the cool thing on the internet to make exactly. fun of Nickelback. They got some great jams. They rip it rip it up there. An Alberta band made total sense. For them to be there, um, this is a see, this is a did bigger you see relationship. BX, BX, uh, did you see BX could drop the the three or four different um, Nickelback tunes into like him describing one of the plays on the ice? He was on. I think he was with uh, Ron McLean, Jen Botterill, and someone else. None of them caught on on caught on to it. It was, it was just <laughs> puns galore, ripping through highlights, oh, was he? and he had to tell everyone. I guess the joke never lands if you have to explain to everyone after what you were doing. It was like Biz's story about the Tell limo about driver. Well, you know fucking McDavid's <laughs> cranking himself off to the clips of, of Nickelback being sung in the background. Um, but I, I think that it's it's probably just as big of a bromance as Travis Kels and, and Taylor Swift right now is McDavid just constantly gassing up one of the greatest greatest Canadian bands of all time. They played. I thought that was a, a really cool moment. Uh, outside of that, uh, um, I would say they kind of went back to their old style of leaning heavily on the stars. Like, what was it, McDavid? Close they to 24 minutes. They always heavily on the stars. No, but, but, but we Ice talked time about... Wise? Ice time wise, ice time wise, where they ended up going 7D again. So, uh, yeah, all in all, a, a much needed big performance. And, and you, you touched on Calgary a little bit. I feel like the conversation in Calgary right now after this horrible start where I had them making playoffs, uh, I thought that they were going to figure out as a core. But outside of them playing bad, did we talk last podcast about Zadorov's comments? No, we didn't. And, no. It, no. It seems like it's leaking a little bit into the dressing room at this point. No excuses. I mean, we should just roll this clip. There's some things need to get working out, but I think main thing for us, we're just not working as the unit yet. We're, uh, we have too many individuals playing by themselves, so I think we just, we're going to figure out if we want to play as the team or we want to play as the home guy, whatever. So how do you get everyone to buy in collectively? Is it a team meeting? Like, how do you get those individuals to row in the same direction? Then? Yeah, I mean, we watch videos. We agree on some stuff together. So uh, hopefully we bring the better effort tonight. 
Is that something that you among as players talk about? Guys being yeah. too much? Yeah, yeah we do. We do talk about that. Yeah. Are those uncomfortable conversations? Well, you got to be uncomfortable in your life, I think. I don't think you should be comfortable in your life, or you're not going to be the best version of yourself, you know what I mean? So I think it's definitely a good thing for our team. we only six games into the uh, season, and we're trying to figure out who's want to be here, who wants to play for who. So we uh, got lots of time. You know, I don't think our division teams only... One team is rolling right now, pretty much everybody's in the same boat as us. So I think we can definitely use some wins. Does it does it concern you that these are a little bit the same conversation that took us last season? Or? Well, last season was different. Different, like the. I mean, it, it was Daryl. No, there's no Daryl, so there's no excuses. You know what I mean? You guys don't like hard coaches. You don't like good soft coaches. You don't like good coaches. Fair, like I mean, you just. It's a it's a new day league, you know. You you come up here, you play hard, and you just leave everything on the ice. I think that's that's how simple it is. I will say this: that that's some leadership right there, though. That's not easy to do because you're saying stuff and you're not directly calling out teammates, but you are calling guys out, and it's not that easy to go up there and say that in front of reporters. And and I think he he took it upon himself to say like this is getting ridiculous and. I do think, like, their core there is just they haven't played very well. Like, I know Kadri got a goal in, in the game. He struggled big time. Yeah. I don't know what it is about, about Huberdo and just looking like a different player, Well, I was player, just going to bring them, them two up is, is kind of where the conversation has shifted as to what's going to happen here moving forward because this team's in limbo with a lot of their uh, their core group up coming up for for free agency right so who's going to stay who's going to go the two big guys that they have locked in and Kadri and Huberdo like we just mentioned leaning on your stars with ice time Huberdo again in that outdoor game 16 minutes uh Kadri I know he had that goal but 17 minutes where you're paying these guys handsomely I feel especially the way the season has started even if maybe their game's not there where you don't think that they deserve the ice time you just got to roll go roll them 20 minutes for the next 10, 15 games. What do you have to lose? And see if with providing them the more ice time equates to them having more production. Now, you might be a, a Calgary Flames fan saying like, well, they haven't earned it. It's like, well, what else, what else are you going to do? You're going to fucking just roll four lines constantly and continue to fucking you know, dwindle away the way they have been to start the year? Huberto is making what, nine and a half? Maybe uh, more. Shoot, over uh, ten. ten? Ten and a half. Ten and a half. Mm -hmm. Play him twenty minutes, and and if he can't handle it, and and the pace is too much, and um, one of the other things I keep hearing around, and listen, his stats aren't horrible. I think he no, has two goals, they, three it's, assists. It's the play. It, it's the play. It's not carrying the play and the pace of play. And then, it, it one of the things I keep hearing is maybe his heart was left in Florida. He loved playing there. He loved the group of guys there. And and we hear heard about his response to when he heard that he'd been traded. He was fucking furious. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get adapted. But one of the things that Zadorov did mention, it's like, well, you can't fucking blame Sutter anymore because he's gone. So, and if the fact that Zadorov has to mention that outside the locker room tends to make me believe it's like, who's taking control of the leadership inside the locker room? Because I feel like when you have to then use the media in order to get your message across, that is a, a frustration boiling point, which... You, le you, see, you look at the, the start of the game at the Heritage Classic, awful first period. Did I like the push they had in the second? Yes, but too little too late and a, a situation where it doesn't look like it's going to turn around anytime soon. Oh, and, and it's Lindholm's coming up and Hannafin's coming up and Tanev's coming up. So it's all these question marks in terms of like who's going to be here, who wants to be here, who doesn't want to be here. I feel bad for Markstrom a little bit. It's not exactly like he's getting a ton of offensive support. But he could also probably be a little bit better. It's just, it's been an absolute nightmare start. And I do think that group has way more to give. And they'll figure it out at some point. It's just running out of time. You can't win the cup now, but you can lose the shit out of it. And right now, the way they're playing, and, and like they got booed off the ice at home Thursday night as well. I think they lost 3 nothing too. So at some point, I think Zadorov's main thing is like, guys, like, we have no other excuses. Everything we didn't like about last year has changed. We got the new coach. 
we got guys who say they want to be here. It's like it's on us now. And at some point when players realize like we can't blame anyone but ourselves, you'd like to think that they'd wake up and get going a little bit. I don't know how fast of a team they are. Like watching Ed that's Edmonton's a pretty fast team. They were I mean, they made them look like they were skating in molasses. So even with Kadri, well, Kadri's also not known as the and fastest. And neither is Huberdo. And neither, neither is Huberdo, yeah. Now, they're, they're Coronado, more... I, I love Coronado's game as a rookie. He can move. He's got a great shot. Get him some more minutes. I mean, I know he's playing on a top line, but... And, and you do have to forget, I think Rasmus Anderson might be their best D-man. He wasn't playing with the suspension after the hit on line A, so it's just, you gotta... I, I said it, give it 20 games, but if it doesn't switch around, you're fucked. My other thing I was going to mention is overall from the Battle of Alberta and the Heritage Classic and when they had the game, I think they should look to do this every two years and talk about the storyline going in, both teams struggling. To me, that was just as impactful as if both teams were playing well. There was so much drama surrounding it where they should every two years make that the first game of the Battle of Alberta when the two teams meet for the first time oh, in the I regular season. Oh, I thought you meant every two years have two Canadian teams play. No, I, I, I just... And then you switch you switch it to, to venues where you go where the Stampeders play because they have a beautiful CFL stadium as well where you'll sell that game out every time. You don't need to overthink it. And especially in this case, you had all these implications going in. I just think it's an easy sell. It's the perfect time of year where it, it was a cold game. And I didn't realize how cold it had already gotten in Edmonton because I was in Vancouver for a few days before where it was like beautiful. I had, you, you could have maybe wore a t-shirt outside during the day where it's the perfect coldness where you're not doing it at the dead of winter. You're doing it around the perfect time of year to kick things off. And it was just an unbelievable event with, of course, the festivities included. So people were jazzed up, and you mentioned that crowd, and it, and it looked lively. Um, all right, I just did want to touch on I guess the beer lines were nightmares, Biz. Oh, were they? They might well, have to do something about that and bring in more beer tents or whatever because I guess guys were waiting in line 45 minutes for a beer. Ah, right? that's not fun. You can't and have that. That, would, that, that seemed to be the case when they ended up doing it at Notre Dame Stadium when I was there for that outdoor game. Yeah, we so were people, all there for that one, but we were in a box, bitch. Well, I was I was actually working doing an NHL first oh, time. That a so boy. suck on that. Good job. Bitch. 300 thousand followers on the spit and chickens youtube channel folks um and, and the other only thing i wanted to mention about the experience was i got to go there the night before uh to ice house for a pink whitney appearance anytime we go to alberta the the fan response and keep in mind ra wasn't there no, none of our guys it was just me and pasha at the ice house that's attached to the to the rink there uh 450 people showed up the appearance was supposed to be an hour long from six to seven. I ended up st staying just over three hours to tell everybody hello and, and shake everybody's hand. And the whole staff was incredible. They, they run a first class organization, whether it's the ice house or brew houses, and there's 40 locations across all of Canada. They poured a shot for every single person that was there. We gave out 450 shots of Pink Whitney. I got the, to, I obviously am off the sauce. So if I would have done one with every fucking person, I would have looked like RA at Chicklet's Cup picking boogers out of my asshole. Now, I just want to thank, <laughs> Give me of a course, Cadillac. Give me a Cadillac Margarita Pink Whitney. <laughs> Uh, so I want to thank the entire staff of Ice House, all the, the servers, the people who showed up. And uh, I have this written down because every time, like once a month, Wayne will always say, if you ever talk about Edmonton on the podcast, just the people of Edmonton are the, the, the best people on earth. Just tell them thank you. And he is bang on because going there, they treat us with complete respect. They roll out the red carpet. Even so much so as we had this group of people bring me over. They brought me over like Pink Whitney laced weed. They brought me over a, a, really? a joint RA that was rolled as a bar stool. Like, and it had the bar oh. stool logo on top that it, it was done with all the paper that they do. What do you call them? The zigzags or the. Save me a leg. Yeah. Western <laughs> Canadians are the best people. The best. Like Saskatchewan, Alberta. Oh my God. You guys rock. And, and, and you know what we should have mentioned? Um, Thursday night. In Edmonton, even though they got booed off the ice, Charlie Huddy and Doug Waite got honored yep. as uh, into the Edmonton Oilers Hall of Fame. And it was pretty cool. Paul Coffey and Charlie Huddy did an interview together. I guess they were partners for a really long time on those Oilers teams. Huddy won five cups with them. And then Doug Waite, 
an American hockey legend who was a superstar in Edmonton and his game was rising after he got traded over from the Rangers, I believe. And then that was the time of when Edmonton, they really couldn't pay him. I think that I, I'm pretty sure that's what happened and he moved on, but what a player he was. And I always think of him with the separated shoulder, barely being able to raise the cup in Carolina. So Billy Guerin was able to kind of be there for him. They're very close friends. And he, and he, and he gave a little, um, like he said something to the camera that they played on the broadcast that night. So two Oilers legends, even though Waite didn't get a cup there, he was a, an, ama an amazing player. And Charlie Huddy, just your stay at home, um, Cup winning leader defenseman that that obviously has meant a lot to the Oilers over the years. So that was a cool thing to see those guys go in the Ring of Honor. And, and uh, we often talk about gear wear on the podcast, and I would say my first experience seeing blue tucks live in the flesh were on Dougie Wade. Yeah, and, and, and I he think pulled he was, it off. Oh, I, I think at the time he was playing for the St. Louis Blues. And uh, he was playing point on the power play, and it was it was a game I saw in Detroit, and he played the f he would play the full two minutes. He we got to get was, Dougie Wade on. Yeah, we got to get him on. We got to get him on. That's but an in person just, guy, I think, too. You you have to be of special caliber to just get the coach in, stay on for the full two minute power play. Biz, uh, we got to get to your rookie uh, friend Logan Cooley in a little bit. We didn't even announce that guest yet. We got so revved up with the Halloween stuff at the beginning. Arizona rookie uh, Logan Cooley getting to him shortly, and we also have Kevin Dahlman, uh, the leading scoring defenseman in KHL history. So, a couple of interviews on tap. But first, we got to talk about Jonathan Quick, man. Thirty-seven years old. I think everybody probably thought he was going to retire after last season. You know, he gets traded to Columbus, ends up at Vegas. You know, gets a third Stanley Cup. 2-0 with a 9.82 save percentage, 0.41 goals against, 56 saves on 57 shots. Again, shuts out Edmonton. He's now 20th on the all-time list for shutouts. Uh, he extends his American goalie record. Uh, but the Rangers, boys, you guys were calling him for Gazy. At least you were a Biz. I mean, was. Okay. I'm not I changing my opinion on the fact that I hate uh, the New York Rangers. Like I, I'm allowed to hate a team or 100%. Teams. I hate many. I hate many. But but you said they'd miss the playoffs. That's different than hating. I don't give them. a fuck. They still might. Maybe they'll implode. Who knows? They they are very very good. Yes, they Dude, are. They're D. They they're right up there as top D in the league. Adam Fox, uh, Saturday night in Vancouver, put on an absolute clinic. He had this beautiful tip in goal. He had another unreal assist. They went. I think they're four and zero on their Western trip right yep. now, and they got one more game to play against Winnipeg. But the D-man uh, nobody really knows about besides Rangers fans maybe is this Braden Schneider. Oh, this guy can play. He's on their third pair right now. Uh, he was a first-round pick a few years back. This guy is nasty, dude. They got yeah. Keandre Miller. They got Fox. They got Truba. Truba's I love that big... Lindgren. That Lindgren's, Lindgren's a, a fucking beast. honey badger. That's a hell of a hockey team, dude. And Panarin's come out light to uh, you know fire. He's just blazing up this league. It's just a... A very good team. And then with with Shost uh, Shosturkin, it's like uh, they could win the Stanley Cup. I know it may sound crazy to some people. If the Rangers won the Stanley Cup, I would not be surprised at all. I'll say that. I don't want to hear it. Shut the fuck up. So you're <laughs> saying, okay, let's get this. Let's no, get this no. Uh, listen. Did you say they were going to miss the playoffs because you hate them so much? Or did you actually think they would? No, because I, I fucking hate them. I don't want to okay, root for them. I don't want to say fair, they're going to make the playoffs. And I agree with you. They look very dangerous right now. Between the goaltending, between an unbelievable sixth defenseman they have rolling in, it's kind of like you talk about Vegas, where there's really not a lot of weak, weak links back there. And what was the one thing that we said would be a major determining factor on whether they could compete for the Stanley Cup? Whether those, you know, the Frenier bottom six and guys and Lafreniere and Kako getting going. And the fact that he's off to a decent start, four goals in his first eight games, I, one, I'm happy for him because of the amount of pressure that you face as a first overall pick when you're not producing offensively like you see like the rest of the guys are doing, it could probably be a little bit tiresome. But sometimes you have to give guys a little bit of time to develop. And if he does, then and develops into what, you know, about first overall pick, look out. This team is very fucking dangerous. This is also dangerous. with um, Goudreau and Wheeler and somebody else. They don't have a point yet. And I actually know. thought Wheeler, I thought Wheeler would go in and get 40, 40, 50 points. I think he still could. Maybe that's obviously a, a reach, 40 to 50. But surprising to get zero production from those bottom guys and still be doing, they're, they're atop the Metro, correct, right now? Yep, right now. Yep. And they got friggin' Shesterkin, dude. Jesus. Going back to what started the whole conversation, though, I'm a firm believer in like guys who are unbelievable guys behind the scenes who have had these awesome careers. I like to see it have like a, a happy ending 
And I feel like some guys deserve that. And Jonathan Quick, the teammate that he was, deserves that. And with how last year unfolded with, you know, getting traded, going over to Columbus and then getting moved over to to Vegas, which obviously was a storybook ending in itself. Now he gets to play. He's he's from Connecticut, correct? Yeah, yeah. Rangers so he gets to play. Up. I'm sure it was his team growing up yep. and get to end there where R.A., you mentioned it with the hip surgeries and all the issues from a health perspective that he's had. The fact that he's still going and then now getting to play for his probably his team favorite team growing up. That's a pretty cool situation and also have an impact and and, ha- and be at the top of his game again. So and, uh, awesome Grinelli, to see. Can you check? I think he's like reachable to break the all time wins mark by a U.S. goalie from Ryan Miller. I think he could probably get that this year. I don't know if you could check that one out, but it's the perfect spot for him because of how good Shesterkin is. Yeah. It's like, we need you for 25 games. Um, we, well, we know what we're getting from you so far, at least, and we have such a good deep team that I think he fits in perfectly with the Rangers. Makes a lot of sense he's there. And and one of the things that Sean Burke told me, because he, he was, um, you know, he still is goalie coach for the Vegas Golden Knights, is how important he was to Hill when Hill came in to calm him down on maybe a few goals that Hill thought that he he could he wanted back where he'd say, buddy, you're fucking buzzing right now. Let it go. This happens throughout the course of a cup run where he had already had that experience. So for a guy like Shesterkin to be able to lean on him like that, Whit, as you just said, that is so fucking vital. Yeah. And on top of that, to be contributing, that's fucking huge for the Rangers. So, hey, are they Fugazis and frauds? Yes. Can I like a few members of their team? Yes. But the fan base, they can fuck off. Wait, he's 30 wins away from passing. Oh, all right. So I don't know if he'll play next year. Who knows? That's probably going to be tough to, to do this year unless Shesterkin gets injured, knock on wood. Oh, Rangers God. Fans. Don't oh, say it. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, it it feels like did. what like they, they could still get to at least another get higher than what they've done. I mean, what's it? they only have three forwards that have more than one goal right now. Kreida, uh, Lafreniere, and Panarin. Other guys only have one goal. I, I feel like Panarin. they've still got a lot more to offer. Than they're still in for, <laughs> <laughs> you mean like the cards? <laughs> but that brand Panarin. 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 Pan- yeah, Panarin buzzing down yeah. the wing. I wouldn't um, be surprised right, if they yeah, I mean, off Obviously, you want you want depth scoring. You want Wheeler to get going. You want Barkley Goudreau to get going. But to see what they're doing right now with that lack of production from so many guys, that's almost a good sign. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I was alluding to it. Now. A Panarin, eight-game season, opening point streak, two to start the year. So, yeah, the Rangers making uh, the busy boy look a little silly right now. I don't think they're fugazi at all. Or whatever. Boys, uh, I, let's send it over to Logan Cooley right about now. Uh, Arizona rookie, Biz, you, you got uh, hooked him up with us. Great little conversation we had with him. We, uh, we, we were a little silly, I'd say, here, Biz. Try to get the, the young guys laughing a little bit. We had a lot of fun with him chatting. We, were, we were very silly, and, and it was a pleasure talking to this young stud coming up in the ranks. And uh, let's hope by the time this podcast drops, he is thanking <laughs> the Warthog for telling him to shoot the pill. Fingers crossed, and you'll know exactly what we talk about after you enjoy Logan Cooley. All right, guys, before we go any farther, I want to talk to you about Game Time, who is the exclusive ticketing partner at Barstool Sports, created by fans for fans. Game Time is a ticketing app that makes it easier than ever to score last minute tickets on sports, concerts, and shows, and they guarantee the lowest price. I mentioned it last week. I'll mention it again. Game Time hooked me up with amazing tickets to the Devils game this past Friday, Devils versus Sabres. Jack Hugh, right? Jack Hughes right now, the greatest show on ice. It was a blast to watch, but I wouldn't been able to do it without game time. And like I said, it was all possible with the game time app. The biggest last minute price drops can be found on the seats you thought you could never buy. They'll even credit you 110% of the seat price if you can find a better deal elsewhere. You can also get limited time discounts with exclusive, that's right, exclusive flash deals. The purchase process takes just two taps in 10 seconds. And once you buy your tickets, they're delivered directly to your phone, no printer needed. The app also allows you to share tickets with friends via text, which is super easy, especially as the guy. I'm always the ticket guy heading to these all events. I got to give tickets to Wit, Biz, RA, the whole the whole nine yards. Game time makes it so much easier. Skip the hassle, skip the hassle, and enjoy the moment, baby. Download the Game Time app or go to the website, enter your email, and redeem code Chicklets. That's right, Chicklets for twenty dollars off your first purchase. All right, it's time to bring on our next guest. This nineteen-year-old center from Pittsburgh was taken third overall by Arizona at the twenty twenty-two draft. After one year at the University of Minnesota, where he led the team in points, he joined the pro ranks. 
And in seven games with the Coyotes this season, he has five points, which has him tied for third place among rookie scoring. It's a pleasure to welcome to the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Logan Cooley. How's it going, man? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's it's great to be on with you guys, and you know, I'm looking forward to having a good time. I found out last minute that you're living at Grabner's place. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. It was kind of a last minute thing. Uh, you know, I was looking for because I decided to turn pro and. Um, it was kind of late in late in the summer, so um, kind of looking around, and uh, agent kind of reached out, and you know, lucky enough, he uh, opened his house for me. And family is great; one of the nicest families I've ever met, and um, they've been a huge help. Yeah, I mean, for for those of you who don't know who Grabs is, Michael Grabner, he played with the Coyotes, and just like just an absolute specimen. Like as far as <laughs> he like gets his- forty breakaways a year. <laughs> <laughs> Have you asked him why he couldn't finish on any of them? <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not that. But yeah, he was. Uh, we, we'd be watching games and stuff, and he was he's itching to get out there and penalty kill again. He was telling me so. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's just it's been nice to kind of you know as a younger kid just learn from you know he's played you know a ton of seasons in the NHL and um, just to learn little things of you know the ups and downs and kind of what to expect. So it's been great. Was part of that because he's as crazy about his nutrition as he is his fitness? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, definitely. He's, he's in the gym um, every day lifting he weights. He still and, is? Oh, um, he's a, buddy, oh, he's yeah. a fucking machine. I'm telling oh, you. Yeah. Oh, I didn't <laughs> know that. I, I knew he was fast. I didn't know he was like a well, gym nut. He's got a couple kids that play hockey, right? And he helps coach them at the ice den. So I actually bumped into him recently. I'd love to get him on. We should actually just f- get him on after the 40 minutes with you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we could ask sure him about the breakaway up. thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. But uh, I mean, he's he's still a machine. Is he is he as disciplined with the, with like the meal prepping and all that shit? Um. Yeah. I mean, I think obviously, like you said, he's definitely crazy in in the gym and stuff. <laughs> but um, he said he doesn't you know, care as much as, um, with the food stuff as, as much as he used to, but, uh, definitely, you know, you never see him really eating, you know, junk food or anything like that. He's, but, uh, yeah, he says he just likes the red meat and, um, kind of stays with that liver King. (laughs) <laughs> no it turned out just, the liver he's got cool only natural. eating red meat he like faints on the ice next game it's like what's going on it's like grab the reward out of me let me eat carbs <laughs> oh, that is so but, good um, were you were you kind of i know you, you mentioned you signed late we'll get into that for sure but were you thinking right away like i don't even necessarily know if i want to live alone like i was just with all my buddies at school or or, or were you kind of wanting to be alone and then this and then grabs this place came up and and the, the chance to go there was, was available yeah, I mean, coming from school, like like you said, just being with your buddies all the time, and um, you know, always going to get food with them, uh, little things like that. So I definitely, you know, especially moving to a new place, um, you know, I don't really know how to cook too much either. So um, it was definitely, you know, I wanted to live with someone and um, kind of just have someone, you know, for experience too, what to expect, little things like that. And um, so you know, when we kind of reached out, I was gonna go with Kraus, um, but he was kind of fixing his house a little bit so that kind of um delayed it but um you know then you know we reached out to Grabner and kind of got that situated and um you know I was fortunate enough to get with him and you know it's been such a huge help she cooks every night and you know I have home cooked meals and yeah so it's been you know fantastic I thought you were gonna say Krauser wouldn't let you in because uh, butter pig would get jealous have you seen his <laughs> dog's Instagram no, I haven't. Oh yeah, oh buddy, uh, yeah. bring that. Come <laughs> and swing it tomorrow. Butter pig. I think it's called Butter Pig on Instagram, and it's got like fifty thousand followers, and he's obsessed with his dog. So just give yeah, it to him. I'll Come in to tomorrow, nineteen-year-old rookie, just yeah. giving it to him about his dog's Instagram. <laughs> Biz, you upset they didn't call you to see if he could live with you? <laughs> yeah. oh, you think oh, the team yeah. wants him living with Biz? Did, did my name ever come up as a potential candidate? <laughs> No, I don't think so. Cool. Come on. No, not even one. Okay. All like, right. stay away from this address. Don't go anywhere near it. Someone yeah. brings it up in a big boardroom and everyone's dying laughing. The guy's like, ah, what? What's so funny? Uh, pack your bags. You're done. You don't have an office anymore. Uh, oh, hey, but but it must be like a whirlwind because, like, I mean, the last two years of your life, you go from the program, you go to you know Minnesota, you decommitted from Notre Dame, from my understanding. All of a sudden, you get picked second overall. You're in the NHL, and then I mean, Christ, overseas in Australia, that goal went super viral. So it must be a crazy last two, three years of your life here. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, just like you said, being at the program, uh, you go in as a young kid and then, you know, you finish that first year, then, you know, it starts to go into your draft year and, you know, it starts to get a little more real, like you could be playing in the NHL soon. So um, it was definitely, you know, the t- time at the program was unbelievable. Then obviously my time at the University of Minnesota was super fun. And, you know, I feel like I really grew as a player there and um, definitely needed that, you know, extra year. And, um, you know, this year I feel, you know, ready to make the next step. And that's kind of one of the big reasons that, you know, I decided to turn pro is, you know, I felt like I was ready for, you know, the next step to play against these the best players in the world. And, um, you know, obviously the Coyotes are going in, you know, such a great direction. And, you know, it's an exciting time to be a part of this organization. I want to crack myself third overall. I'm sorry. I said second <laughs> overall, third overall. We've never had a second overall pick because it's rigged against us. Go Yotes. Go ahead. So, Rick. um, because uh, after the season, uh, after the, the loss in the finals, you came out and said you were going to be returning back. And then kind of what happened? Did the Coyotes maybe say, listen, we think you're ready? Or did you have a change of heart? I mean, it must have been tough to leave after after one year. But obviously, it's kind of already shown you were definitely ready to make the leap. I just didn't know why originally you had said you'd be staying. Yeah, so it was obviously a long um, discussion. You know, we took basically the whole summer. Um, to kind of figure that out, I was going back and forth. Um, you know, when I decided that, you know, I said I was going to go back, I was fully committed on going back. And, um, you know, obviously Arizona pushed a little hard. And, um, you know, I felt like, honestly, as time went on, I was, you know, I felt more ready. And, you know, I skate with JT Miller, um, Vincent Trocek, John Gibson and in the summer. And, you know, I just competing against them, I felt ready. Um, you know, I loved, you know, going against, you know, some of the best guys in the league. And, um, you know, it was definitely kind of an influence of why, you know, I decided to turn pro. Did uh, Bill Armstrong bring over the, the Louis Vuitton duffel too? Is that how, is that the little <laughs> extra motivation? Is that how yeah, they got it done? For sure. <laughs> oh, they got yeah, pigeon signing bonus now, Biz. They, don't, <laughs> they, they lost those big That's what I'm saying. signing they're going, bonuses. They're going London's route. They're doing it under the table, a little under the table. Get the mom a double wide, you know? <laughs> I love it. That's but um, I, I was I was lucky enough to be in Pittsburgh Sid's rookie year and kind of saw what, yeah. what he did for the city. And like, obviously, they already had a passion for hockey. But then you grew up playing for the junior pens and, and, and growing up. And apparently you're a, a big capitals and Ovechkin yeah, what's fan, up which with I don't this? know what the fuck happened. But <laughs> in terms of the junior pens, did that all begin with Crosby? Had that had there already been a program like take us through how, to, you know, your youth hockey experience uh, involved with like Pittsburgh having some sort of deal with the, the junior hockey? Yeah, so when I first, um, you know, started playing, Crosby, like, uh, did this thing. It's called, like, a learn-to-play program. Um, so, like, Crosby gives, like, all these kids free equipment. And, um, you know, you kind of just go out there. It's like a free skate. and um, But, yeah, he just gives you free equipment. That's kind of where I first, um, you know, started skating and uh, was through that program. And then, you know, after – you no, know, a few years. Then I played for the P- Pittsburgh Penguins Elite Organization. Um, it's two two separate things, and oh, okay. um, you know, played there for six years, and then went to the national team. But yeah, my time there in Pittsburgh, it's crazy how it, how much it's developed into you know a hockey place, and um, you know that program is you know going to continue to get better from there. So, where did your obsession with Ovechkin lean more over uh, being obsessed over Sid? Yeah, I mean, I honestly don't even know exactly like where it started. Uh, I was a huge Capitals fan. I loved just the way they played. Like there was always a super skilled team, and you know, I just loved the way Ovi scored goals and you know would celebrate his goals too. So I was just a huge Ovi fan. Like I said, I don't know exactly where it kind of came from, but you know, definitely got a lot of hate um, in Pittsburgh being the Cavs fan. Oh yeah, a couple swirlies at school. For that. <laughs> yeah, Logan, when when did the idea of going pro go from like I guess a dream to a, a likelihood? When, like, teenager, like, younger than that, a little later? Yeah, I mean, I growing up, I always wasn't the, you know, the biggest in my birth year. Like, I wasn't, you know, the best at all. Um, you know, I think, you know, right when I got to the program, that's kind of really when I started to take off um, and separate a little bit, um, you know, especially towards the end of the 17 year and um, 18 year. It's kind of, you know, when I really hit my, you know, my spurt and, um, 
you know, felt like, you know, I can maybe do something with this game. Uh, uh, Lane Hudson was actually saying um, at the beginning of the 17 year, you could tell kind of how skilled you were, but he said you were trying just no look behind the back, oh, yeah. just like absolute, like Zebra trying special. anything. And then, and then he said <laughs> as the year went on, all of a sudden you were dominating so much that I think you played with the, the under 18 team when you were just on the, on the U-17s, right? So it, it did kind of happen pretty quickly that year in terms of your improvement. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, coming in, I wasn't, like I said, you know, like the best at my birth year at all. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as that time went on, the 17 year, you know, I continued to get better, like each game. And um, so, yeah, um, you know, I really developed my game there. And, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to go up with the 18s, um, you know, playing the under 18 world championship too, um, being the younger guy in Dallas. And, you know, we came up short, but it was, you know, a great learning experience. And, you know, it took a lot from that year. And, and you know, helped me in going into my 18 year and, you know, gave me a lot of confidence too. How, how challenging learning the defensive side of the game has it been? I mean, you, you talked about watching the Capitals and how like you were obsessed with their skill. Yeah. And I mean, you have a, an insane amount of skill as well. How hard has it been for you to learn kind of that element to it, especially at the, like the levels you're escalating? Yeah, for sure. It's definitely something that, you know, I've always wanted to become too as a, as a two-way player. And, um, you know, especially in this league, you need to play both sides of the puck. I've noticed that a lot. And um, there's just so many little details, um, you know, coming from college to the NHL, like little little details of like throwing picks and um, things you don't really notice that, you know, go a long way since, you know, playing my first few games in the NHL that, you know, I've kind of noticed. And, um, you know, you're going against guys like, you know, last night or the other night ago, playing against Kopitar, Fiala and all oh, these guys. Man. and I was yeah, going to ask from, you about that game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just insane um, up and down the lineup. So it's definitely, definitely, um, you know, an adjustment. But, you know, I feel like I've gotten a lot better each game. What's been the uh, toughest thing to adjust to since you became a pro? Um, yeah, I mean, I think just um, knowing when when to make plays and when not to make, you know, the plays that, you know, I think could have worked in college that, you know, won't really work now. So um, it's just, you know, those little adjustments of, you know, managing the puck the right way and, um, you know, not turning it over so much. I always, uh, I, I wanted to ask a guy, Wait, I think we talked about it last week. Uh, was it the Iserman kid who decommitted from a school? Yeah, he actually decommitted from from Minnesota where, where Logan went, but you had decommitted from Notre Dame, right? Yep. Yeah, I committed to Notre Dame when I was 14. Oh, um, what? <laughs> yeah. You could commit to a school that what, have they even like, seen your fucking grades? I wasn't one of the best grades? players my age group. I committed out of the diaper. <laughs> They're like, this I is his, this is his finger painting you just did. Can you commit? It's like, what the hell yeah, is going I think on they, here? I think they uh, changed the rules now. Like, yeah, they did. The, yeah, I don't know. They got exactly guys signing now, out of the but... womb. <laughs> just like sign here just put his foot footprint there with the ink <laughs> jesus christ yeah, that's, kid. that's a, so so what i wanted to ask was did you end up playing an away game at Notre Dame, and do you get the booze in your case i mean you were 14 when you committed but but the headline comes out like the season before right so did you play there and did you get the, the boo treatment <laughs> yeah no didn't get any boo treatment but uh you know i don't think they they take it as that. Like you said, I was 14. I don't know if they even, you know, really. <laughs> That'd be pretty fans ruthless. Would re remember. Like, oh, we, didn't even, we forgot about you committing here. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. No, but I mean, Notre Dame was a, you know, a special place with, you know, my family, my uncle played there. Um, that was oh. kind of a big reason why I committed there, um, you know, when I was 14. So I didn't really know too much about, you know, Notre Dame. I just knew my uncle played there and, um, you know, he said nothing but great things about it. So I was like, yeah, I'll go there. But you now as you start to get older, you, you realize that, you know, that's probably not the best fit for me at that time. You go on a school visit, you're like, this ratio stinks. I'm fucking out of here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Isn't it like eight dudes to every girl there? At Notre Dame? Probably. Hor horrible ratio from my understanding. I do this I type of scouting. I would love where you're getting your college ratio information. Uh, 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 R.A., uh, help me out here. No, you don't know anything? Go I hey, went to North Adams I know. State. <laughs> don't knock the Mohawks, buddy. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that big on the academics. I know that. I, I can't speak to the uh, guy-to-girl ratio, but I know Gee, that. Can you, G can maybe Google it, but we can move on here. Oh, yeah, we got yeah, it. Hold on. I, I got there it right we go. here. 
80 says, 20 uh, sounds a little ridiculous. This sounds like yeah, a reason like, why somebody would decommit. It. <laughs> it says University of Notre Dame has a total undergraduate enrollment of 8,971 with a gender distribution of 51% male, 49% oh, female. Oh, fuck. Okay. Well, oh, Mother the old 50 no, 50. A real sausage school's <laughs> trying to stick to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Holy Maybe shit. they're inside studying and the, and the men are out there roaming the streets. <laughs> no, but the coach at Minnesota, Bob Motzko, who was actually an assistant there years ago, then he was at um was it St. Cloud State I think and then he went yep. to Mini but you had played for him at World Juniors is that kind of how the first time you met him or was there no connection at all Yeah no I never played with him at World Juniors Oh he um, wasn't the coach then No no I had Lehman um Nate Lehman who's Providence coach but uh yeah I mean I think just the reason I chose Minnesota's um you know I have a good buddy Jimmy Snagrud um you know I played with at the program and um who was there and was going there and um you know i knew nice was there faber so i knew a ton of guys that were there and they said nothing about great great things about the program and um you know i knew we were gonna have a special team too and a team that you know i could make you know a run at the national championship and you know obviously we got pretty close but came up short but you know i felt like it was the right spot that it was you know right for my de development and um you know it could help my game and you know it did it helped so much and you know i learned a lot um, from being around the coaching staff there. And um, obviously my teammates helped a ton also. How'd you like playing on that giant sheet of ice they got there? Did you have to do anything <laughs> yeah, different? Oh, it's it was, bigger? It's Olympic ice huge. there? Huge. Yeah, they actually switched it now. It's hybrid. Um, but oh, yeah, nice. it, was, it was like an ocean last year. It was, I honestly didn't like it too much. It's, you know, a lot more skating. and It's harder um, to get chances. On the big like, yeah, uh, is, sativa yeah. leading? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and especially, like, shooting out, too. Like, you're so much farther, like, on a power play. And, um, yeah, but it has, obviously, it has its benefits of, you know, having more room out there. But, you know, honestly, I like the NHL sheet way more. Do you think that part of um, leaving maybe as well was, was the year you had last year and you, you see Nyes and he pops into the playoffs, does a real good job for Toronto, and you're like, Fuck, we just kind of did it this year together. I mean, I, I lit it up as well. So maybe I, 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 I could do this the same way he just hopped in and did it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, you know, right when we lost that uh, final game, um, you know, I was pretty close to signing then. And obviously you see those guys playing, um, you know, guys like Lacombe, Faber, Nice, uh, playing in those games. And, you know, you get excited. You want to get out there. And um, it was kind of hard to, not rush into it because I wanted to make the right decision and um, do what was best for me and not just see them playing. So I want to go, but yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, the season I had, um, you know, I didn't know if there was a ton left for me in college hockey still. Um, you know, I feel like I proved um, a lot there and, um, you know, I feel like I was ready for the next step of, you know, being pushed against the best players in the league and, um, you know, seeing what, you know, I could kind of do with this organization. I'm I'm a Leafs jock sniffer. Uh, what's nice like <laughs> as a guy? He's awesome. He's he's a great guy. Um, you know, I learned a lot from him too. He's he's a heck of a player, but you know, he likes to have fun off the ice. And um, you know, we had a good time for sure at school last year. <laughs> and, and you there guys had go. that? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. What, what does that mean? <laughs> That's the most uh, we're getting uh, out of him. Yeah, but that was something. <laughs> Tight lip, it's in the vault. Um, and then you guys had Faber. So, like to standard, did you guys have a pretty dominant team there? Like, I mean, that like that was like that's like a wagon of a squad right there. Yeah, we were we were sick. We had a we had so many good players. Um, you know, we had a ton of freshmen too. I think we had eleven freshmen. Um, you know, and most teams have like four. Like I think Quinnipiac had maybe one freshman. Um, so we were a super young team. Um, you know, we kind of took us um you know a little slow in the beginning just everyone getting used to college hockey but you know once we kind of got used to it and um you know we kind of dominated um the rest of the year isn't quinnipiac the school that has like 28 year olds who have like two kids and a family and they just they get <laughs> yeah. all the old guys and that's how they talk <laughs> yeah. i'm not even shitting on them is that isn't that the oh, thing yeah. some of these schools yeah, no, they I, make kids play two years of junior no matter what and then they know they're getting them at 21 done at 25 and they just truck stick some of these 18 year olds like Merrimack does it in hockey East. I they think part time does jobs it. as firemen yeah. during the, during the season <laughs> yeah. just lumberjacks. They're just putting their police uniform on as they leave the regular. Yeah, I got the overnight. You're like, what the fuck? So that's yeah, kind of no, the, I'm the, almost, the, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I'm almost positive. Like they had one freshman. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Like, yeah. And he was the only one that played. So, well, um, but, I, I was I, I was watching obviously the Frozen Four last year and 
And uh, then I, I really noticed Faber, right? And, like, even watching Mini this year, like, he's already, like, one of their top defensemen. Yeah. You could tell through college he was that dominant. Yeah, he was, like, even going against him in practice, he couldn't get around him. He's so good defensively. Um, even, you know, he's got so much better offensively, too. He's, he's I know he's worked on that, um, you know, a lot. And uh, he definitely wanted to make that better in his game. But defensively, he's such a good skater, so poised with the puck and, um, you could see just the plays he would make in college, and you know it was definitely going to translate. And you see what he's doing with the Wild now. Look, look, did you have a mad dash to get to the draft in Montreal? I mean, you can't be missing trips to Montreal already right, if you turn eighteen, brother. Oh yeah, yeah. We're, that was during when the flights were all getting canceled, or I forget exactly. So we, we got like this this van, and um, you know it was an ugly van, awful van. Like we barely fit it, my whole family in there, and. Um, I think it was like 13 hours. It was a miserable ride, but, um, you know, it was definitely <laughs> nice to have all my family there and, um, thank God we made it. Cause yeah, that would have been an awful one to miss for sure. Why was it? Why was it so awful? Cause you guys just crammed in there. farts for 13 yeah, hours. Just <laughs> farting the, farting the whole way. I got to I gotta gain <laughs> weight before training camp. <laughs> just <laughs> shit, shit in everybody's mouth. <laughs> no, it was just like an awful, ugly van, like so uncomfortable. And, um, you know, I'm surprised it even made it there, but um, yeah, it was, it was, it's, it stung um, not being able to fly there for sure. Billy wouldn't send the PJ. Did, did your dad get you into hockey? Like when you were real young, like was he, did he play um, when he was growing up or? No, he didn't play at all. Uh, both my uncles played, uh, you know, I had two older brothers that played, um, but yeah, my whole family was kind of surrounded by hockey though. Like, um, you know, it was kind of all we, we, we really knew. And, um, you know, when I first stepped foot on the ice, I just, you know, loved the game. I loved being out there. And, um, you know, seeing my brothers play at the time, it, it made me want to do what they were doing. And, um, you know, it was just a good time and, you know, kind of ran with it. Uh, growing up in that minor program, had you gotten a chance to meet Sid? You might have already said it. And looking ahead, I think December, within a week, you actually play head-to-head -head against the Capitals and the Penguins. So within one week, two of your the guys you looked up and two idols, like if you haven't met them, like are you going to say anything on the ice? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I haven't met them. Um, you know, I don't think uh, I'm going to be saying anything uh, to, to cross no tummy, you. But no <laughs> let me sticks? win a face-off. Let me win a face-off. No tummy <laughs> yeah. sticks with Sid, man? Come on, you're a Pittsburgh yeah. kid. Sid will tell him to take a fucking hike if he yeah, tries to Yeah, he'll stab you in your gut with his, <laughs> yeah. with his square ass blade. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely won't be saying anything to him. I'm sure, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think you know my whole family. Um, we have a few box boxes for that game, and um, you know, it's definitely a game that you know I'm really looking forward to playing in. Is you know going back to Pittsburgh and um, you know having all my family friends there, and um, obviously being able to play against Crosby. It's you know growing up in Pittsburgh. Um, he's done so much for that city and uh, for that organization. So it would definitely be pretty cool to be on the same ice as him. So when you mention your uncles, so your cousin now, is that LJ Mooney? Yep. Yeah, so the Biz, he's got a cousin that's on the under-17 USA program as well. And, and I guess the lab. kid's a stud. Like, I hear, I think he's a little undersized, but he's sick. Is is his dad your uncle that got you into the game that played at Notre Dame? So his dad is, uh, he played at Colorado College. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he's, his dad is, um, you know, growing up, I we'd always do um, you know, extra like skill sessions, um, just growing up in Pittsburgh and, um, you know, we'd be up at, you know, six thirty in the morning, um, you know, before our practice, before school skating, and he'd be running those practices. So he's been a huge help. He's, he's helped me grow my game so much and, um, you know, it's helped me learn so much also. And yeah, um, you know, my little cousin is, he committed, he recently committed to Minnesota also. So oh, um, shocker. definitely kind of, definitely kind of got him going there. Uh, I told him it would be a good time. So. Uh, but yeah, he's doing good at the program right now. And, um, you know, he's going to be a heck of a player for sure. As someone not familiar with college hockey, what is University of Minnesota known for? Like, do, is that is that the, the building that's hockey. got the gold seats? Uh, no, like yeah, in the, in the, in, from a college hockey essence, like what, you know, we just joked about Quinnipiac being the old guys. Like Minnesota's always been, I think, like a true powerhouse. Like they're one of the big dogs. The 70s. Yeah. I like to I like to say that they're the Toronto Maple Leafs of college hockey. Wow, really? Wow. You guys are the funny. My, my freshman no and sophomore year of college, they won the national title back to back. Yeah, it's Boom. been a bit. It's been Boom. a bit. 
But they're like the biggest name. Like they're like the New York Yankees, the Toronto Maple Leafs. Well, it's hard because it seems like they bring in all these like studs who play one year and then they go off yeah. and play in the NHL. So I guess it's a little hard to have a winning program when fucking you're playing against 30 year olds at Quinnipiac and you got guys <laughs> yeah. in diapers fucking toe dragging out there. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, for sure. It's definitely been the biggest thing I think is just getting guys that, you know, stay one to two years. And then, you know, like you said, then you get, you know, teams like Quinnipiac that have guys that, you know, are coming in as freshmen that are 21 years old. So it's definitely, uh, definitely that's the big adjustment, but, um, you know, I think, you know, the program kind of speaks for itself. It's, it's such an historic program and, um, you know, it's definitely a great spot to play. Actually, I'm sure Cools is aware of this, but I don't know if Biz is. <laughs> what they not. what they were forever known for actually was you had to be from Minnesota to play there. Yep. And, Come on, and, at and the college you, for the hockey team? Yeah, dude, there's that many good players in Minnesota, so every right. kid on the team was from Minnesota. And then I don't know if it was the first player in a long time that they got. They got Grant Patulny, and he was from <laughs> North Dakota. And he went there, and then he scored the overtime winner in the NCAA title game, ironically enough. Holy shit. Yeah, I don't think he was the first ever not from Minnesota, but they hadn't done it in a while. So if you were a kid from Minnesota and you were like the stud and you didn't go you, there, you was went it to, like, they, You went to Minnesota, yes. Okay, I so there was a, it was non-negotiable. They bring you out behind the shed, eh? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you can have another what was that show that was in wisconsin the the, the murder mystery fargo no not making fargo, murder. the other one making, making a, murder. a murder we'd have another making oh, murder yeah. on our hands yeah. <laughs> the kid who didn't commit the kid who decommitted <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's we should write it together let's not pick it on 21 year old freshman biz uh yeah. you guys get chicago tomorrow night obviously caught him a dad was uh the first time you played against him at the juniors in 2023 Going head yep. with him. Yeah, that was the first time. Um, you know, I heard about him growing up a little bit, but uh, yeah, that was the first time that you know I really saw him and um, played against him. Do you know him at all? Are you friendly with him or just kind no, of? No, he ain't playing here. fucking Timmy tummy sticks <laughs> out there. Before the game, he ain't even to do yeah, with no. Ovi and City. He ain't fucking dapping up a dart in the pregame. Come on, all right? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know him personally or anything like that. Uh, yeah. Back to the draft. Uh, so third overall, did you like? Going in, know that if you got to Arizona, they were going to take you. Did you have? Did your agent tell you what to expect? Chance at first overall, like what? What was that night like in terms of like expectations? Um, yeah, I mean, I thought, you know, going into it, I thought I was going to go pretty early. I didn't know exactly. Um, you know, I had a range where you know I thought I was going to go, but um, still, you don't really know what's going to happen on you know a draft night, especially when you see um, kind of the, how the order obviously Wright was supposed to go for sure for so long and then you kind of see the switch up there so then you really start to get confused and um, wonder what's going to go on but you know I've had I had a lot of great meetings with Arizona um, you know we you know had a really good connection I felt like and um, you know I felt like they really liked me at the time too so I thought you know if I would um, you know get down to three that you know I'd have a good chance of going there and um, but, you know, I met with the Flyers, um, like, I think it was like 20 minutes before the draft, too. And um, I think they were trying to, like, trade up. And so I didn't know exactly wow, what was going to happen. Break, and, breaking news. <laughs> fucking right, yeah, buddy. But, Keep going. Any more gems? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, um, you know, nothing happened, obviously, there. And, um, you know, I was happy that, you know, I went to Arizona for sure. Torch oh, should be walking you around with a dog collar on right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, oh, my God. That is fucking too good, man. I don't even remember what my next question was now. Oh, God. That is fucking good. Your coach seems like a, a guy the players really enjoy playing for. I know he kind of cut your ice time a little bit. He explained it today. How, take us through that, that whole process, what happened the other night, and like you know how you still kind of learn aspects of the pro game. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, he's, he's a coach that I really like. Um, you know, he has a lot of high expectations for, you know, all the players, and um, he demands a lot, which is good, um, you know, especially being a young kid. And, um, yeah, but I think, you know, just different things on the back check that, you know, I wasn't doing and small details that, you know, kind of went over today, which, you know, was really helpful. And, um, you know, still, still a young kid, still learning, and, um, you know, I still have to, have those attention to details. And if I'm not doing that and not helping the team, then, you know, I don't deserve to be out there. And, um, you know, I wasn't that game. So, um, you know, I accept that. And, uh, but yeah, we kind of went over it um, today and um, yeah, but like I said, he's, he's a great coach and 
um, you know, I've enjoyed playing with them. And I know you get seven shots on that. Have you been like maybe gun shy or kind of looking for that perfect shot or just thinking pass first all the time? Yeah, I mean, I think just, um, you know, you want that first goal so bad and um, then you start overthinking a little bit. So I think just, um, you know, kind of just shooting the puck a little more, um, not trying to force m many plays and um, just kind of let your play um, do it and um, just kind of have fun. And, um, you know, I think just not paying attention to the outside noise, little things like that, that, you know, or being the rookie and, um, you know, just kind of enjoying and having fun is, you know, what I need to get back to. You're going to score against Chicago right now. And after the game in the post game presser, you're going to say, all right, told me to pull the trigger. And that's why <laughs> yeah. I fucking buried it tonight. You got to do it. Yeah, sure. You got to do will. it. He's grilling I you will. about not shooting I enough. Will. Fucking all right. I love this. This would be, oh. just say, just say the warthog had me fire. And then, then <laughs> yeah. It's then the year of the hog, man. man. You're going to fight. It's, yeah. it's coming. I know it's coming why, now. Why number 92 in college and, and this year? Um, so I wore 18 uh, kind of my whole life. And, you know, older guy on the team at Minnesota at 18. And, um, you know, kind of just like the higher number, um, a number that no one really wears too often. So um, I thought it looked pretty good and um, had a good year at Minnesota with it. So I decided to keep it. I mean, you just mentioned you're, you're, you're young, you're still learning, 19 years old. And, and I want to go back to that game the other night against the Kings. Like, just like how hard is go going up against those top dogs? Because that's a team where they're so loaded at center ice. So like night in and night out, you're having to go against some of these guys who are just fucking dogs. I mean, those three yeah. guys in, in Dubois, Kopitar, and Deneau, like what was that experience like? And I know you got to play a little bit against them at the, in the Australia experience, but regular season hockey has a little bit of a different tone to it. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely, especially being a center and going against those guys, just snapping it back on you, know, like, like nothing. And, um, yeah, but it's definitely been, you know, an adjustment and um, it's been good going against them too. You know, like, uh, like I said, I'm learning a lot and um, learning how to play in this league and um, kind of what to do and what not to do. And, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like I've been saying each game, I feel like I'm getting a little more comfortable and i um, starting to learn a little more about the game too. Was, uh, was your Michigan style goal last year, the first time you ever pulled it off in a game? Uh, I, I pulled it off uh, at the end of the 18 year. Um, at the program at the world championships uh but yeah that was the that was my first time doing it then yeah that was sick that was it was that at penn state <laughs> no that was at the mullet oh the it's you, it's suck on that yeah. Yeah. that's probably why you got drafted here they saw that <laughs> yeah. and they were creaming their pants in the box I'm like, oh, I'm draft him. <laughs> the, the goal from the uh, preseason in australia had you pulled that off successfully before in a game um, I mean, I don't, I don't think he knows what yeah. he did. Yeah, dude, that was remote <laughs> control. Just That's hit every stick. fucking button. And something ended up coming up from it. <laughs> yeah, kind <laughs> you of did just... like six moves to get there. It started in the fucking D zone, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, at that point, I think it's just kind of instincts and um, kind of just given what the game gives you. And um, you know, I felt like he was kind of cheating on that when I was going to cut back and um, decided to spin and. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to get that one in and um, it was definitely a big confidence boost too. And obviously it's still preseason, but you know, it felt good to get that one under your belt. Were you on a, like a top 10 on, on sports center? Probably. I mean, you must've got a million texts. Did you notice your social media following going up because of it? <laughs> yeah, I definitely knew that. Um, I don't know about the sports center top 10 or anything, but definitely blew up for a while there. Um, you know, it was funny getting a lot of texts and yeah, I definitely gained a pretty good following from that also. And going back to that whole Australia experience, like it's got to be a good thing to like get to know your teammates a little bit more. I know when we started out, uh, uh, we started out with those world premiere games. So that was like yep. the first experience I had in the NHL where I got to go overseas and you're with your teammates a little bit more because you're at the hotel and on the road. Did that help you get acclimated? And like, who are the, who are, who are some of the guys that you hang out with the most and are just like the silly bastards on the team? Yeah, it, it helped a ton. I mean, obviously coming in, I didn't really know anyone at all. Like I, I knew Keller a little bit, just he's with the same agency as me. So I talked to him a little bit, but um, it was definitely a great team bonding experience. Just um, get to know the guys a little more. Obviously, you know, we're going out to dinner and um, doing different things in Australia um, together. So that was extremely helpful. It was, it was a fun training camp too. And um, getting to play those two games in Australia too was, was pretty cool. And um, yeah, I mean, I think we have a great group of guys, you know, we all hang out with each other when we can and, um, just had a Halloween party, um, last night. So that was, that was a good time too. And, 
Um, but yeah, we, like I said, we have a great group and, um, all the guys are fun to be around. What was your costume? <laughs> it was like a last minute thing. I was like Captain Hook or something. It was terrible, but <laughs> there were, oh. there were some funny costumes. Yeah. Just so here, here's McBain, a little, Mc, what do you, what do you guys say? Mc, Mc, McBain had a good one. It was, it was like this grandma thing. It was, it was pretty good, but, uh, yeah, there were some good ones, but, um, it was kind of like a last minute thing. So everyone was kind of scrambling. Yeah, a little tidbit. Don't be tweeting out photos of uh, guys at the Halloween party. The one, <laughs> the yeah. one year, and like le- legit, like I didn't even know what this was. I, Rafi Torres went as Jay Z, and his wife went as Beyonce, and like they, you know, had put some stuff on to look more like Jay Z and Beyonce. And I tweeted it out blackface, but <laughs> people were going crazy. I'm like, what the fuck is this blackface thing? And I <laughs> ended like, up that a new rapper. <laughs> <laughs> I played cleanup the next fucking three days. Dave Tippett was so angry at me, more so than when I almost got us kicked off. I kicked us out of a hotel on game day for saying "fuck you, Fairmont" at the water prices. Probably should have kept that one offline too. So, just a tidbit: don't be tweeting out the costumes. Yeah. Maybe just keep those in the vault. And, and yeah. cool, that right there is a quick glimpse into why you were never living with yeah. business. Either. Yeah, so yeah. there you go. That's probably <laughs> when it ended. That's probably you're gonna have, the, you're it gonna goes have back to that story. <laughs> but uh, thanks for coming on, man. It's it's actually it's been pretty sick to watch you play. I mean, just before we interviewed you, I went through the highlights of last season. It's you're, you're an incredible player. So I'm looking forward to watching you uh, rip up this league for for a lot of years. So good luck. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Cool. Uh, pleasure, pal. When you find wait, wait, don't stop the recording. When you find the back <laughs> of the net tomorrow, what are you saying to the fir- the reporter yep. first thing? <laughs> that one's for R.A. No, you're gonna say the warthog told or, me to pull the trigger. The, the warthog, the, the warthog. warthog told me, and then go yeah. hucks on net. And then you have to put your fingers like this, and you gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> It'll go viral again. Wait, like listen, if you get, go if he, viral, if you want your numbers to keep going, that's off. what I'm saying. You want that gram? You want that gram interaction, It'll baby? Be, it's gonna be first intermission with the guy Todd, right, Biz? That's the guy that does the yeah does wall the, sheet. Yeah. And, well, and just say, yep. yeah, say, what happened? And say, the, the, the warthog told me to shoot it. And then pull the, I like pull the trigger better. <laughs> pull the trigger. Then, pull the trigger. But yeah, I will I say this. You, you don't have to do the in the post-game presser. <laughs> If you score, if you score one, if you get the, if you get two, you got to do the little, sn- the, the little fingers in the front. Promise? That was good. Yeah, I'll All do All right. It. No tummy yeah, sticks buddy. with Bedard either. Good luck, yeah. brother. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Before we go any further, here's a word from our good friends at Body Armor. Spitting Chicklets is brought to you by Body Armor. From sports drinks to sport water, Body Armor keeps us hydrated all day long. Whether talking, watching, or even playing sports, maybe a little basketball, Body Armor is our go-to choice. Real hydration, real ingredients, packed with electrolytes, vitamins, and nothing artificial. Body Armor has great taste of flavors like my favorite right here, strawberry banana, a little blue raspberry, whatever you want, they have it. And the best athletes in the world hydrate with Body Armor like Ronald Acuna Jr., Christian McCaffrey, Alex Morgan, and the latest athlete to join the stable, Joe Barrow. Nice little quarterback action. Like I said, man, strawberry banana, that's my go-to. Uh, someone needs to knock it down from the throne, but whether we're recording late night, whether I play a little hoops, need to get the little hydration after, whatever, chicklets cup, body armor. Absolute way to go. It's available in stores nationwide. Head on over to the Body Armor store on Amazon and get yours today. Thank you so much to Logan Cooley, a future superstar in the NHL. Yes, I'll say superstar. And if you don't believe me, watch him play one game or go to YouTube and click on Logan Cooley's highlights from his freshman year at the University of Minnesota. I I had watched him play in the Frozen Four against BU, but this highlight reel is something else for a young freshman to be doing what he did last year. You could see the skill and I, I'd say right now he should have been the first overall pick, but uh, also pretty interesting to, to uh, hear him say that it was quite evident. Philly was trying to trade up to grab him at his draft. So Jonesy. I, I don't know if that had ever been out there, but biz, you got the costume change. Where's yeah. busy at? This is basically like, yeah, where's biz in North America? Well, and you also mentioned to watch his highlights on, on YouTube. And while you're there, folks, make sure you subscribe to the Spit and Chicklets YouTube channel. We have 300,000. Thank you, Ryan Whitney, for giving a little fun fact. Over 300K, folks. And yes, I'm Where's Waldo. This was the original costume until we heard Joe Thornton announce his retirement, or we saw him do it uh, with tarps off and the cowboy hat. So this was the OG. 
and we're here to talk about where's Waldo and uh, actually where's Wall, the new Leafs goaltender. We're going to get to him in a bit, but Ari, I'll send it back over to you for whatever we have in the outline. Our, uh, our production team threw their costumes oh, on yeah. as well oh, today. Oh, let's Let go. me throw we made them everybody in here. Dress up. Sean with the all-time Tiger King. Look at that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's got his dog with the I'll never financially recover from this. <laughs> and then we got and then we got Fishy Boy who's Wit's first mate. There we go, there Fish. There he is. I love that. Oh. Ooh. oh you, Fishy you looks beard, more like you a got pirate. The beard all uh elastic top. I got uh, I got some uh some gold in my my beard. Is that a real He actually earring? looks like a pirate. Real earring? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, we appreciate your guys' effort. We should uh, maybe uh, if you're on the YouTube channel, drop a comment and vote who's got the best costume of all six of us right now. I would say strong lead for the Tiger King because he has the dog prop. Oh, absolutely, Sean! I'm looking, <laughs> that's fucking hilarious. The fucking dog there. Hey, Biz, uh, a little like, trivia. Take this fucking thing off me, please, Sean. <laughs> uh, little trivia for you, Biz. Uh, which two defensemen are currently tied in goals in the NHL? See if you Ooh. can get this one. Okay, uh, who's been scoring from the back end? God damn it. Okay, so I mean, first bet would be Makar. Nope, he's not. He's not even one of them. Who's lighting no, it up? Two, from the two back? guys. Tied, oh, uh, tied with four. Tied with four. I mean, Fox has what twelve points? Is Fox one of them? Nope. No, oh, for fuck's sake. Damn. Uh, what do you got? Wait, any Goss bear? Nope. Chikrin. He's one of them. Oh, okay, so I was going to say Hughes? one of the guys from Ottawa. No, no Hughes. Quinn Hughes is fucking lighting the lamp. No, That's a good answer, good. but he's, he's great, more of a but... passer. Um, is it a really off the board name for the last Not defenseman? At all. Not at all. No, been around for a, a little bit. And got quite the veteran. Tyler uh, Myers. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Five, four. Just three. tell us the name. Charlie Drew Doughty. Drew Doughty. Drew Doughty. Oh, Drew Doughty. My two kids. the other night. Jesus, what a slap in the face to Doughty. Yeah, a little fun, a little trivia there. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Frozen Frenzy Tuesday, boys. We had. Who are you laughing at, Biz Nasty? Just you digging deep on that <laughs> trivia question. Ah, like, well, shit's who's got who's tied fun. for the league lead in goals for defense? I, <laughs> you, you, you stumped we didn't us. Sniff it either. Yeah. You yeah, stumped right. us. It was fun. Uh, no, it was fun Tuesday night. 16 games from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. Staggered start times. Everybody loved that. Uh, go to you, actually, Grinelli. How much of the frenzy were you able to watch? It's, it's kind of tough when you're trying to watch your team play and all that going on, but how'd you enjoy it? I watched the entire thing. Uh, I thought it was a massive, massive home run by ESPN in the NHL. I I don't know how they could do this, but if if next year or a year after they could implement doing this once a week, I think that would be so I think that's for the impossible. NHL. I, I think it is too, but I, I just the NHL took over on Tuesday night. And it's very rare that the NHL can take over on a full day, just like the NFL does on Sunday. So I just think it was a massive, massive home run, and they got to figure out a way that they can do this again. So, so Tuesday is my travel day to uh, to go to Atlanta for TNT. But from the reviews and everything and the short amount of time I got to watch it, it seems like it was a massive success. That's the one thing I had wrote down too, G. I didn't think it would be probable that they could do it once a week, just given the load that like Butcher Gross and, and Weeksy and the rest of that whole crew having to be there all day long doing this thing i would i would say that once a month would be something that would be easily sustainable and i think that they need to do it based on the overall r response to, to how the day was all right you we were going over the outline and you were saying oh i want to talk about all these different things but just kind of summarize all these you're like this happened that happened that so it was non-stop getting your endorphins bumping off of all this hockey action absolutely i mean well the the uh, tuck kachuk battle between auto and buffalo uh, uh tuck well Brady thought Tuck uh, might have uh, put a leg on leg there. He got he threw his gloves down before he even stood up, went right at him, and he he got him on that last punch. I don't think he meant to kind of hit his head off the ice, but that's actually what happened. I don't know if you saw Tuck had all the stitches above his eye. It was kind of a tough scene. That went down. Um, just a great game with those two. Also, how about the, the Seattle game? The fucking dude throws his stick like a fucking javelin. The refs are right there. It should have been, I mean, not a penalty shot, but it should have been, what, a delay of game penalty. Nothing happened. Seattle goes down the other end and scores. That was like a Keystone Cops type thing. Uh, but I, it was it was great just watching game to game. I mean, obviously, when the Bruins were on, I had a lot more focus on them. I know Witt had a little uh, pissed off viral moment about the, uh, what do you call it, uh, disallowed goal for Bedard out. Yes. On the yes. Side oh, things. And, I, and call. I, I, well, here's the thing. I didn't word what I was trying to say correctly. Shocker. But <laughs> I understood completely because a lot of the responses were, it's offsides. It's offsides. Yes, I know. What I meant to kind of get across was they need 
to change this rule. Okay, they they have to figure it out, guys. Like at this point, this is not what the rule was intended. And apparently, I'm being told by very good sources that when they put in the the ability to go and review offsides, I guess Bettman told the GMs and the owners, wherever it is, don't do this. Do not do this. You will regret it. And they went through and did it. And now they all regret it because this is not why they did it. They did it. They, they thought they'd get, um, you know, plays that happen right then and be able to like go look and maybe goals would be scored right then. I don't even know if guys thought about the, 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 the fact that Got, teams would be in the zone for a minute, yeah, minute, 20 the seconds. Time that, and then and, also the time it takes to review most of them. The time it takes to review, okay? And if you look at like VAR and soccer and like the tennis ball technology where they know right away if it's out, it's just this time killer in terms of going yeah. back, looking. So many things happen. And the main issue is that like all these times – it doesn't even really affect the play. Like, it didn't make a difference. Yes, it is technically offsides, but, man, when you look at how they're calling this rule and, like, what ends up happening, that's that's not what was intended. And, right. and I actually think, and there's people out there who have said this and agree with this, is if you could change it and make it, though, where the obviously the blue lines, if a puck's maybe uh, passed out to the defenseman and it goes out of the zone, yes, you're reviewing it, and that's, that's what the line's still for. But they should almost change it to where... If there's a defenseman back, it, it should be like like a, a roving blue line. Do you know what I mean? Like soccer in a sense where like as long as there's guys back, that shouldn't be offsides because that didn't change anything. <laughs> Like, I think I, I think like you're you're now like where are they gonna write all that in the playbook now make it even more more confusing no it's, it's, no it's, 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 if there's a rush if there's a rush and there's defenders back boom, you're saying it's good no matter what okay you're saying be, yeah be less lenient on it I think that the so go, to go back to not be a hypocrite I said at a certain point that they should do this because you don't want a team missing playoffs because a goal was scored on them where it was drastically offside now did I anticipate this many of them being called and then all of a sudden goals being called off by legit we're talking that Bedard one was probably what like four millimeters and it of was heel? offsides I didn't say that right. I didn't make it clear that is right. offsides but I Man, would have the guy scoring a goal, the future superstar on Hockey Frenzy, I take it away from, three minutes later. I think from an ownership perspective, you're saying is I wouldn't want my season to be ended by a, a missed call on an offside where the amount of money they make in playoff gate. So I think it obviously comes down to that component as to why the owners wanted this implemented. But from the time perspective and how it's rolled out, I would now say I agree with you. Take it out. It's, take it and, out. And take or, it out. And or – Allow it starting come playoff time because no. the, obviously at that <laughs> I know you sigh, but I'm just trying to give you some fucking compromise here. Whereas if your Oilers lost on a drastic offside come playoff that's time, that's my point. They're never these are never drastic. They're never drastic. They're, you're always going back, and it's a, it's a millimeter, and it's 45 seconds before the goal. And my main thing is it did not affect or change the play. Uh, like, I, I, I saw an empty netter one the other night where it was drastically offside, and the guy's leg was in the air. Oh, an empty probably, netter in the San Jose-Washington game. Oh, my God. I, I just think it's <laughs> like... You just, this, you this just is, told me to not, shove it up my ass. Dude, the, All right, the, the I, game, I hear you. The, it's a it's a fast game. It's faster than ever, and obviously you want to get the calls correct. But I think if you look at the Bedard example, that didn't change a fucking thing in that in that play. Right, it and you're taking no a goal difference. away from him. And a beautiful goal ended up getting scored on a big night in hockey, and they go back and they take it off. And I understand there'll be missed calls. There'll always be missed calls. But I swear you're better off, and you got referees that get chirped. But overall, with the speed of the game, they do a pretty good job at calling these offsides. And if it's that close and they miss it, sorry, bud, you got fucked. I mean, I, I it's it that is better to me than what they're doing right now. If they implemented a live dunk tank during the game for the coach that got it wrong and it was slime, would you? That would be you had to go back to the bench in slime if he gets the offside review wrong. Would you then want to keep it? I, I, I mean, Nickelodeon Knights do possibly, huge numbers. Possibly. Possibly, right. yes. But I, do you know what I'm saying about that if it's a three on two, okay? Boom, no matter what, you're good. You're good. And, and I think that if you did that, you would see that all these players are going to still turn out the exact same way they would. 
and that you don't have to go back 50 seconds. Not so, to mention the fact, not to mention the fact that there are plenty of times, and this will happen at some point, where somebody's going to get injured in the course of play before the goal, and then they're going to go back. It's going to be offsides, and that injury would have been completely preventable. I just. <laughs> I don't. I agree with a lot of what you're saying, but I just have a hard time believing. So you're saying if there's a clear cut three on two, that essentially it becomes soccer style, where a guy could be three feet offside and you're okay because it was a clean three on two rush, and he's as allowed to. As, he's, as long as he's never behind a defender, as long as there's always yeah, but a wait, defender. But you're, but you're also talking about a guy now getting an advantage to that three feet is him on a net drive, pushing the defenseman back off. What do you mean? What I'm saying is, is if that player is allowed that three feet ahead of him on a, if the puck carrier is on the wall side and you have a net front drive guy who's three feet ahead, even though that far defenseman's backed off, it's like, well, he's getting the advantage because if the defenseman on the strong side is holding a strong gap, that's the advantage to the defenseman creating that, that, that gap. Is, is forcing that net front drive guy to then hold up and hold the blue line where that's so much part of the game where that's where I disagree with you. Is I hadn't thought so that far through. Okay. <laughs> I haven't worked out all the kinks in this. Okay, well, then, all right. All I right. haven't worked out all the kinks in this yet. And there's okay. way more to be as discussed. As long as Earl from Edmonton knows that you're fucking, you know, you're, you're, you're giving thinking all the my, way my, through my, here. My main thing is like, we just cannot be going back and taking Agreed. goals off the board 20 minutes after the fact, and it ended up being like the most minuscule offside that didn't change a thing. I think that it and would I be And I think a overall, if you got rid of offside review, that people wouldn't notice, it wouldn't care, and there would I'll be missed offsides, but, the, but both teams benefit here and there. Like, yeah, I guess in the playoffs, you lose the Stanley Cup on an offside, then I'm the guy, you know, a fan base wants to kill, but and we're, I hate we're these a, reviews. We're a player's podcast, and we... we genuinely side with the fans and we care what they think. I think that I'm interested in putting up a poll and seeing what the results are by the end of the podcast to how many fans would be okay getting rid of the the offside review. And I agree with you. I would say that 70% of people would be okay getting rid of it, which I then you made a comment on social media with that. You think that this is just as bad as when they created the no foot in the crease rule. It's the, the current whole, no foot in the crease rule. I, I, I do you agree with that? RA? Do you think it's that bad? Um, no, I, I don't know. It's, does it it's, grind your gears? No, it does. I guess I'm right, that hold on, before gears. you answer, yeah. before you answer, does it not? bum you out as an NHL fan that you see these incredible goals off the rush or off the cycle after they've entered the zone and every single time no matter what first thing is coaches are on the horn with the video coach and every fan base is like oh my god was he onside it, 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 considering the way they entered the zone it's always like it looks so normal it looks exactly like it was done uh, as it should be it looks like all the rules were followed and then boom right away oh, I don't know we got to go back to the ent entry 45 seconds ago it's like that that's not that's not like the spirit of the game like the buddy listen the game worked for a long time without offside review and yeah teams got fucked and yeah teams benefited but in the end you weren't going back and having these delaying games and, and having these beautiful goals getting taken off that happened so long after the entry in which the entry didn't even nothing would have changed put the red line back in too while you're at it the, the toe in the crease is worse because it was just like if it didn't affect the play, it was just like you, like what happened to the Bruins. Wait, remember Tim Taylor? Uh, they played Carolina. The, I want to say it was ninety eight, and they thought they won the fucking game and almost the series, and then they they pulled it down, and it was like Brett Hull. It, it didn't affect the play; it had nothing to do with it. Whereas offsides is offsides. I know people have mentioned like, oh, uh, put a timer on it if it's uh, thirty seconds after, but I, I don't think you can really do it that way because if you're gonna have the rule, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to like abide by it, and I, I, I it does suck sometimes. You lose goals, but would you rather that or ha have a team score a goal? Like you said, maybe in the Stanley Cup where it was blatantly off sides and they don't have the but rule. But the good, the good news is if that. you dismiss the rule is they would never go back and be like, oh, this play was offside. No, no, they would never they show would that, right? So a lot of fans wouldn't end up knowing because of how close it was. It was just deemed that it wasn't. Oh, no, they'd nah, go Twitter back. Would, dude. Nah, they'd be all over that. And, and, and I, also, think now, I think now if you ask. I'm saying, you're saying from like a regular season perspective of like it, they would have never showed it being off an inch from a, if, if it was drastic, maybe they would. I think we've probably spent a lot of time yeah. on this too.
Yeah, we'll prob- probably. I mean, we probably do it 17 times. Yeah, the, the thing I wrote down with is like you watch a tennis match and they know right away, right? If the ball is in or out yeah, instantaneously. And it's like, and I guess you'd say the same thing for the NFL with the like goal line. Like, how do they not like just get the technology, put it there, and so the shit. And you now, know? Are, and, and I'm not exactly sure, but is the league so in tune with this that they're they're checking every entry and they're blowing and they're they're videoing or whatever calling down and somehow the refs blowing the whistle while the play's still going on in the zone are they doing that i don't think so i think oh, no they're they doing do- that when the puck hits the net when, or they know it's a goal yeah but, when, when but they know do it's a it goal with the offsides though. Yeah. then they have 20 guys in now, that room now you, yeah. now you want them to re- to enforce it even harder you now have, the you no, have, no, no, them, the, you no, have asking them to take it out to enforcing it even harder every goal we want to review Every single fucking no, goal. No, I'm is. saying do it live, dude. Every game will be longer than a Chicklets episode. <laughs> yeah. Can <laughs> we do that? <laughs> All right. Either way, but Bedard getting that goal taken off on that offside, yes, it grinded my gears. Wow, nice. We'll get to that in a second. Now, uh, Biz, TNT Wednesday. You guys uh, got a great game. Uh, Washington come out of the gate struggling. Witt said they suck, and then they went on a little heat since then. Uh, <laughs> they didn't have a lead this season until they got that 3 nothing lead. Uh, with 27-year-old goalie. How about this story? Hunter Shepard making his NHL debut at 27. Great story. Ends up getting the, the W, but <laughs> they're up, what, 3 nothing. Devils come back, make it 4-3. Then the Caps get the next three. Uh, Ovi got the empty net to seal it. He's got gold, 824. He's got 55 empty netters, one behind Gretzky right now. He had 14 shots on goal the game before that. But I want to get to this one for you, Biz. The Caps are the first team in NHL history to shut out their opponent by three-plus goals in the first period, then get shut out by four-plus goals in the second period, then shut out their opponent by three-plus goals again in the third period. That's fucking bonkers stat, but... Yeah, it was a bizarre box score and, and a lot of swings of motion in that one, especially at the fact that you meant to, mentioned uh, um, Hunter Shepard's first game and they in- interviewed his parents who uh, apparently don't sit uh, with each other during the games. So the yeah. minute that the interview was over, he went his own way and she stayed in the seat. And I it was feel kind like of that's gu- very common. For the really goalies? Uh, for the for goalies parents, or just players? For parents, for parents, not to sit together during games. Okay, maybe it's a little too stressful. Not at the NHL together. level, but I feel like growing up, like when I was growing up, none of the dads were sitting with the moms. Yeah, but that's because well, it's just minor hockey. And you could just pick a seat, and you just like go up to one area of the uh, of the rink. But oh, sorry, agreed. Because my dad, the dads used to hang it together, and the moms would as well. Uh, but it was an emotional roller coaster for her, as you know, they let in four in that second period. But going back to Wash, um, not a great start, but. Dylan Strom gets gets inserted in that first line uh, center role, and he's been running with it. And I think the one, uh, probably the one thing that we said coming in was Washington's with how old they're getting is not known as a very speedy team. And I would say that Dylan Strom isn't also known for his speed either. But I tell you what, he's able to make some fucking plays, and he's also finding a way to get the puck to the to the back of the net right now as well. And a huge boost for this team who had a horrible start. Um, Aside from that, I mean, we, we mentioned with all the injuries they had last year and some of the guys that they've brought in, it takes a little time to get acclimated. Uh, Darcy Kemper, who started off the season where he just he just had a kid. So the other goal he had to go in, I forget the other guy's name as well, um, the actual backup, not Hunter Shepard. But uh, overall, they're playing a lot better hockey, and it was a great, great night. Uh, my, I actually am a little bit more nervous about the way that New Jersey's playing based on expectations. Because aside from 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 Brat to Foley and, and Jack Hughes, I mean, there's some fucking you know major letdowns out there, and they're letting a lot of goals in despite scoring a lot. I mean, how, how much now, have you watched? I mean, that Clifton got suspended two games for the hit on Heeshear. Heeshear's out. I don't know if he's playing the next game. If they've said, but he's already missed one. Um, yeah, it, 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 I guess all those warts are covered up by Jack Hughes being like the greatest hockey player of all time and making a complete mockery of the NHL. Uh, so I think the devils though, like I don't have, if, if I'm Pasha or devils fan, I don't really have much worry because you got to figure that, that Meyer gets going and he sure gets going offensively when he's back and that they figure things out because like when you have that much skill up front with the top guys in terms of Hughes and Brat, and you're still like, no, you're knowing that you're going to get more out of these guys who are somewhat struggling right now. I, I'm not worried, very worried if I'm a devils fan, they're that good. Yeah, just uh, maybe the goaltending a little bit, and and yeah. how many of these 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 brain farts are happening in, in the games? I mean, I I talked about the one, and I, what was it? I think it was, I think it was four four at the time, and then they give up that go ahead goal 
where Luke Hughes, he goes in for a rush. Luke Hughes, you got a, another guy. You take off the reins, let him go. Where he ends up getting hit in the offensive zone and ends up in the corner, and nobody decides to cover for him. So it ends up being a, what, two, three-on-one back the other way. We're talking about late in the game here, like situal awareness where that F3 guy who pulls up in the slot, make sure your defenseman who's going to be rushing the play gets back before you decide to dip in when the puck's coming back at you. So just there was a, there was a bunch of them. There was a, a bunch of bonehead, bonehead mistakes, and there, I'm seeing a lot of them early in the season. So I guess for a team where expectation is to compete for the top of the division, not exactly as as good as we saw last year. Pasha did mention the fact that he saw them regressing from an overall point standpoint in the standings. So he's been bang on with his assessments. All right. How about Jack Hughes? I know you just mentioned him. 17 points. It's uh, the most points through six games since Mario back in 95, 96. I was called a moron for saying 150 uh, points. I know. I know. I know. Believe me. I Not know. By, just by you, by the entire fucking internet. Now, well, I think what, the whole the whole thing was that 150 points hadn't happened, you know, obviously McDavid did it last year that I didn't even remember in so long that to just hop on and say it would happen again from somebody different, you you took some immediate backlash. Now it's looking like I guess it's a possibility. The thing is, can you stay this hot this long? Like I, It's going to be se- severely difficult, but your heat that you took was unfair. How Thank about you. that? Thank you. I got a great compliment from uh, Don Granato, too. He said there's an argument that he's the best player in the world right now. It's pretty high praise from an, an opposing coach. The way the season uh, started, he's number one right now. If, if I had to pick a heart winner, I would pick him. And I my my guy who I actually picked before the season started was Nate Dog, Because I feel like – cause because and the reason that all came up in my head is he won the Calder, Rookie of the Year. But I, I would say that there's – most people would say Nate is going to be a Hall of Famer. But in order to be a Hall of Famer, you have to add some league awards to your resume. And at this point, other than the Calder, he doesn't have anything. And I think he's just one of those guys that has that competitive mindset where he would probably tell you, I only care about cups, not personal awards and achievements. But he probably has to collect a heart or or some form of, of major substantial league award to to get in. No. Or, no? Because, because if you look at, say, the next seven years – he averages 90 points a season. They win another cup or two. He doesn't win the Rocket Richard. He doesn't win the Hart. And he doesn't win the uh, Conn Smythe. He's getting in the Hall of Fame. Okay. I, wow. I, I think just yeah. it's overall dominance. It's like the eye test when a guy retires. Like he was that much better than the entire league, basically, that he's a Hall of Famer. But I, I do know what you're saying. Like it would be weird to look back considering Makar got the Conn Smythe. If you ended up look back at the end of Nate Dogg's career, and even if he had three cups, like no Hart or no Rock or Richard or no Conn Smythe, it would be su- 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 surprising. I can't speak. So, no, you're good, buddy. You're good. You're, you're, I, I mean, it's um, my pirate. This hat arr. is just crushing my skin. Oh, you, you, could, you could decostume <laughs> if you want and come out of character. Um, okay, so let's say he doesn't get a league award. Do you at that point say with the sustainability of, of what you talked about? Let's say, let's say he wins one more cup but never gets that prime league award, would you still consider him a first ballot for the way that he dominates? If he's getting 90 to 100 points every year, yeah. First ballot. Okay, good yeah. to know. All right. Guys, I, I just want to go back to Jack Hughes real quick. Biz, on the TNT broadcast, I thought you made a really good point about the way he skates. I was yes. at the game last weekend and just watching him skate, he's kind of skates like Jack Eichel where he skates very upright and like how I was taught to skate is bend the knees, get down low. Can you kind of dive into that and like what you meant on the TNT broadcast about his skating? Well, the reason I, I said it was just because I think that the way that these guys are moving on the ice now, he might not, uh, I think Kobe Armstrong described Jack Eichel as like a pterodactyl type stride. I don't think that uh, I, um, Hughes's is maybe like looks exactly the same, but definitely a lot more stand upish when he does. I feel it just helps you. Well, one, I don't know how these guys get that fast standing that straight up where normally you feel like you generate your power from bending your knees and getting that full extension. But these guys, these video game players, are just finding a way to gain that top end speed by not doing it and making it look effortless. And another thing is, is when you're kind of standing up that tall, your your vision, whereas as opposed to your your whole body having to line where maybe your head's tilted down a little bit because of the bent knees and how your body has to to be as far as what do you what do you call that? People go to school for uh, is it kinesiology? 
Yes, yeah, can, that yeah, is can, correct, that's actually. A, that's, a big, that's a big word for me. So he's able to scan the ice. So when a guy's coming at him, even when he's putting themselves in these positions where he is cutting through the middle of the ice, he can see them and then dish the puck appropriately. And if the dish isn't there, he's able to just fire the pill at will. So I just think that's, that stand-up style provides a, a lot more benefit than guys who maybe tend to bend their knees a lot and the way that their bodies align from a vision perspective. I don't know. I think it's like... It's like a golf swing where there's just so many different ways to do it. We've seen so many amazing skaters over the years all have different styles. It just seems for him, he looks like taller on the ice too. Like I guess what you're saying makes sense. He's standing up taller, but he floats. There's just some guys that are floating around and he's got this beautiful long well, stride. I'm, yeah, I guess the point I was making is the guys who seem to do it effortlessly are the ones that are skating a little bit more like that. Like he's an example, Jack Eichel's an example. I don't know. I I mean, I feel like Austin Matthews tends to skate and and operate like that as well. Where I know you, you, Matthews doesn't though. When I watch Matthews, like I don't think beautiful skater. He's fast. He's powerful. But powerful when I see, and but when efficient. When I see Hughes, it's like it's just like prettier. If that makes any sense, hundred percent. It, it's more dove like. He's skating yeah, like a dove, dove out there. Like, it's beautiful. Kinesiology, yeah. like I still wasn't sure. What did what did kinesiology have to do with what you were saying? Just like the, the body. study of the body. So like if you're if you're bending your knees a little bit more in the way that your ass has to stick back, I tend to think that your your torso and your upper body has to lean a little bit more forward to match the angles of your, of your shins. Okay. So you want that to all be together. From, yep. from my understanding and where I skate, now, most people listening right now, uh, I don't know how much of uh, bending your knees you were doing there, Biz, in which I got hit with that <laughs> during the TNT broadcast to bring it full circle because I was chirping the, the, old, um, the old Washington team and on the power play, like all five guys refused to bend their knees. So I mentioned it and I got a text from Nick Dowd, who's a member of their team, saying pretty ironic that you're talking about guys bending their knees when you didn't fucking do so when I play with you. So fuck you, Nick Dowd. But, uh, yeah, I dropped a lot of big words there. Not sure I said a lot, but uh, we can probably move on from that segment. <laughs> what if you were born without an ass? Uh, oh, actually, <laughs> The gee, pizza box ass? No, well, some, some the secretary box? Ask wit. Yeah. Ask wit. <laughs> some of a lumber ass. Gee, did Mine you was there it? for like a minute. Now it's gone. <laughs> Mine yeah. fell off in the womb. Uh, gee, didn't you say the uh, devil's like, what, the Oilers of the East? Is that is that what you said? Yes, yes. In the pre-prod, pre-pod meeting, I, I did. I compared them to the Oilers. I said the devils are the Oilers of the, the East. Just because they are all offense, they are all talent, and they don't have any goaltending. They have such high skill, but they just can't put it together as a whole. They score a ton of goals, and they can't defend. I think it's a pretty good comparison. I I didn't mind it. I liked the, I liked how it rang off the tongue as little as maybe it makes sense for people listening. Oilers of the East. I think Let's Toronto Toronto's more like the Oilers of the East, but I do agree with you a little bit. Three, Thanks, two, guys. one. Uh, Biz, that goal you were thinking of, Charlie Lindgren, the other backup for Washington. Want to give okay, him his props. That's you. who you were looking for. And yeah, the Devils, man, they've been uh, struggling with their start. They've given up the first goal in seven out of eight games, but Tyler Toffoli's getting heating up a little bit, so we'll keep an eye on them. We'll have our correspondent, Pasha, back. But, uh, Wit, I want to ask you something. Would, would you say this grinds your gears when people wear a shitty mask for Halloween? It's a Halloween version of Grind Your Gears, Grind My Gears, brought to you by Big Deal Brewing slash Finder. Find out where the Big Deal Brew is near you. You've uh, gone no, all this year. Right? The only okay. time it really does is was actually the other night um, at uh, our uh, the golf course I belong to. They had a big kids Halloween party. The kids get dressed up and you know face paint, tattoos, candy giveaways. They do the whole shebang. They do a great job. There was some dude sitting around. He was sitting at a table and I don't know. It was a mask. I, I say it was Jason mask. I don't remember what the mask was. He just sat there. The whole time. I'm like, this is a kid's show, bud. He, he just sat there. It was so bizarre. He didn't take it off to eat. He didn't take it off to drink. It's like, buddy, if this is an adult costume party, you could sit there in the corner with your mask on the entire time. You got kids running around here, and you're scaring me, let alone my five-year-old son. <laughs> so take the goddamn mask off after 20 minutes and grab a freaking grilled cheese and some tomato soup and enjoy yourself. But in terms of like being out at a bar with people with a mask on, 
That's up to them to want to do it. I would never do it because of how hot you get. And then you're smelling your own breath, which is usually oh. disgusting. So I, I would I would say, all right, I would I would not be how, a mask guy on Halloween. How worked up did you get yourself over this whole thing? Like how nothing. Long I you... just kept looking over. I'm like, what is this guy doing, buddy? Like, <laughs> take a lap, take your mask right, off. Well, I apologize. I should have introduced myself. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare the kids. That. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. No, do it. But when someone does have that Michael Myers mask on and you don't know who it is and they just kind of lurk and that's don't some like fucking it. scary shit. Don't don't yeah, like it. Definitely. One bit. No, it's funny. I, I Unless actually, we're seeing the ski slope tits from the yeah, Halloween movies. Oh, the little fucking you know, little Suzanne Hanrahan specials. Ooh. No, it was funny. When I sent the, the uh, old blog to the group from three years ago, it was you know, all the COVID bullshit going on, and I wrote a wicked uh, clickbaity headline. I am anti-mask, and here are the reasons why, and everyone's like, rah, rah, rah. They think it was COVID. It was just it was a Halloween thing. I was like, oh, I don't like to wear Halloween masks, because I think they're like the lazy way out, because, you, you know, I mean, if you're in a pinch, you got to do it, but... It's lazy. It's not always funny. And dude, like you just said, you got a mask on. How are you going to like mack on chicks if you fucking got a wolfman mask on breathing? I think this is an undercover way of shitting on G's costume is what I think. That's not a mask. That's not uh, a yeah. mask. It's, oh, no is mask that, it's not considered a, a mask? No mask. No mask. mask is face. face covered and you have to move something to get a drink into your mouth. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you're going to like put your fucking pull it up to the top of your head and try to mug up with some chick at the, at the end of the night or something. So, yeah, I know it's a goofy <laughs> Halloween version to grind my gears, but I always Brought to you by BigDealBrewing.com slash Finder. And uh, hopefully we'll right, you know what sucks for yeah. Halloween if we're doing Shoot. Grind My Gears? I've said this before, but I hate when people buy too much into the costume where they're like, so I had a buddy a few years ago who was Peaky Blinders. And all night from the second he put his costume on till the end of the night, he tried to talk in an Irish accent. No. It, it gets to the point where you're like, dude. We're just like, we're drinking, we're having fun, we're at yeah. a bar. You're not, you're not the Peaky Blinders. Like, let it go. No, yeah, you could just like bottle that. them and be like, hey, I thought we were in Dublin. Like, you, you wouldn't shut up with your fake Irish accent. And it drove me nuts because that would, I I would lose my mind, G. Like, that's when why Pasha I didn't do does helicopter. French guy, that's I why say, I didn't Pasha, do helicopter. Don't do the French cop. guy to me, dude. I'm not dealing with the French guy. Oh, oh yeah. P Pasha does uh, his charcuterie board making uh, Jean, Jean George. George. Jean yeah. George. He tried he that with that me once. I said, no, 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 Pasha. You yeah, give he's me the done real. That Full night trying to wheel girls and and convincing them that he's actually a, a French exchange, exchange student. Now that's why I don't like to go too much into character, and that's why I didn't do the helicopter cock as Joe Thornton. So I kind of tend to okay. just trend that line. So I just want to say that I'm I'm also anti going too much into character. Wait, I you mentioned you mentioned bottling someone. I I don't know if I've ever told you guys this story, but I actually let a kid bottle me in college, and it was the dumbest decision why would you I let a kid do that Jay? so i am as you guys know i'm very easily convinced to do things i can i'm very gullible in a sense and my buddy said that if you take like a coors light bottle you drop a nickel in it and you spin it around a bunch of times and then you smack someone in the head with it it's a pain-free bottling so i'm like I, I mean, it all I'm has like, to do with, it all has to do with the flick of the wrist and how you make contact on the head i had a buddy who used to do it and and Believe it or not, I tried it as well, and it didn't work out. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't work Wait, at all. You guys realize? End. I think Wait. you both like Biz. You still believe that? You no, still believe not that if you hit someone a certain way, it's not going to hurt with a bottle on the dome? No, I've I've seen I've seen my buddy do it. I think uh, it was he's done it to himself or other people. The guy's names it was either Devin or Mike Skinner. They, I hung out with them when I was growing up, and they would do it as like a, a trick prop where they would take a glass bottle and they would do it and they would hit it not. Like so, if you take the the thickest part of the beer bottle, right in the middle, right there at a certain part in their head, and boom, it breaks. And like nothing, clean clean exit, oh, no cut. You're no saying nothing. it breaks. I think Grinelli's saying it just wouldn't hurt. And no, 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 it it shatters. It's supposed to shatter over yeah. your head, and it and it and it's not supposed to hurt. It's supposed it's a party to party trick. It's I a mean, party this trick. is like this is like when TikTokers were putting like uh, the the Seriously. dishwashing Yeah, but I did it for the love food. of the game. I was you guys too. are idiots. Stop. I did it for the love of the game. There was not even camera phones back then. I was just fucking trying to execute a party trick. So one of the issues was I ran in the bathroom. I'm gushing blood everywhere. It's coming all down my face, and the guy's like, "Oh fuck, dude." I was supposed to tell you to put a hat on during this. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to. No, nah, you don't need a hat. That wasn't the problem. You just did it like a bitch. It was just bad um, wrists. Uh, what else? What, are, what, 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 what? What's next? We got to move on from this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How, how many stitches, G? Real quick. None, none. I actually just uh, I glued just it. Let it go. He glued yeah. it. A couple he, butterflies. There you go. 
All right, moving right along here. Uh, Talks Canucks, but uh, Biz, points in four straight after three wins and an OT loss. They're jumping to second place in the Pacific, 11 points, uh, six points behind Vegas. Uh, their best start since 05 06. And a guy we mentioned uh, doing our previews, Thatcher Demko, looks like his old self out there. Uh, 3 3 2 and 0, a 9 3 6 save percentage, 1 9 1 goals against with a shutout. And uh, DeSmith, he's been unreal in the backup role, 2 0 and 1, 9 4, 9, 1, 4 save percentage. And uh, what's it? Only three players right now, what you were talking about, Elias Pettersson is a possible MVP. Only three guys in the league right now have more points than him. Uh, Brad Larkin and Jack Hughes. JT Miller lighting up two biz. Your boys talk. Let's uh, go to you on this one first. They are bought in. And it was actually Wit when we were figuring out the outline. He's like, we have to talk about the Canucks. And, and, and I'll hand it over to him in a second. But just from watching them, and I've probably watched about three games, last one being against the Rangers. Uh, which I thought that they got hosed on that call in overtime. I thought Pedersen got tripped. But just even after a loss, to hear Talkett talk about the way that, about the team the way that he did, where he was like, I was proud of the guys. They competed like bastards. And when I say everybody's bought in, like I look at their top guys first. And like let's start with Pedersen. Like, it's not just the goals and the playmaking. I would say every time I've watched them each – at least once a period, he'll take a run and separate a guy from the puck. He is playing as physical as I've ever seen him play. Uh, people were a little bit uh, poopy pants that I mentioned that he still needed to approve maybe in the compete level slash defensive side of the puck. They reminded me that he had, call, uh, not Calder, but Selkie votes last year. But overall, I'm rescinding my, con cat, uh, uh, my comments. Excuse me. This guy looks like the total package. Uh, then you go over to JT Miller. Uh, just an absolute piece of shit to play against. He's playing with that edge. And I think that since Talkett's came in, came in, he's instilled the confidence in those top end guys saying, if you want to, you know, if you want to be these top dogs and you guys want to be a playoff team, you can't take nights off. And so far they haven't. And Quinn Hughes is, is playing on a different planet. I don't know what the stat is, RA, what best plus minus after a certain amount of games in, in Canucks history. He is an analytic darling. The way that his motor runs and the way that he's able to be a one-man breakout and make the fucking right play every goddamn time. Uh, it's It's been exceptional to watch. I don't think that anybody had any question marks about what Quinn Hughes can bring to the lineup and the way that his season was going to go after giving the captaincy. You've already touched on the goaltending, but from top to bottom, uh, just everybody playing the way that they should be. And if they keep going this way, there's not a chance that they're missing playoffs. They are they are a well-oiled machine with excellent goaltending, and that being the, the, the key factor. So he uh, talk it also had a great segment on after hours afterward with Scott Oak and, and the gang, and and just really did a good job of summarizing what this team has provided uh, so far in the early season. I love watching them play. I watched the second and third of the St. Louis game, and then the second and third and overtime of the Rangers game. They look great. Very happy for a guy Tyler Myers. Um, he scored a, a beauty shorthanded goal in one of those games and he take, he's taken a lot of heat there, right, Biz? I mean, he's kind of been the whipping boy at times and, you know, as, as a huge guy and you remember how amazingly dominant he was when he came into the league. Yeah, rookie, rookie year, year in and, Buffalo. And, but he's not, he's not overly physical and whenever you see those bigger guys not be, be laying those bone crushing hits and, you know, it, it'd been a little bit of a struggle for the entire team and maybe for him personally, he looks awesome. This Phil DiGiuseppe Papa Giorgio is a stud <laughs> on the wing. Him and JT Miller, like he, I love his game. He scored a beauty. And then Pedersen, oh, he gave the nicest dish to JT Miller for a little, little sauce pass. He went in and burnt, burnt the goalie of St. Louis. I think it made it three or four nothing. They were just all over the place. But the biggest thing about Vancouver, and we talked about goal songs, they have the best goal song in the league. They have the number one, the, I don't know what it is, the section of the song. It's Don't You Forget About Me by, I think, is it Simple Minds, R.A.? The yeah, song from yeah, Breakfast, Breakfast Club. Club. Yeah. Oh, yep. dude, when they, that building's rocking and they get a goal and then the section of the song they play. Now, it's an 80s song. It, it, it's top in the league for me, no doubt. Go check it out. Go check out a YouTube highlight of a big Canucks goal this season. And once you hear this jam, you'll know what I'm saying. But Quinn Hughes, like, Biz, did a good job just... Can play. He could play the whole. He could play the whole game. I feel like. Yeah. He's, it's. I, it's similar to his brother. He's just floating around out there. He's always got the head up. Great stick for a, you know an undersized defenseman. But 
JT Miller is the one guy I look at, and you see him go in for faceoffs. We've talked about him a lot already this season. He's just pissed off. He's just angry when he's out there. Yeah. He's got 12 points in eight games. I mean, he's played 200 and I think 95 games as a Canuck. He's got to have at least 330 points. Like he, he's just been dominant ever since he got there. And I think with talk getting in there from the beginning of the year and giving them a chance to really figure out his system. Now, granted, he was there last year, but to start a season with training camp and to buy in and have a lot of people saying that they weren't going to make playoffs to give you that little extra motivation, I love that team. I really do. I think they're a lot of fun to watch, especially at home. And I, I actually think, I think I did, did I pick them to get in? I think I did. You might have flip flop, but um, oh, shock! I mean, you, we mentioned Hughes, we mentioned uh, Myers on the back end, and I've I've been critical of sometimes the way that they move assets and maybe have rushed the rebuild. Uh, they gave up a first rounder, and I don't know what else they gave up for that Ronick uh, over from Detroit, and I think that. He has really panned out. He's played well with Hughes. He's a great compliment to him. So from the goaltending perspective, from the way their back end's playing, and and a lot of these other no-namers, even in the bottom six, like who, who's the other kid that had a great start? Was it uh, Lafferty who came over? He was in Toronto last year, was in Chicago before that. He seemed to have fit in. I text to talk about him. He goes, I love him as a player. So they've had a lot of bright spots early in this season where they can build off and hopefully c continue this uh, positive moment momentum so overall and Bavillier if hasn't even scored yet so if they yeah. can get him going all of a sudden that you know right now he's on the third line but with, with with Garland but get him going and then that's another guy who's proven he can score so yeah they're, they're firing on all cylinders and main thing being Demp going how good he's looked Wait, you did not have him in the playoffs, just a heads up. Fuck, suck on that. Wah, 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 wah. Also, a lot more uh, defensive dedication from Miller, too. I mean, you know, that was always a knock on his game. But, you know, talk had gotten his air. He's obviously uh, committed much more to that. And also, 55% uh, of shot attempts during Miller's 5-on-5 five -five play have outscored opponents 7-2. So, uh, again, beating the same drum defensively and obviously getting it done on both ends of the ice. Also, if you haven't heard it yet, episode 304 back uh, three years ago, we did have Elijah Pettison on way back in the day. If you hadn't heard, listened to it, go give it a whirl from a few years back. Uh, another Canadian team, man, the Montreal Canadiens, huh? How about those boys? 5-2-1, 11 points. They're tied with Toronto for second in the Atlantic. Jake Allen, man, this guy, 33 years old. He's been huge for them. 3-0-1 and in four starts. A 9-3-0 save percentage, 2 6 three goals against. Cole Caulfield, he's got four goals, two of them overtime game winners. Another team with great, a lot of fun to watch. I know I'm a Bruins guy, but the Canadians are a fucking fun team to watch. Yeah, they are. Um, and I think Martin St. Louis, just the career he had and the ability to kind of get through to guys. And you, you, we've talked a lot about Caulfield when he came over and the jump in his game. But I think he has this team playing hard. I I, I don't expect this to last very long, um, personally. Um now, Nick Suzuki's actually struggled a little bit, too. So, like, to see him, you know, them doing this well with, without him playing his best, I think St. Louis even called him out uh, in the media, said he had to be better. And I don't know, what has Anderson done? If you can look up his numbers, G, I don't think he's done that much. Um, but they, they, they have, like, this Justin Barron kid, He's scoring. He looks great. That's kind of a surprise right there. I've already said how, how much I love Arbor Jack guy's game. I mean, forget the toughness. He can move. He can pass it. He can shoot it. It's a That's a great player right there. So I think that just the vibe in Montreal is special. The one worry as a Canadians fan I'd have is, and he's young, and I don't want to be unfair, but I don't know about this Slavkovsky, and I don't think he should have been in the NHL last year. And so far this year, I think he's got one assist in eight games, and I just worry about the hockey IQ biz. I, 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 I think he was drafted as a full-grown man. I think he was probably the same size and weight that he is now when he was picked. Um, now, obviously, we interviewed Logan Cooley. He went third in that draft, but it's... I. I I just worry, like if you don't see if you don't see some improvement this year, then you're like, oh, we rushed him. What do we do now? It's just it's one of those situations where you feel bad for the kid. He probably shouldn't have been playing in the NHL last season, and he's the first overall pick. So the pressure and the scrutiny in that city is going to oh. get worse and worse and worse. Well, at and least he they, doesn't speak French. And if they did, if they did strike out on that pick, we've talked about the setbacks of missing on first overall. It's just. It's kind of tough to see how he's playing right now. Now, at the same time, he's 19 years old, I think, or maybe 20, but I don't know. That, that, that's a, a big-time question mark for me talking about the Habs' future. Um, Wait, Josh Anderson has one point in eight games. So yeah. they're doing this without guys that they expected yeah. to produce producing. 
and 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 especially with Anderson, like having like he's the power forward there. And I mean, they had him and Doc, where he you know he's kind of getting those reps now. He's got to be that physical presence, the guy that we saw in Columbus before he came over. Um, going back to that Slavkovsky pick, um, was I forget who I was talking to, but the the scout that they have. Was he was he not a scout that was where was he before? Was he with the Rangers and he also had a few off the board picks from overseas that never panned yeah, out? He picked Kravsov, who's out of the league. He picked Leas Anderson, top ten, I think. I, I, he picked in the same Slavkovsky draft. They picked another Slovakian kid who's still in junior. It's like you got to be hitting home runs on these first round picks, man. And when you're not, you're setting the team back. So it's it's a tough go. It's a tough goal right now. And I'm rooting for Slavkovsky, of course, right? Yeah, this doesn't Seriously, mean we're shitting like, I'm on, not guys. We're just talking like, shop I, here, baby. Yeah, it's like, it, you know, I don't mean to be personal at all. It's just you watch this kid play. It's like, ah, I, it's it's the hockey IQ part. It's seeing the ice. It's making plays. Obviously, he's a big kid. He can get to the net. He could probably score some goals. But how much are you creating? And you look at first overall picks, you, you need that home run. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. I haven't watched a lot of Canadians hockey. I think the only periods I've watched was that opener they had against the Leafs. So for me to comment on the play of the team, I mean, aside from them winning and uh, and getting some good productions from some of the young guys, I mean, hey, probably a way better start than they expected. Well, yeah, your no Leafs, doubt. Biz, your Leafs went into Dallas, a Stanley Cup legitimate contender, and just dusted up on them. The Leafs are looking nice. Are you buying into Wall being the starter of game one of the playoffs as we're still in October I am so fucking happy you asked me that so you know I I don't want to put the I don't want to put the blinders on right I don't want to be the the, the Leafs jock sniffer every time I talk you've about never the done Leafs. that I appreciate so, that shut the shut up so I reached out to Carlo Koliakovo I said hey listen I said and, and I got a little bit of a breakdown more than just on this Joseph Wall situation I said is it okay to believe the hype? Because every time I see this guy in the net, he performs well. And But yet here we're talking about a guy who's got less than 20 NHL starts, so our sample size is so small. And he goes, Biz, but if you actually look at the sample size and take the NHL out of it, like he's done this over the course of three years. So when he has got his opportunities to come up over the course of the last three years, every time he's brought his game up to this level, he's looked progressively better. Now, if you watch him play, he's a bigger guy who handles himself well as far as keeping in control, yet has that athleticism and the technique that is made for success. To the point where even that Joe Bowen, where I was talking with Carlo, he said the, the Leafs radio announcer said that he has enough pedigree in him with his mechanics where if he played a full season for the Toronto Maple Leafs, him being in the Vesna rent running wouldn't be out of the question. That's how high they are on this kid. Now, I'm going to go back to the 2021-22 uh, season. He played four games. He had a 2.76 goals against average with a 9.11 save percentage. Then the next year after that in 22-23, he got seven games played. He had a 2.16 goals against average. Now, keep in mind, we're talking seven games here. That's a decent stretch of games with a, a 9.32 save percentage. And then now this year so far in 23-24, he's played four games thus far, a one, a staggering 1.33 goals against average with a 961 save percentage. So then he going back to the, the, the Marley situation where he has had sustainable success with the Marlies, where he has been the guy. And if you talk to any of his teammates, they would say that this guy ha has the poise and the, the the pedigree in order to go have sex, success at the NHL level with the way yeah, sorry, I'm sure a lot of that too. Uh, you the Leafs, of sex. Play if you're the uh, Leafs starter, sex, you can get your wiener sucked it. off right before puck drop in one of those back alley rooms where they sniff the counters. But so to hear that from Koliakovo and, and and Bowen, and you're probably thinking, oh, these guys are on the payroll. Of course, they're going to talk positive. They're not Leafs jock sniffers. They're just trying to give it to you straight. That's that's my opinion anyway. Uh, so I am very confident in what this kid can bring. The only thing that was holding him back from probably being called up before this was the fact that he also, and ironically, a Leafs goaltender, has dealt with injuries down at the AHL level as well. So that's just something that the Leafs goaltenders can't seem to get away from. I don't know if there's some fucking voodoo doll out there, but between Samsonov, Murray, and 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 him, they've dealt with their fair share of, of injuries. Moving on to more Leafs chatter, aside from the obvious, uh, the Marner and Matthew stuff, 
William Nylander can't be talked about enough right now. Got to sign him up ASAP. He is just like the Pedersen situation. He's probably looking in that ten between ten and eleven million dollar range. Where Pedersen should get more than Nylander. Do you agree? Uh, Who would you rather have? Oh God, that is. Uh, I would Ooh. say you were, I'd you were rather talking have about. I'd I, it, yeah. I I I think that they. I think with what I'm seeing this year from Nylander, that the 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 limit is just as high as what we've seen from Pedersen. If you go back to last year, yeah. But what Pedersen provided is probably more so than what we've seen high-end Nylander. But right now, the confidence and the skill set is matching the compete level with Nylander. And that's the most that's the most exciting part you're seeing, especially if you're a Leafs fan, where I would say that there was maybe an unfair criticism from the Nylander side of things based on how Leafs fans want the Leafs to play hockey. The last most recent success that the Leafs fans have seen from Toronto were the days of Gilmore and Clark. So they want that like that rough and tough type hockey mixed in with the success, but that's really not what those guys provide. They provide the skill set and right now the competitive side of it where Tree Living has done an excellent job of going to address all that other stuff. And you're going to get Leafs fans who say bringing in Revo based on what you've seen from an on-ice play perspective was a waste of time. I can't believe how many Leafs fans don't like him. They're fucking morons. They hate him. And guess what? And they're winning. So it's like... And games that you're playing teams like... Let's say you're playing Philadelphia. You can insert... Revo. If you're playing a team like uh, a Boston and Lucic is across the ice, you can insert Revo. You're playing Montreal. You need Revo. If he plays 60% of the games and provides what he's been providing, I'm taking it all day long with the intimidation factor. They're going to say, well, every time they're out there, you know, they're, they're, they're creating a few more scoring chances. Who gives a fuck? They have the offensive guys who can provide that where you're simply looking for a different element to distract the other teams from that side of play. That's it. And if you get the playoffs, if you need them, great. You got Domi, you got Bertuzzi, you got McCabe, you got Giordano. There's enough of that to be snapped around if the team you're playing against isn't trying to lead with the ace of spades toughness style. And and if I got they some don't, messages of people, you're just friends with Revo. I said, well, I mean, obviously I'm friends with him, but I'm also looking at the game is sort of making another direction back to like having a little toughness is a good thing. And if he's given up a couple scoring chances, but creating maybe some room and some respect for guys when he's not even on the ice, I'm willing to kind of exchange those two. And and I think that you see what he can bring. And obviously, like, yeah, you're not you're not looking at him to be great in his D's or great offensively, but what he can just kind of change people's minds wise. That's what I look at. Like, are you going to take a run at someone if he's in the lineup? I don't know. Like, think, And I think people who maybe never played, and I don't want to be the guy that say, you never played, you don't know what you're talking about, because that's not the case. But but you, you have in the back of your mind, what will happen to me if I do this? And when he's in the lineup, that is more existent than not. So... I, I, I want to see how the season plays out. On a, te- on a team that's had a history, and the reason I, I talked about that was I felt like Dubas took a lot of brunt for not bringing back that toughness. Eventually, last year before playoffs, he did. But that element is something that you need in order to also calm down the stars where if people want to tr- start taking liberties, there's an a- there, at least there's a possibility for an answer for it. It's there. And then it's not just there with him. It's with there with other guys as well. So it's being snapped around. Um, the other thing, uh, uh, the other thing I want to go back to wall quick is one thing that Bowen was was adamant about is the way that he's able to track the puck. You know, sometimes you get the goalies where, hey, if you're being screened and they, you know, they just really don't track it well and it goes in, they kind of give the hands in the air. He is one of those guys that's able to, wherever the puck is and without whatever action's going in front of him, he does the best he can, and he's excellent at it, at finding it, tracking it, and not allowing that net front screen to be an excuse. So a lot of times he's, we talk about these goalies going down with that, that VH and just kind of shipping it in and just being, well, I had my angles covered, and if it doesn't hit me here, then too bad, so sad. Nah, this guy's finding a way to battle and, and, and get eyes on the puck so he can make those unlikely saves when they're coming from different areas with, with non-predictable screens. Um, and then Holmberg. Okay, my guy's back. The guy I said in preseason. I mean, yes. 
Why are you the, saying biz? I'm fucking. It was just I, funny that it, it was part of the preseason <laughs> preview. Of that. I said this to Carlo Koliakovo on the phone. I go, fuck. I go, I really like what he brought last year. I thought he was like a, a perfect third line center guy. And he goes, I think that they, with F- Frazier, and I'm drawing a lot blank on his last name, the kid who got sent back to junior. Mitten. They wrote the. Mitten. Mitten. They wrote. They wrote the excellent article on it, in which I want you to break down after this. But I think they had to send him down in order to get him his reps. Well, now that he's been sent back to junior, Holmberg was one of the guys called back up, and he goes, "Biz, I'm with you." And and he goes, "You could watch a whole game and be like, well, did Holmberg even play?" But he makes the right play every time. And if you're watching the video as a coach, you're saying, God damn it, man, this fucking guy doesn't make many mistakes. And that's exactly what you need in a third line position. He's played four games right now. He has no goals, no assists. I don't I, I think he might be on the plus side of things, but he's neutralizing the other team's team's guys. That's his job. Don't get scored on. You got enough team with that provides enough offense, and his offense will come. But to hear him reiterate what I thought coming into the season where he was excellent last year and the, he's a coach's dream where he's not making these mistakes, but he's the guy when you're on the bench with and you're seeing him play, you're saying, God damn, that's a nice little subtle play that you might not notice. Game in, game out, shift in, shift out. My guy's back, and he he's the guy that I'm going to be looking at all season for the Leafs to take that next step. He'd be such a valuable piece as a third-line center there. Those guys are around. like the um, the defenseman's dream in a sense. Like I'll oh, almost say... Uh, low and slow, uh, uh, always an It's just like option. you know when they get on the ice and you're on the ice, you're like, yes. He's so I got, responsible. I got some backup. Kind of like um, I would say, uh, not that they play similar, but O'Connor in Colorado. Right, that oh. guy gets on the ice. Makar says, "Perfect, we're yeah. covered defensively." So I know what you're saying. I mean, a lot of pub for a guy with zero, zero, zero across the board. But those guys <laughs> take they, they matter, Biz. You oh, know, I was going to break down the entire Marley's roster here after this too, <laughs> if that's okay. But hey, uh, going back to Fraser Mitten, that that was it was a really cool article you sent to the group chat. Um, it was written in the Athletic, correct? Yes. Yeah, and 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 it just talked about his upbringing and um. You know, a late bloomer, a big time late bloomer. He's from Vancouver and like wasn't a name that everyone was talking about at 14, 15. And, you know, the saying is like a star at nine or 10 is you're, he's nowhere to be found at 14, 15. It's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And so many parents are obsessed with the fact that their kids got to be great when they're eight years old. It's like, dude, you don't have any clue about how many. Look at Patrice Bergeron. He told the rink shrinks. He's like, I was never any good. I just kept getting better. I kept getting better. And this kid, um, Mitten, he's just, he's very, very um, willing to be a, not just a good hockey player, but like a good human being. And the other, uh, you have to read the article. I, you know, it was close to a month ago. I read it. So obviously I'm not remembering everything, but always into kind of um, learning about other things in life. He didn't just pigeonhole himself as a hockey player. I remember growing up, all I thought about, all I did, all I dreamt about was hockey. And I, I remember conversations with my mom when she said, you got to be a well-rounded person, Ryan. You need to do more. And I was never great at that. And like, so seeing a young kid who, who had a chance in the NHL and will play in the NHL, like be that open and honest about um, hockey not being everything. And like, it's just like, that's not who I'm, that is my profession and that's what I love. And he's super focused and driven in hockey, but he's more about being a well-rounded person. So I think just if you read the article, it goes into his parents did a hell of a job. It sounds like, and, and he was, he was very um, adamant about just like adding different things to his life and learning about different subjects and not being the type of kid like I was, where it was hockey all day and all night. And if I'd broken my leg when I was 15 years old, I'd probably be, I don't know, pumping gas right now. No offense to gas pumpers out there, but I didn't have a backup plan. I didn't have other interests. So young guys out there, Look to make yourself a better, more well, more well-rounded person while also keeping that passion for hockey. But hockey ain't everything in life. Yeah, no. and With- he was a big surprise in, in Leafs training camp, RA, and and that was why it was written. And like you said, when he kind of came out of nowhere and has excelled his game, especially in the last couple of years. One other thing I pulled from it, RA, was uh, just his. his uh, like is you talked about his willingness to learn how he would he would be the guy to reach out to new teammates on the team even when he was in junior so he, he was he's beyond his years where it really took the coaches off guard with how he he developed that leadership and how he was just a good person to to his teammates and the way that he handled himself 
<clears throat> Biz, the pot I like. Oh, by the way, Biz, you, you, I'm sorry. Wait, you would never pump gas. Let's not let's not play, pretend you would have a pump gas for a little. If bit. I needed money, all right. You don't know what I'd do. I could be like Leo in Basketball Diaries in a fucking. <laughs> hey now, who knows? <laughs> no, uh, Biz. What I liked about the article was uh, how how they talked about him spending lots of time with his grandparents, like going away with them every summer, and they just like you know passed on a sense of curiosity to him. So he wasn't just all yeah. about hockey. And you know, yeah. I live you know I live below my grandparents for you know a good chunk of my life. They were up on the third floor, classic. Boston triple decker and, and my other grandfather like you know you get to a, a point where you both you know you're both guys I, you're 18 you're, you're adults he, he didn't drink anymore but we go on his boat and just you know talk like a couple of sailors and shoot the shit so read some playboys really, really, and really say hey that. gramps you want a <laughs> oh, shot yeah. right. what do you think gramps 36d or what I'll, I'll, <laughs> there was the oh natural era of playboy too so yeah why it, it really currently good whenever he sees my wife's mom just says Oh shit! Or oh lordy! Like apparently she said oh lordy or oh shit, and now if he sees her face, oh shit! So yeah, stay hard. Uh, believe that so was just to put a bow on so the Leafs chatter, I think Wall's gonna win uh, Vesna. Uh, Leafs yep. are gonna win the Cup. He's gonna win the Con yep. Smythe. Yep. And there's no hyper bowl here. Uh, Nylander is gonna make twelve million a year, and they're gonna somehow find a way to make that work okay. with the cap. Uh, and that's to put a beautiful bow on it. Beautiful uh. blue bow. All right. Uh, I'm a big fan of the. What did you say? Hyperbole? Is that? Hi, isn't it hype, hi, hyperbolic? Hyperbole? Is hi, that what they call yeah, it? That's a chamber. Hyperbole. Hyperbole. Oh. Hyper, oh, no, hyperbole? I, I love it. Oh. I, 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 this, oh, you know, we have, our, we have our fun with language. All. Anyways, Cap circumcision. <laughs> well, be on time for our next guest, Kevin Dahlman. Uh, like I said earlier, the. Uh, with most points ever in the KHL, most I, goals, I believe, as well. Uh, by a by D man. By a demon, yeah. I, I, thanks for the clarification there. Just uh, good stuff, uh, a lot of KHL stuff, a, a little bit of Bruins gossip in there too uh, for the folks who might share for the B. So uh, let's send it over to Kevin Dahlman for our second interview. That interview was brought to you by Chevy. Chevy is working to make charging very simple. With over 110,000 charging stations across the U.S. and Canada and growing, your smartphone becomes your co-pilot when using the My Chevrolet mobile app with Energy Assist. The app allows you to access vehicle information like battery status and charging settings from anywhere. The Energy Assist feature intelligently plans your routes, tells you where and how long to charge up, and gives you real-time data about charging station availability. There are three different home charging levels available. Chevy Electric vehicles offer great options for charging, all of them as simple as plugging in your smartphone. 110,000 stations across the U.S. and Canada and still growing is an amazing number. And I think when you're looking at these EVs, it's about making charging simple, and that's all Chevy's doing now. Learn more at chevy.com slash electric. That's chevy.com slash electric. And remember, when I'm on the car hunt. I am on the car hunt right now. And I need I got to my see eyes. you as a truck guy, an EV truck guy. I, I just, especially after I talked about it at the beginning of the podcast, so I can't even drill into my wall. I feel like trucks are not up my alley. Yeah, but, but we'll you see. could maybe change your whole vibe as a person. All of a sudden, you're charging electronically on the road trips with Alana. You, you know, you're driving around the thing. You maybe throw a cowboy hat on. If anyone can make me more of a man, it's a Chevy EV. So head on over to Chevy.com slash electric. All right, it's time to bring on our next guest. An undrafted defenseman, he signed with the Boston Bruins organization to kick off his pro career. After stops in St. Louis and L.A., he headed to the KHL, where he left his mark on the league. A seven-time KHL All-Star, league MVP, member of the 15th anniversary symbolic team, record for most points by a defenseman in a season, a gentleman on the ice award, and he retired as the KHL's all-time leader in points by a defenseman and goals by a defenseman. Thanks so much for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Kevin Dahlman. How's it going, brother? Good, boys. Good to be here. It's been a while. I didn't think I was going to get the invite because um, <laughs> Biz, Biz reached out to me in Astana a couple of years back to get him a job there, and I kind of ignored him. But I can... Wait, what? Biz was whoa, trying to go to the whoa, KHL? Whoa, whoa. Do you, they, you have to stick handle the place. <laughs> shut the, first of all, shut the fuck up when I've been hearing from you enough with the ball hockey going on. I actually reached out to you for a job in the KHL. You don't remember that? No, yeah, fuck called. no. I I don't know if you were, maybe you were half serious. Maybe you weren't. Maybe you're fucking. Oh, around oh I was dead serious because I, I, I know what it, they pay over there. They pay yeah, on the table. Yeah. You rich you, you fuck. You were like, hey, dolls, what are the chances you can get me a job there? Because I think uh, Marassi had just left. Um, and I, I did. I reached out to the GM, but they wanted to uh, bring in that uh, the general's son, that guy who uh, did that rampage against Coonlan. 
the China team there when he like beat up everybody and jumped in the bench, got suspended. No, I don't even remember yeah. that. Oh, you don't remember that either. H- have you guys I, heard I, of this that, one? That like rings a bell. Like he went haywire, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right off the draw. He like suckered a guy off the draw. <laughs> and then he went after another guy. That guy turtled and he went after another guy. And then he jumped in the bench, pulled the guy out of the bench. And then Kulin, like uh, it was one of our preseason tournaments. And then they uh, forfeited the rest of the tournament. They took off. <laughs> this guy just beat the shit out of the they whole didn't, team. They didn't think I was crazy enough to step in and play with you guys. <laughs> I could have done some crazy shit. Yeah, I would have baseball swung was- a guy in the face to play in the K just to see all those hook daddies in Moscow. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> they they, uh, they wanted to stick with this general, the general's grandson that was uh, that was coming in, and he was quite the meathead, but. I'm surprised yeah. you don't have a Russian accent for how much fucking time you spent. Well, I was, gonna, I was gonna, well, I was going to tell you guys if I start to speak in like broken English because I'm just so used to doing uh, interview, interviews with uh, the Kazakhs or the Russians. So I'm like slowing it down. And my kids are like, Dad, why are you talking like that? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so Demir Raspiev it was the name of the guy you're referring yeah. to. Raspiev. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big meat, yeah. I, I just, I, I just, I, I respect that you, you called around for biz. I could just picture be like, yeah, yeah, biz. I'll, 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 go, I'll, I'll call some people. Just uh, don't wait by the yeah. phone, bud. Yeah, yeah so. no. <laughs> don't I didn't want me, to I'll call you. my spotlight over there either. So I was like, I don't know. We'll, well it is crazy, uh, <laughs> dolls. We were catching up at the Chicklets Cup, um, yeah. and it, 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 it is nuts. So obviously, we'll get into like everything, but. It's a lot harder to get over there than people thought. I remember thinking like, oh, I played in the NHL for seven, eight years. Like, this will be no problem. And with, with the lack of imports, it's actually pretty tough. I mean, like, obviously, like, really high-end guys could go over there whenever they want, whenever they're done playing in North America. But a lot of guys who think it may be easy to get a job in Europe, it doesn't work that way. And the agents matter so much. Like, I don't know if you grabbed a guy that was a, a Russian agent right when you first went over, but they, they seem to be able to really pull strings and get things done in terms of, like, getting people contracts in different cities. Yeah, we were talking about it too. And, and like, you have to, like, especially those top teams, like Ska, um, Seska, even um, Ufa and stuff, you have to have, like, a couple years in the KHL to, to, to get a contract there. They want to see how good you are uh, to see if you're worthy enough to play. But, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of lucked out because I, I got in right at the start of the KHL. So, um, it was, it was a little bit easier. They were just looking for guys coming over from North America. So I think that was a kind of like a easy way in, but you're right. Yeah, it was tough. I, I mean, they would ask us, uh, if we could bring some guys in, if we knew some guys to come over and it was, yeah, we throw a bunch of names out there like, no, I don't know. I don't know. And you were, you're right. You needed like a a Russian agent, like a little contact over there, maybe a scout that was that played in North America and, and then was over there just to kind of put in the, a good word and stuff. And I, I, like, I don't know how you got y- your contract and everything over there, but yeah, like I said, mine was mine was we were at the start and I, I saw guys were going over there and uh, my agent was like, let's let's jump on it. It's good money. I was like, yeah, absolutely. So. Oh, I had the sleaziest agent in the game. I don't even remember his name. He was probably selling used Lottas in like <laughs> yeah, Toy- Toyglioto, whatever that city no, it was is. That too. dude you were in the hot tub with, you just never found out. It was no, that kidding. was Vadim. That was my driver. We were boys. We just like tugged each yeah, other. Yeah, he was your agent you too. Right. You just never figured it out because you never saw the guy. <laughs> Isn't that the funniest yeah. thing too, though? Like the drivers and stuff, they just like weasel their way into everything, like team yep. parts parties everything they're like getting on the plane they're down by the dressing room like oh man we had some good drivers too that were just hanging out with us all the time so you just mentioned it so at the time that you went over there was it expansion and the fact that it went from the super league to the khl or maybe that happened like a few years prior i think they they did have an expansion draft kind of but yeah it was the, the super leagues ended and then they just yeah the khl started right at that time and i just I was finishing my contract with LA and uh, it was that summer. And uh, I think Yager went over, Chris, Chris Simon went over, Joseph Stumpel, a couple of those guys signed, older guys. Yeah. And then, and then that's when but was, they, they yeah. went over to the K, but as far as Kazakhstan was the year that you were there, how long did the team existed in Kazakhstan? Well, the, the year, the, the, that was their first year in the KHL, but I think they prior to that they were ten years, but they were in like the Kazakh league, and they still have that Kazakh league present day. But yeah, it, they were they were down like it would be equivalent to maybe oh geez I don't even know junior B over here how bad they were oh yeah 
So yeah. to, to tell us, like you, yeah. you had an amazing OHL career, like lit it up. And then, you know, you were in the AHL for three years, but doing well. And then you get your chance in the NHL, St. Louis, LA, you got a deal. Like that couldn't have been that easy, especially at that time when obviously there was money there, but there's like the dream of being, you know, a 10 year NHL guy as opposed to the three years you'd played. It must have been tough to be like, oh, I, I still want to I want to accomplish my dream of playing in the NHL longer, but I got to take care of my family, too. Like it must have been a pretty hard decision for you, considering you were one of the first guys. I mean, I know Ray Giroux, who was a hell of a goal scorer in the AHL. I think he had 60 one year with Hershey. He was over when it was the Super League. He was like an OG. But for the KHL, you were one of the original guys to go over. Like how tough was it to make that make that decision? Yeah, it was, it was tough. Um, obviously, like you said, like I had some success in junior, pretty decent success in the American league. Um, and then jumping up to, to the show was, uh, I mean, I was in Boston and I had like, I was playing a ton with, uh, with the Bruins, like first 20 games, I think I was averaging 22 minutes. I only had an assist. So Sully, Mike Sullivan brought me in was like, do you think, uh, can you get points in this league? I said, I don't know. I said, I'm trying, I'm getting everything on the net and we weren't doing so good. And that, that was right around the, the, the time when Thornton got traded. Uh, so then they were like, okay, we're going to send you down. And, uh, and then it went from there and I, then I got called on waivers to, uh, with St. Louis, but yeah, I, it was just, I had some spurts of success there and confidence high and low, kind of that kind of thing. And then, uh, the decision came that summer. Yeah. My agent was like, Hey, you want to go? I said, yeah, well, I had an end of the year meeting with Dean Lombardi. And, uh, and at that time when the, the defensemen for small defensemen, there were very rare. There was a, like Rafalski was a little bit before me, but then I was like a little small. So he was like, have you ever thought about going and playing on a big ice surface over in Europe? I said, no, I hadn't. And he said, well, do you know where false? I said, yeah. He said, well, he had success and then came up back here. And I said, okay, well, I, I'll look into it. You know what I mean? I mean, I, he's like, do you think you can put up 30, 40 points in the NHL? I said, yeah, I do. I think I could. Um, and uh, he said, well, well we're not going to sign you, but uh, good luck. And I said, okay. So that summer I was like, I got a couple offers, but only two ways. And then my agent was like, yeah, we got this offer. We had two offers, one from Tesca. And one from Beris. And I was like, what? Beris in Kazakhstan. And that summer, uh, Borat, the movie came out. I, think it was <laughs> I was going to ask you about yeah, Borat. Nice. <laughs> so we're, we're sitting there and I'm just like, I, I just finished watching the movie maybe a couple weeks ago. Um, he's like, I'm like, Kazakhstan? I said, does it really look like this? Um, and we, I, I talked with my wife and, uh, and then I, they reached out like a couple of guys like Stumple was there and he reached out to me because training camp had started. This was like in August. Um, and I talked to him, they said, it's nice. Everything like pretty like embassies were there. They had a lot of embassies. It was English speaking, um, up and coming. And then, uh, I said, they offered good money. And my wife was like, well, why not? Let's just go experience it. And then I was like, yeah, okay, well, I'm going to fucking go. I'm going to have play one year over there. If I could prove myself, come back and show them I can fucking put up 30, 40 points in the NHL. And, uh, yeah. So my brother fucking, orders this Borat cake, fucking him in that green speedo <laughs> bikini thing. We have a little party. Oh, man, Keeney. Yeah, and I get sent off to fucking Kazakhstan. Yeah. Well, d hey, d did it look like the movie? Like, what's it like there? It's not, man. It's uh, like, I don't, wait, were you, did you ever get, get I played. There? I played you there. Um, yeah. And I actually remember being like, this city's way better than I thought. Yeah, so it's, it's very up and coming like they're they're trying to make it like a like a little dubai kind of but when i first got there obviously it wasn't uh definitely wasn't like the movie but it definitely wasn't like it is now it's it vastly improved and va like a lot of money is there they got a lot of money there um but uh yeah i was nervous yeah we were definitely nervous going there it, it, it took a lot of time like the first couple of years especially we had a few we could always have unlimited imports there so we had to like go over meal plans because they had like ketchup and mayonnaise as pasta sauce and <laughs> cow, cow tongue, like any salads that look like just jello. It was just, did yeah, you, was, did you try the cow tongue? Yeah, we tried it. It's just like rubbery and you know, oh. the texture wasn't very good. And, um, but they do have like their, their traditional meal is like horse. It's like besh barmak. That's, that's good. It tastes like, <laughs> 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 but yeah. 
Um, <laughs> but, it, but it vastly changed uh, throughout the 12, 13 years that I was there. It's nice now. Oh, man. And that new rink. That's uh that's an NHL rank right there. So. Yeah. So at the at the time you moved there with your wife, you didn't have any kids? I had two kids, yeah. Two wow. they were they were I had my boy in LA and then my daughter was in Providence. So my daughter would have been yeah, three four and he would have been two. Yeah. And uh yeah, so they weren't in school. The so that was good. Um but then when they started to school and stuff, they 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 t- learned Russian, they turned looked learned Kazakh. Um they adjusted well. And then, then they adjusted well throughout the 13 years there, 12 years that we were over there, obviously with the travel and stuff, they're well-traveled, but uh, they were, they were all nervous with the food. It, 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 the v- biggest thing was the food. Like you couldn't get normal meals there. They had one TJ Fridays that was there uh, at the time when we first got there and we frequented that place quite often. But other than that, it was tough to have some Couldn't good get meat. a good steak. Besides Moscow, yeah. Moscow is a, an unreal city. Um, but other yeah. than that, you couldn't. There was no good steak. I was like, I just what about I chicken? coming home. What? Yeah. What about chicken? chicken? Yeah, they had chicken. They have chicken. They have beef. But you, yeah, like with with saying it's like they don't have like a good steakhouse or a good like uh, I don't know what do you consider a good steakhouse? Like nothing compared to Morton's or nothing compared to any of those. Obviously, the, the keg. <laughs> Dude, I was <laughs> late for a Don't let Yans hear that. Yans yeah, will lose it. <laughs> that was a good steak. Uh, but recently, my buddy, I have a buddy there who's from uh, Dubai now, and he's been he was there pretty much the whole time, and he opened a bunch of restaurants. So now he's got a couple steakhouses. He actually he's actually opening one in in Dallas here. Um, but he he's got some good steakhouses there now. I mean, obviously, you wouldn't go back there just for a steak, but <laughs> if you're ever there, <laughs> I got a spot for you. <laughs> what what do the locals think about the bull rat stuff? Do they not take kindly to that? Do they not th- find that funny at all? Like- in the dressing room, uh, the the boys when we get like little bus rides or whatever, when we, we had to do uh, I don't know to like the bazaar or stuff like that, they would have Borat the DVD and they'd throw it in and they'd be <laughs> fucking howling. They loved it. They loved it. But I don't know the locals so much. I think they they didn't like it. Um, they kind of thought that they were being made fun of, which I mean. They were, but they were. Yeah, <laughs> I think he was pounding his sister in that movie, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, a little incest for the boys in Kazakhstan. Those Mongols, huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. Sometimes a lot of the negative aspects are brought up, but like there must have been a lot of things you liked there if you were there for that long. Like, what, what were the, the, yeah, the, the positive money. points of being there? Yeah, the yeah, fucking well, Louis, <laughs> Louis Vuitton <laughs> duffel bags full of cash. The, big, the biggest factor. Yeah. Um, there, there was a lot. No, like, like I said, the first it was the, the t- first two years were tough, but the imports we all we had a lot of imports, which made it uh, that much more fun. They had their wives and everything were there. Uh, inter- like we had the embassies, the international schools, um, and then, uh, like I said, it eventually started to to, to roll into this like city where um, it, it is like considered like a small Dubai. They had all these big buildings. They, they just put a ton of money into great malls, great restaurants. Like that's a, that's a thing that we didn't have, like you, you wouldn't maybe cause you were only there for a little bit, but they, they flew in on my last couple of years to all these restaurants. They flew in all these chefs from like Italy, Spain, um, just Michelin star chefs were there and all these restaurants, but, but nobody goes to them because of the, the, you know, the money difference, like it's, it's rich or shit poor. And, yeah. uh, but they were never busy, but yeah, they always had, uh, some good restaurants, but yeah. Um, and that's, that's, that's why we stayed like, like the, the fans were great. The organization was great to us. Like, like they always, they paid for everything, cars, apartments, um, and then salary. And, and then I had success and that was, yeah. And that was, uh, I guess, the biggest factor. Really. As as far as your adjustment to, to the hockey side of it, how would you describe it differently than North American? Obviously, the big ice, but like, how, how did you transition into it right away? You said you were snapping around, getting points. Like, how did you find it compared to North America? I think it was, yeah, obviously the, the bigger ice surface, but I mean, th- there's a lot of skill. And then there wasn't as much hitting, obviously, because of the big ice surface, but yeah. Uh, for a guy like me, I mean, a guy like you, Wit, too, would be like jumping into those open areas. And they just, yeah. they, they got so much skill that they could find you, you know, anywhere, like a Radulov or like Dazi, just anywhere. And you're right there. You got so much space. You can just snap it in. Um, and as, I mean, that's it. It wasn't so physical, but I liked playing physical. I mean, you may not think that biz, but I, I kind of did. I was, a, I had a couple uh, drop the cold shoulders, but 
Um, yeah, that was the biggest thing. And then I don't have to fight and I never really wanted to fight, but, but then, uh, some teams had some, some tough, tough players on them. Um, but other than that, I think that was the biggest thing. It was just the, the ice, the ice surface, uh, and, and, and having more space out there to, to, to think and to, to make plays. I remember we played you guys, uh, my year over there and it was, it was you, Bochensky, Nigel Dawes, Dustin Boyd, and it didn't even matter who the fifth guy was. And you guys were on the ice together the whole time. And and the, the game we played, you had four assists. I'll never forget. I'm like, this guy must be having so much fun playing hockey. Because those three forwards were unreal. I think they were aligned. They were unstoppable yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And then you're out there with them all the time, getting all these points. I'm like, this guy's probably having a blast right now. But I didn't know that they, they came over, maybe all three of them together, or Bochensky was maybe one year before them. But yeah. it, it seemed like there was serious connection. And I guess just being together and playing every shift together made that much of a difference. Yeah, there was uh, there was me and you remember Mike, Mike Lundin, defenseman. Mike yes, Lundin. that's yeah. what it was. It was he me, played Mike, in Maine too, I think. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Me, Mike Lundin. Yeah. Boyder, uh, Dazi and Bochensky. It was I was there two years uh, to start the KHL and then Bochensky came in and then the following year. Uh, Boyd and Dazi came in and then after that Lundin came in but yeah we would practice together the five of us like they would do like lines you know what I mean like it'd be yeah. five guys and then five guys five guys so we were power play and we were playing but they would play them for as forwards 23 minutes a game 24 minutes and I'm me and Lundin are playing 25 26 minutes a game and it was just at my first year honestly uh, when I ha- broke the records and had 28 goals, this, I was just like, everything I touched went in the net. I would like be around in front of the net and it would just come to my stick, empty net. And I just like put it in. I was like, how did you, that just happen? Come off the back of the glass right to me in front of the net and empty net. And I touched it. I was like, these are just going in. And at the end of it, because when I broke Fatisov's Fatis record, the, these Kazakhs, they're like, they want to do these photo shoots. And they brought all these pucks on the ice and they were getting me to lay down like with the 28 uh, pucks on the ice and I'm doing these poses and this they're like are you going to come in? off yeah, yeah. off with Sorry. the nipple claps they get the little silly over there yeah, with the tiger did they get the tiger oh, in there they didn't but uh, one team did that a more team they always brought that little tiger on the ice um, but it, what we did was they they said uh, they would sacrifice like the the lamb before every season or and when we had the new rink too um they brought us all down to the Zamboni area and uh, we're like, what's going on? What's going on? They're like, we're going to christen the new rink. I thought we were just going to like have a party and drink and uh, we got us all lined up. And uh, this priest comes in and he's throwing the water and they're saying <laughs> the stuff. And uh, we hear, Aah! and it's screaming <laughs> and like blood starts pouring into the Zamboni. Oh. Like, you know, the thing guys are cringing. Like oh. me, Matt Fratton was like, he went white and it was just like, oh my God, what is going on? And then yeah, they served that, a lamb to you. Did you guys, yeah, did you guys they, eat it yeah, after? And they cooked it and we had that, uh, yeah, lamb and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, awesome. lamb's pretty, lamb's pretty it good. good. It's a little, oh, yeah. little yeah. gamey, but it's good for you, isn't it? Really good for you. Really lean. Yeah. But so those are the silly types of traditions that they were doing over there. Yeah, um, <laughs> obviously, playing in the K, we always ask guy about the the Russian gas or any other crazy shit you guys were doing. Did you yeah. get introduced to it your first year, year there, where you had twenty eight tucks? No, that, that that I didn't get. You know, I got introduced to it when I went to St. Petersburg. So my first four years, they had, I didn't ever even heard of it. Never, they never talked about it. Um, we just, yeah, we just got drunk and, and whatever. But when I went to St. Petersburg. Um, it was like a whole new level of, I don't even know, like Russian, they would give us like, Doc would be like with these uh, scientific, scientist stuff on. He's like looking at these pills. He's making these pills. He wraps them in saran wrap, puts them in, in this, everyone's stalls, take these before practice, take these before games, take these after games. And then, uh, so when I first got to St. Petersburg, um, Patrick Thorson and Tony Mortensen, do you know them? Norwegian and a Swede. Yep. Yeah, so they were there, and uh, they're like, the gas guy's here. This is like a, a couple weeks into the start of the season. I was like, what What do you mean the gas guy's here? He's like, oh, you you, you got to test out this gas. And I'm like, okay, well, what is it? And so like, I don't know, it's like mind-altering. So, okay, I'm in. I, I love that. Stuff. So, uh, <laughs> so I was like, yeah, after practice, I'm first guy. You got to like, you got to sign up. I rush off the ice, sign in. I'm, <laughs> they, they, they're sitting to me. They're trying to explain what's going on. Then Tony Martinson comes over. He's, he's next, so he's like... So we had a Swede last year who who did it 
and he, he panicked and he freaked out. You're not supposed to like get up because you, your body's just, so anyways, he gets up and he's, he goes, he pulled like the wires out of the thing. He was like the guy in uh, old school when he gets the dart in the neck he's just like, <laughs> and he like fell and knocked the whole thing down. So they bring in doctors. They were bringing the, the on the road, like they have their own room. These doctors come and they, they do this whole gassing. It's like a huge setup. So you lay down on the table. So I lay down on the table um, that's hooked up to this machine. You have this big black balloon and you put it like it's on a, like a mouthpiece and you put it on your mouth and then you suck it in and your, your fingers on the monitor and you just go and then you just go like, you don't feel your body. You hear everything. It, it's just like you're in I, like I was floating in like the galaxy and uh, and, I'm, and I can hear them and I'm starting to sweat and you just like do it. It's just like, what is going on? So they stop. Um, they're, well, first they're like thumbs up if you're okay, thumbs down, whatever. And I'm just like, if you're I'm dead. Good. Yeah, I'm, just, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. So it, it ends and it, you like calm down. They make you sit outside the room for like 15 minutes to calm down. And I'm caught like it's coming down. And I'm starting to feel normal, but I'm just like so light. And I'm like floating. I'm just like, ah, and they're like, you're gonna feel like this for the rest of the day. And then next, like tomorrow, you're gonna be like chomping at the bit to get on the ice. On the ice. So I'm getting dressed. I'm getting the shower. Go go for lunch. And then the doc comes over with these blue uh, package of pills called Fuji Bow. It's like equivalent to uh, Viagra over here. Not oh, yeah. as potent, not as potent, <laughs> but he's like, take this too. And with the gas, this, you will be the best player on the ice tomorrow. So I'm like, all right, do it. <laughs> take it, drink it. And all day, I'm <laughs> all raw night. Car, raw Tough hard. Skate. Yeah. <laughs> Pre-game. Is, is that how your third kid was born? <laughs> no, I know. Right? Just, <laughs> um, Just thumping away. Your wife's like, what's wrong with you? I, mean, I know. Yeah. She's like, gained a half an inch. All that? Yeah, right. She didn't gain anything. But um, <laughs> so, so it gets to the rink. The same thing. He has this cup of pills and everything in there. Just, I guess, I mean, guys got tested. So, I mean, they, it must not have been illegal, but on another level, these guys ska, like the money they have and the stuff that the resources that they, they have. And we were just flying. I don't know how we did. We got beat any games that year because we had Kovalchuk, we had all these guys and they were all doing this stuff. Everyone's doing it. And it was just like, we, we were just felt unbeatable. But, uh, so from, a, yeah. from a performance level, would you say twice as twice as good and twice as lengthy shifts as, as you normally could take? Yeah. Just like the endurance, you're clear minded. It was like, not getting tired. It was so weird, but I, so I, I, the gas, I never got experience until, the, until Scott. So then we, the next summer, so wait, yeah, we do it all. Like I, I didn't do it a ton. Guys were doing it every game. I wasn't doing it every game. Cause it's gotta be some, it's gotta be bad a little bit. You know what I'm saying? So, um, the summer I, I go early next camp next year to camp for the summer and uh, we signed this other guy, uh, re, re, I forget his name, how to say his name, but it's Rizansky or Rizansky or something like this. Um, and uh, the guys are like, this guy's like, he's a big, he's problem. He's a problem. He would, he would get all those whip it cans, like the gas, and he would have them in his car and he would just <laughs> before practice or whatever. And he would like miss practice. Guys would go open, like Riz is in the car again they'd open the door and all these cans would fall out of the thing and Riz would be like drooling out of the thing and they, they ended up having to fire him because it happened like three or four times but the gas then at the clubs they started to sell it at the clubs you know like the shooter girls who walk around with shots and they do all the shots yeah they walk around with like 20 black balloons and you pay i think it was it was like five thousand tange so it was like four bucks or something like this, 450 for a balloon. And it was the Xenon gas, the actual Russian gas. So got, people are drink, drinking, drunk and hookah, everything. And then sucking these black gas balloons. And they're just like zombies out there on, and like on the dance floor and stuff. Um, and then I got, to, went back to Kazakhstan and I was like, we got to get this gas. Like the Russians, they're all doing it. Um, so I talked to the doc and I talked to like the finance guy and I said, there's, there's gotta be a way we can get this. It's expensive. So I was like, there's gotta be a way I'll pay for it. It's just whatever. We got to get it here. The guys will love it. I mean, we have, we had great imports. They all wanted to try it. And uh, a few weeks went by and then doc was like, Kevo, Kevo, come, come, come into my room. He opens the door and he's got this big metal cylinder 
I'm probably like four feet tall. He's like, I got the gas. I said, <laughs> beautiful. He's like, filled me up with, like one of those, uh, you know, like uh, hikers or whatever. And they have like the pack that fills up with water, but it's like, you can squeeze it and whatever. And has the, you suck on it. Anyways, he filled this up. He's like, here, take it home. I was like, you're not going to like monitor or anything. He's like, no, it's okay. You take it home. You take it home. So I thought you take it home. Barker, Cam Barker was like, I got to try this. So we, I drove him home. We lived in the same building. We get in the car and he's like, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. So I, I was like, he's like, what do I do? I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. But I've never done it by myself, but I'll do it. So I sucked it in, squeezed it, did it a couple of breeze. And I went into the boom, boom, boom. He's like, I'm ready. He grabs it. Boom, boom, boom. He does it. I see him like go into like this. You can tell when someone's doing it because their body just like freezes and he's like, his head starts bobbing like this, bobbing like this. He wakes up, he goes, that's a 10 out of 10 buzz right there. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, no, I don't know what it is. Like, it's like the laughing gas. It's like a like, Zin 7000. Yeah. It's like a, <laughs> told with the friggin' dead or something. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Zin 7000. Yeah, oh, jeez. So then, yeah, then it got to Kazakhstan, the same thing. It started getting the clubs in Kazakhstan. They were doing the same thing. And all our guys were out. You got the you got the gas before a fucking steakhouse in that city. Oh, right? yeah. it, it was unbelievable. They're just hammered, and guys got hurt too because they would and be falling. And so you mentioned you played four years in Kazakhstan, and then you ended up going over to where St. Petersburg. Yeah, St. Petersburg, Scott. Yeah, two years there, and then I came back and played four more. Was it just the production that led you to getting a a, a promotion essentially? Because I'd imagine St. Petersburg's paying way more money. You're living in an unbelievable city in Russia, which I would imagine is pretty similar to Moscow. It's yeah, nicer. yeah. It's nicer. Yeah, yeah. It's well, nicer. Dolls, before you before you answer, Biz, I just do want to let everyone know that. That's like the ultimate goal of anyone in the KHL is to play for Scott. Like the, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. the the organization, the arena, the city, it is unreal. Like even watching the games on TV, it was like, oh, I'd love to play there. So yeah. the fact that you were able to go over, I mean, you had you had some monster seasons at Barry's, but they must have been pretty disappointed when you chose to leave or did they almost understand because it, it's Ska? So this is a good story because um, it was it – was, not like we had to leave, but they were obviously interested. But my wife at the time, the year before started a, I don't know, call it a blog, but she started kind of blogging about like her everyday life in Kazakhstan. And she got started to ruffle some feathers over there. So she was like blogging about some of the, the, the corruption and some of the police. Like if your car was dirty, they'd pull you over and they ask for money. Um, uh, the, the, the water coming out of the bathtub, brown, the, like how they abused animals. There's just stuff that she saw during those, those, those times. And, and some of the higher ups, the government, that kind of stuff kind of didn't like that, but she was also getting praise from other people for speaking out. Cause it's like, you know, like that, that guy who was president there, Nezerbayev was like 20 years there. And, um, so the, it got to the team. The GM was like, oh, man, should we, what should we do? Should we get gas cap? I don't know if we can gas cap. Can we kick his wife out of the, out of the country? And I was like, yeah, go ahead. Like, but, they, <laughs> <laughs> but then I, uh, Scott had an offer, and I, just, I, I, sit, I sat down with my agent and, I, and with the GM in Barry's, and I was like, right, let's cool off. I, I got an offer with St. Petersburg. Um, I'll go there, let everything you know, mull over, and and then we'll see what what happens after that. And they, they were it was no hard feelings. They, they agreed. But everyone, the rumor was that we just got kicked out of Kazakhstan. My wife was talking smack about the government and everything. But uh, yeah, it was it was harmless. But you know, it, it it kind of did ruffle some feathers. And that's how. And then obviously the money in St. Petersburg was barn. You couldn't get it anywhere else. Yeah. Because they put out the statement basically saying yeah, your play slipped and then we didn't make the final, so we didn't want to extend them. Did, was that just kind of spin on their behalf or like just like uh, bullshit to put out there? Well, you, we could, it, you know what I mean? I, we didn't do well in the playoffs. We got beat out first. We made the playoffs every year, but we got beat out first round. And I didn't produce at all really in the playoffs either. But then, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, they could they could throw that in there for sure. Is that standard over there for them to just like sue a guy's in a statement? Yeah, I mean, we don't see it too much over here, but oh, they yeah. we, the bus like that. The imports, especially if we would go on losing skids, there was a time. This is a, there was a time when uh, Lyndon Vay came over, um, Matt Fratton, um, I think Dazi was Dazi was still here, yeah, in Barry's before he went to uh, Automobilist. But we went, uh, we had a break, and the whole team went to Dubai. They didn't want us to go to Dubai because it was a short break, 
and we had a big tough schedule after um, after the break, but we were in first place. So we all go to Dubai. We have fun. We asked to stay an extra day. We didn't have to play. So we asked to stay another day. We come back, we go on a 16 game losing streak after that fall out of playoffs. So the GM was just ripping all of us, the imports. He's like, they stayed in Dubai. They just partied in Dubai. They didn't train. Uh, that's why we're losing this, this, that. So we go on, uh, a another road trip uh we're 16 losses in a row are unbeaten in, or haven't won in 16 um we lose another one and i think it might have been in sochi um and then after the game the gm was like i want you kevo kevin Lyndon, matthew in my office in the morning we're gonna i don't know have a meeting so we're drinking on the, the plane um we get in at six in the morning he wants us there at 10 i'm like i'm not fucking going the fuck this. I, we were just on a road trip. I got my family. Like, I'm going to, I'm not going to go. Lyndon and Fratton went, I didn't go. Um, we had the day off. So they were like, yeah, he just kind of ripped us, showed us our stats. And then we just left. I was like, fuck, why did he want us to go? So we have Thanksgiving the next day, Sunday at Dozzy's house. So I get into one Saturday night. We have Thanksgiving, um, the Sunday, um, we, we get into it again. I'm crushing wine. And then we leave Monday for a road trip. We're supposed to leave. And I'm like, I'm not fucking going. I don't want to play for this GM. I'm, I, I skip it. So I skip the road trip. I get hammered Monday, Tuesday. They lose Tuesday. Come back Wednesday. We play Thursday. I didn't practice nothing. I just drank all the way till Thursday. And then uh, we play Coonlin. I play 32 minutes. And we, we end up winning. And then I go into the office to the president. I'm like, I can't, we can't play. Nobody wants to play for this GM. He gets fired. And then, uh, but yeah, they just, they would just, they would just blame us for any little thing. I mean, we did lose, like we <laughs> didn't win in 16, but it's not just our fault. Like we didn't, we, you know what I'm saying? It's just bad luck and teams were winning. We just couldn't, you know, you go on those skids, I guess. But yeah. Well, so you we, guys were also kind of all, in, like the Kazak and Kazakhstan players, they weren't, you know that they they were kind of weak, so it was like you can't just blame the imports because they really have no backup. So if like at one night you guys are shut out, like you guys had no chance. It's hard to be basically the entire team. You know what I mean? Yeah, we didn't have. I mean, they they had some good players. I mean, Antropov came back. They had a Starchenko forty eight. They had some some There's good no players. Depth. Yes, that's it. Yeah. Um. And yeah, if we didn't if we didn't yeah if we didn't score, then it was tough to get a goal. Yeah. Um. But yeah, they they could easily every time we did lose, they just they would throw us under the bus. The imports, it was the imports. The imports couldn't score. The, and it's still that way. But I mean, it's more that way with um, just the teams that have a lot of imports. I don't think they throw imports. Do they throw imports when you were in Sochi under the bus like that? No, they actually were way harder on the Russians. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, I, and they I would almost like, kind of like they would almost kind of like baby us a little, and and yeah. just they would give it to the Russian guys hard. Yeah, I now felt maybe that. it's because we had Russian coaches, and maybe it's just different with Kazakhstan and Russia. But it was it was noticeably like we kind of had the easy end of the stick. Yeah, well, they paid us a lot, so and I think that's was that was the big thing too. So they were like the Kazakhs weren't getting paid, like they were getting paid peanuts. So yeah, um, that they, they just yeah they they had, they had every good reason I guess to to throw us out of the bus. Uh, aside from uh, St. Petersburg being the top dog in the KHL with like the hockey side of things, what was the experience like living there? Like what, 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 like for somebody who's never been there, what was, what was the city like? So the city's very, very English speaking because Finland's pretty close, but yeah. And, it, and that, that whole atmosphere too, of like the, uh, during the winters, it's only a couple of hours of sunlight. And then in the summertime, oh, you get sun light until like midnight one o'clock it's it's fantastic but yeah every, everyone spoke english the history there like the, the the museums and all the uh the buildings were architecturally just amazing to look at and and obviously the clubs and the restaurants um and uh, yeah it, it was it was a lot of fun and and definitely a place if you were to visit you would fall in love with it 100 percent. beautiful women um just, uh, just a great place to play, and then tons of money. Like you know, those that Moscow, St. Petersburg, even Kazakhstan, like the money that they throw around. Whew. What was Kovalchuk like over there? Just a rock star. He was. Oh yeah, he, everywhere he went, that guy. Oh my god. Well, we during the lockout, we had. Uh, I was telling you. I think I was telling you it that we yeah. had. 
Bobrovsky, we had Tarasenko, we had Panarin, um, Kovalchuk, Kalinin, and Chris Letang ended up signing there. Uh, we were stacked. And uh, they just, yeah, they were kings. They were just kings. They were, but beauties that out every night, they didn't give a shit. Like it was fantastic, but they would, we'd score. Uh, I think we only lost, I don't know how many games. I think we only lost like 12 games that year. Uh, but it was, uh, yeah, those guys were kings. God, Kovalchuk's, he's still a man, that guy over there. Is, is Fedorov involved with the organization now? So Fedorov's involved with Seska, the Red Army team. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's, uh, they won it the last two years. He was, and he played over there for a while, like uh, maybe mid through my career over there. He was playing for Metalurg. Um, and he still, he was still playing good too. Like he was a stud when he played in the NHL. What flash, the Nikes, the, um, but he, uh, yeah, so he, he was over there and he's still there with Seska right now. Yeah. Who are some of these guys in Russia that you would say are the best hockey players you've ever seen play who probably people who are listening to this podcast have never heard of? Was there anybody in a couple of names that you like stand out where you're like the skill level just obscene? Well, right now or when I was there, but right when now, you were there. yeah, when I was there, well, yeah, I mean, I think Morasti talked about this too with, with Panarin. So he was young when, when I was there. So he was 18 and then uh, he was playing for VTs, but then he came to St. Petersburg when I was there and he just out played everybody the skill he had like the c cuts the the shot that he had the hog that he has uh, he just, <laughs> he was just, just, let, like, he, just a weapon on him too some weapon. guys get it all eh? Fuck me. Longer. yeah he was just uh um but yeah he he'd be one of those guys that like you, you wouldn't never he- heard of him until he went over there you and uh, until he came to north america but over there he was so good as a young guy and not big he was like scrawny then too. And now he's like bigger and, and Jack, but the, a lot of guys like that, uh, Kirill Col- Coltsoff, do you know him? Remember him with his defenseman, left-handed shot. Yeah. Uh, kind of sort of. He was a real high pick, I think. Yeah, I think he was. Yeah. And he was one of those guys that if he, he, he w- might've had success over in North America. He did so much offensively. I've never seen a guy who could float and like jump in the play as, as good and as easy as he could. And his sauce pass, he would sauce pass over guys' heads and on the tape. And in like, there was a lot of guys that uh, definitely could have played that never came over that. Sergei Moziakin, I don't think he ever came over, right? He came he was, over um, to Columbus for like a minute. And I think oh, if, he? if he didn't make the team, he left right then or he made the team. And then still, I think I, I got to look him up, but he playing against him this guy played for um what was that team was it where malkin played where he played yeah. magnetogorst magnetogorst yeah. biz yeah. this guy was so sick like I, 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 I couldn't believe he wasn't a star in the nhl when we played him i was blown away and then the other guy zarapov that oh, sniper man. oh man yeah he was a sniper too jeez Zarypov. but yeah they they always had a good line too it was him moziakin and uh that uh Ko- kovash or whatever the czech guy yep um yeah, it's so biz. Yeah, there's tons of guys. Like you just, uh, like, I, I'm I'm surprised that none of them come over. We had a guy in Kazakhstan, uh, Starchenko, Roman Starchenko. He's still playing there. He's the captain this year. Um, and, he, and and me and Antropov would talk all the time and try and get him to come over. Like, why wouldn't you go over? He's like the fastest skater, hardest shot, good hands. He, like his legs were just like tree trunks, and he just didn't want to go over. He said, I, I, "I'm comfortable in Kazakhstan. He made pretty good money because he he was pretty good. He always had thirty points, so they, they loved him here. And uh, just that that was their mentality. I think that same with Moziak, and was like, why would I go there? What I can make? He was making seven million, eight million, or whatever. What in in Magnitogorsk? So uh, yeah, like back to your point or back to your question, because yeah, there's tons of guys, but I just. Got to get they got to get them over here. I don't know. I don't think think people don't know. And I think I've mentioned it on the show is um, points are given out different. So like that's why Dolls' numbers are out of control because over there, say I go D to D, right? No, say over here, I'm in Edmonton. I go D to D. Defenseman shoots it on net. Guy buries the rebound. I'm getting the second assist. Yeah, yeah. Well, it doesn't work like that over there. Like you, you. you have to pass it directly to a guy who then passes it directly to a guy. There aren't like those cheap kind of second, second assists where we're actually in actuality, it is kind of weird. Like if you pass to a guy who shoots it, then the rebound goes in. Like it's not really an assist. It's just how it works in the NHL and the AHL in North America. Yeah. So that's why a lot of times people see numbers 
over there and they're like, oh, 30 points. 30 points in the KHL is a lot. So I think it, it just you, you look at guys' stats and you're like, oh, I don't see the, I don't see what's so special. Well, they're not giving out nearly as many points as, as they would here. And they, and then, yeah, and if you try and go get your assist or whatever that you think you should have got, they, there's no chance in getting. Yeah, they'll it. sacrifice you <laughs> instead of the lamb. Yeah. How, yeah. Early, how early did you try that, dolls? <laughs> right. Like, hey, throw right, throw right, me on the second assist. assist. Uh, I had eight <laughs> assists instead of four that game. Fuck. Oh no. But no, you because you, you don't speak English either. So and then they don't or they don't speak English, and I can't. I could later on speak a little bit of Russian, but. Yeah, so it was tough to tough to get those apples. Um, and, and I hear you. Rick. How how hard would th- would these Russian guys go off the ice as far as the booze compared to North American guys? Was it was did they drink to hurt themselves? Yeah, there was. Oh yeah, there was one guy I played with. Um, they had to give him like shots to stop him, like before he went out. Like so, they'd give him like an inject. The team would give him a shot in the shoulder. <laughs> I don't know what they were giving him, so he wouldn't drink to like you know what i mean <laughs> Stop him. it was like after oh, five drinks you're on yeah <laughs> is that what it is <laughs> yeah so you get sick of the takes it. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. we made him take it at chicklets cup <laughs> events now yeah, yeah. <laughs> it didn't Imagine work he drank from the back on the way yeah, to the bar he, <laughs> he drank he drank through it right to the cadillac uh, oh, what, what do you call those Ca- margarita. cadillac margaritas, cadillac margaritas baby oh. i bet you 50 percent of your bloodstream is cadillac margaritas <laughs> Ideally, oh, <laughs> all right. You like to get after it, all right, or what? Oh, you think uh, he does on the road trips? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. I saw the uh, sandbagger with Bieksa. In that. I saw that one. Oh, that was oh, a blast. Geez. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, my first one. Well, I was, you know, him and Harm were the go, and Merles couldn't make it. And I said, oh, these two guys are funny bastards. So yeah. uh, I broke my cherry. Had a good time. We get another one coming soon too. But. Yeah. Uh, Back to the money you mentioned, did, like did, we always joke about, you know, bags full of cash. Did you like get a paycheck, direct deposit, or did you actually get cash a lot of the time? How did that work? The it was mostly um, in 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 Kazakhstan. We would get bank account. Yeah, so you had to open up a bank account there. They wouldn't uh, do your North American. You'd have to op- you had to open up a Kazakh bank account. But I know a lot of guys. Um, I know VTs in particular. A lot of them were getting paid in in brown paper bags. Um, and that kind of stuff. But a lot of the, so I, I bought an apartment there and they, people there, you can't wire money or there's and no check, like personal checks and that kind of stuff. So I had to take out, yeah, 500 K cash and just like walk to this guy in with the realtor and give him them 500 K. And then he gave me the deed to the apartment. And it's just like, I, I was showing Lyndon, Lyndon was like, Lyndon Vay. And he's like, Oh man, you better be careful with that bag. There's how many fucking these Kazakhs are going to fucking rip you off. I say, yeah, I know. But yeah, like a lot of the, yeah, I think a lot of people were getting paid in cat in, in uh, brown paper bags. A lot of teams were doing that. Did you make any money when you sold it? When you, when you retired or do you still own it? I, I still own it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I rented shit. it out. But they want me to coach. They fucking just messaged me. Like coach just got gas. They want me to go and coach now. I was like, oh. like fired gas or the, the fucking blue velvet mask gas. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, yeah. Would you consider going back over there to coach though? Me? I don't know. I was, I, my, my son, I, we went back for that 15th, uh, that thing award that I got in, in May, me and my son, my son was born in St. Petersburg. So I took, I brought him with me. We went back there and I met with uh, the owner of the team in, uh, cause the world championships was going on in Lat in Riga, Latvia. And, uh, he made it, everything sound good. Like he wanted me to kind of help out with the, like help out coaching with the team, but then also help out with like minor hockey and, and getting the youth hockey, uh, up to par with, uh, with North America and, and this and that. And I said, yeah, but my, but I, I don't know. I told you during the chicken's cup, my wife has been ill for a little while. So that's why I had to retire. So I said it would have to line up. I told him that, We'd have to have a like a doctor over there and this kind of stuff. So um, we're still talking. They still want me to. Uh, like I told you, the coach just got fired. But uh, it's something I, I would think about, but only if everything lined up perfectly. Uh, your son being born, does he get citizenship sort of like, you know, Canada uh, or America? You're born here, you get citizenship. Does it work the same way there? He, he no, it didn't. It didn't work. He, I think you can only have one. Same okay. with Kazakhstan huh. too. So it was like so we for, to play for the national team, we would have a sports visa or sports passport. So he he would be able to get something like that pretty easily. So, but he's also dual here. So he's got Canadian and American. My wife's American. I'm Canadian. And then yeah, he was born in St. Petersburg. So I don't know how that would work. Yeah, dolls. Are you the pride and joy of Niagara Falls, Ontario? 
I don't think so, man. Come on. Really? What about Kanopka? Kano- okay, so Kanopka's from Niagara Falls. I thought he was from Niagara. Niagara. Niagara Lake, yeah. Um, I don't know. There's some boxers and stuff that are from there. There's some good young hockey players there. Like you guys, you're well and oh my God, the, the production that came out of there. We I still used to speed bag you guys, surprisingly, because Niagara Falls probably, what, twice the size? Right. And we had all the guys coming out at that time, but you were the one name coming out of Niagara Falls. Now, but like, I was a little bit older than you guys, right? Yeah. Yeah, a little, yeah, a little bit. How was the development there? What was it? How, how did you get into hockey? We didn't even kind of start from the beginning of your yeah, career. I, my, well, so my uncle, I, I mentioned earlier, was uh, he played, he was played in RPI. He played, uh, he was drafted by the, the, the Kings, I think, in the second round, but then ended up playing for the Leafs five games. But playing in the American League, he had a 50 goal year with uh, New Market in the American League. And then he went and played over in um, Austria, in Vienna, for a little while. And uh, so, yeah, so he was a big influence. My whole Dolman family played hockey. Like my dad played a little bit, a little bit of uh, junior B and stuff. And they just kind of pushed, not pushed it on me, but you know what I mean? You get your kid into it. And, and, and that's where I went. And we were always into ball hockey. I was into, I was a pretty good soccer player too. Uh, so I played hockey and soccer all the way up. And yeah, just, we had a good team. We had good coaches and a good group. Like the Kanopka was on our team. He ended up playing, started playing in Niagara Falls. We won a couple uh, OMHA championships. We played in the Pee Wee tournament with another fellow Pee Wee tournament <laughs> in Quebec. Uh, we didn't do so well there, but yeah. And then, uh, Always, I was uh, I was uh, the same size I am now. I was I was growing up, so I, I haven't grown since then. So I've been the same size, but I was always bigger than, and and a little bit thicker. So I was able to to hit guys, and and I had a good shot. I could always shoot. So, and I think that's where the success came. And then, um, the the whole university j- junior B. I played junior B. I was in for the falls. We won the Sutherland Cup, um, and then I was gonna go. Me and Orby and my buddy who's with the clothing line, uh, we went and visit. I was telling Witt at Chicklets Co. We went and visited RPI. We had a, a little party there. A couple of girls asked us to, to stay the night and then hang out there. And then after the, the next night, we were like, yep, we're coming here. We're both got <laughs> Absolutely. Like and he got that, game? There's yeah. No two of them for you with the face. Just a then, bolt, yeah. bolt on Walmart tits. Yeah. And then I got drafted that year because I put the word out that I was going to go to college. And then uh, that's when I got drafted eighth round to Guelph. Uh, a friend of our family worked for the storm, kind of begged me just to go to, to the rookie camp and stuff. So I went to the rookie camp and my brother always jokes at me because he says after rookie camp, I just case, took my bag and left and said, I'm too good for this league. And I didn't say that. <laughs> I said the hockey and the like these rookies were shit. So I, I don't think I should play. I, I want to go to college because I already had in my mind I was going to go to college. And uh, on the way home, the GM called my dad and was like, listen, just tell him to come back. If what does he want? Like, what what can we do to, to, to keep him here? And uh my dad kind of like asked me, I said, I don't know. Like, I, I really want to go to school. They're like, well, they'll pay for school. Um, they'll, they'll give you a little bit more money than they're supposed to. I said, okay, then I'll, I'll try it. And, and I had a really good year. And then they, again, then I lit it up in junior and it went from there. Yeah. But that was, that was kind of how my little start to hockey came. My brother played too. He was, uh, so my dad had to lug us both around. He was a factory worker after he played a little bit of junior. Uh, my, my brother fought a lot. He played in the central league. He, uh, he played, uh, in Odessa here in Texas. Um, that's, the, that's where, um, uh, that Friday where night lights? Friday night lights is. I yeah. Think. The Mid- Midland. Yeah. Midland, Odessa, Texas. Yeah. Hermian or something. And that's, and that's where you're living now dolls. You obviously used to go back to Niagara falls after your seasons in, uh, in the KHL, but uh, you know, ever since COVID you ended up moving down, buying a piece of dirt there and now you've turned into a farmer. Well, yeah. So, uh, that's, that's what happened. Yeah. So after, after I retired, I, like I told you, my wife got a little bit sick. So we, it was right around when COVID started and Canada was, you know, locking people down and, and I just saw things were changing and I didn't want to live in that kind of situation. Um, and I was like, well, Texas is open. Texas is free. And I was just like, let's go. So we, uh, I bought a yeah, 38 acre property here, uh, very rural, like right in between Dallas and Houston. Like I was, I was telling, uh, Grinnell that, uh, I had to get my neighbor. So when we, during this 
uh, Spit Chicklets tournament, I had to, had to order uh, Starlink because my neighbor got it. So we weren't getting any, any internet. My kids were complaining all the time. Like, dad, we need new internet. How can we get new? I said, I can't just call the internet company and tell them like, we need good internet. We're in the middle of fucking nowhere. So, um, so he gets the Starlink and, uh, it's lights out. It's like, it's the best internet he's ever had. What is that? Elon. Thanks, Elon. Elon. Don't tell yeah. R.A. Yeah. <laughs> Elon Musk's uh, satellite <laughs> thing. It goes on. It's like a robot. It goes on the top of your thing and it finds all the satellites in the. And it, and it, and it grabs you perfect internet. Oh, it's unbelievable. So I, yeah. I, I, when I got back here to Texas last night, uh, it arrived. So my, I was like, oh shit, I got to do this. Because if we were to do this interview, I would, I was going to go to his house and use his Starlink and sit, sit at his place and do it. But it came and he, he came over and we were up on my roof. We got the ladder. We're fucking drilling it in, setting it up. You got to take a picture of the sky and set it up. But yeah, so he's, he's been a huge, huge help to me um, because playing hockey, I was just playing hockey and fucking I didn't know anything. Like uh, I, I was so after I retired, my wife got sick, so I had to take care of the kids. I had to cook. I had to do all this stuff. And I just recently found out, you know, the spatula that I thought it was just the you know you put the icing on the cake and you just do this with that rubber spatula thing. Yeah. And uh, so I was like cleaning the bowl and I like started to use it to clean the bowl and it just came like it was like so smooth and everything that's was what getting everything. More in the in We're the pan. jokes too in the bowl absolute yeah. jokes and what? i was like babe babe does does anybody know like, <laughs> this, this is like, that this is this can be used for this and my daughter's <laughs> all that. like that's what it's used for i was like no way and i was like everything out i was like so impressed and they're all laughing i was supposed like supposed to lick the ball oh. yeah so, yeah right that's yeah, that I, too my finger in it and just fucking <laughs> But that's what I'm saying. So I like knew like, I was a lost. So I was lost. And then this guy is like helped me with everything. Now I can't. He was at Chicklets he, Cup, he, right? Didn't he? Yeah, yeah he, he was, was there our, with you. He was our yeah, our coach or whatever. Yeah. Was he, he into hockey before he met you? No, nothing about hockey. Yeah, he just. Uh, but he listened. He, I got him hooked on the the podcast, and he would listen. He listens to it like every day religiously. Yeah. He loves it. He's like, Biz, would you hear what Biz and Wit had and Ari had to say this? <laughs> like, I, I don't give a fuck that much, but just help me with my goddamn Starlink here. Uh, yeah, I, I could change the hey, I what about, change battery in my car. Uh, we yeah. got birds, like we got turkeys. Like it's just a K it's, it's wild. It's, but it's so peaceful. What about uh, um, farming? Like, have you been growing your own vegetables and stuff like so, that? Yeah, we grow our own vegetables. Uh, we have a stock pond. Uh, I got catfish, bass, bluegill. Um, we grew a watermelon field. We got these huge watermelons. Um, yeah, we, we have all that stuff. Our neighbors have cattle. We have bird. We have uh, chickens, turkeys, ducks, guineas. Uh, there's cows. Um, yeah, it's fucking, it's wild. It's like, it's like it what like about the stock like, pond? Do you, do you like when you catch the fish? Will you grill them up or yeah, you have to yeah, just put yeah, them back? Yeah. No, we eat them. Yeah, we wow. restock it. Yeah, we put them in there. Yeah, my my kids will fucking throw just as soon as they catch it, they'll throw it on the slab and fillet it and fuck throw it in the cooler and bring it up and fry that, it up. Hey, that that's living, man. That's, that's why good. I bought in Jackson. Yeah, I want to end up doing the same shit because at it's a certain awesome. point, you, yeah. Yeah, that's that's the real. Living. But it's so quiet. It's so peaceful out here. The, you can see the the stars like it's so close and it's just it's quiet. Nobody fucking bugs you. When I was in Niagara Falls, it was like people stopping at my house every single day, and it was I, I don't mind that, but not when my wife like she's going through some shit, and it's yeah. just like we needed, and she needed to get out in nature and and get away from the city and stuff. So yeah, what a what a move. And this guy's been a, a blessing helping out. Yeah, that's awesome. You said you're like between Houston and Dallas and that's rural. Have you ever been to like West Texas? Isn't it like, like a desert out there? Like just nothing Terrible. desolate. Yeah. So I, yeah. So I actually, I, I, I'm actually a volunteer firefighter too here in this. Oh, no shit. Nice. Town. But the fire chief, he, he owns like an oil rig out in, in Midland where we were just talking about. And he brought me out there. It's, it's, fucking nothing out there it's really? all oil no tech. country for old men yeah <laughs> that's where that is yeah, yeah. west texas Crazy. yeah yeah oh, shit. and those guys work hard man those guys grind oh they, they, oh, they all shit. everyone out here was either you're either well probably both you work on an oil rig or you're in the military and then you fucking you're a mason you know everything you can they, they these guys can fix anything 
It's wild. So it's like similar, like West Te- West Texas oil. It's almost similar to Northern Alberta, where they're going yeah. for two weeks on, two weeks off, yeah. like that. Yeah. Exact wow. same thing. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes, yeah, twenty eight days on, twenty eight days off. My neighbor did that. Yeah, he did that in Alberta. He did it in and the Gulf of Mexico. He did it in Alaska. Fucking wild. Yeah. Jeez. A lot of respect for those guys. Oh my god. Yeah. No shit. How, how long do you think it took you to finally get acclimated to that environment by like having your all, all your own stuff and being like being, being pretty resourceful with your, your acreage? We, we, it was tough, tough for me. Uh, like I said, cause I just, and then not that it was, it wouldn't have been tough if I hit sim, but my, if my wife wasn't sick, so I had to take care of, I had so many responsibilities. So when I retired, you know, some guys like the kind of, got to find a purpose after hockey. I, my purpose was I had to take care of my wife, my kids. Yeah. I had to fucking do all this That's stuff. That's awesome, so, dude. So it's, uh, so it went that way and it was tough at first, but my wife already had a green thumb. She had already started. We in Canada, we, we, for the past, before we moved here. So seven years prior to that, we were growing stuff there and I was growing weed too. We had some weed plants. Nice. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. Get your hand right. out of your pants. All right. It's like you just took one of those Russian blue pills when you said yeah, roll yeah. my weed. <laughs> I can weed. five but. inches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, it, it was, it was a, it was a time the first little while adjustment. And then, uh, especially with the heat too. And we didn't get a lot of rain. So we had to rig, we got to rig up some water systems and all this kind of stuff. Um, but I could easily just be like, okay, buy, pay someone if I can come do it, set me up nice. But no, I, I wanted to fucking learn. And I got this guy next door to me as the best teacher. So taught me all this stuff, built the fucking chicken coop, this huge run in the back. Uh, and, and it's great. I, you feel accomplished when something, when you do something like that, Fucking right. different, different than the hockey, but kind of same, you know what I mean? Life's nuts though, that like you, it is. you buy this random piece of property and then thank God this guy who you were telling me about a chicken's cup, just like an awesome dude. Like yeah. if you hadn't moved next to him, even though it's 38 acres away, yeah. who knows what would have happened, right? It's just, it's just nuts. I would have been this lost. This guy was like your savior. I would have been lost, man. Yeah. No, I know all the boys <laughs> loved him. He's like, he's an animal. Yeah. He's got some good stories. That's for sure. I, I told a story when uh, I was talking about Jackson, I think a few pods ago, I was just fortunate where my neighbor there, he, he's actually from Saginaw, Michigan, where I used to play junior. He yeah. built his own house up there where our property is from scratch. And now right. he's building an outdoor rink. So he's got the field of dreams rink up top on this, this amazing piece of dirt. So same idea. Like he just, he wired my fence for me and put an electric fence in so we could put cattle on it. So I wouldn't have to pay tax on the land. That's so I'll have my own cattle. So yeah. hey, anytime yeah. you need some steaks, RA, you let yeah. me know, buddy. Make sure you cattle now, biz? <laughs> yeah, I was I just got, well, say, yeah. yeah, I got cattle on the land. How much they charge you for a, for a steer? I'm going there. I'm going there on Thursday. So I'm going to, I'm going to square up with them and figure out what, you know, what, wow. what to do and how it all works. And once again, just sometimes when you go to these types of places or, or a lot of the time your neighbors there, they, they want to help. They want yeah, to help cool, teach yeah. you. Yeah. So it's a little bit different. And, and I've been very uh, grateful that I got to meet this David guy. I told you that he also owns this um, off grid experience yeah. outdoor company, and he's got a bunch of contracts with the Teton, uh, teton county so he he's actually getting even uh, 10 of these um uh, battery powered snowmobiles and oh, he's got wow. about 90 90 other ones so he's got 100 total snowmobiles and he has these people bring everybody out in these excursions oh, so if you want to go there yeah. if you want to go there go there with like a bachelor party you can go check out one of the moose game in town the, the senior a hockey yeah, you could go yeah. million dollar cowboy go skiing one day and then he could take you in the back country on these snowmobiles and and you, you go right, you, you go into the national forest, yeah. you're off grid here. And then some guys even bring their guns and they shoot for elk or whatever, whatever that it may be. But yeah. it's just a total different world. And like Maybe. you said, since, yeah. since now that I'm not playing, I'm feeling like I'm, I'm missing a little bit of purpose. Right. And, and when I went there for the first time, I said, this is something that I think I could become addicted to where I'm waking up every morning and I'm learning new things, which right. I mean, that's right. That's the whole point of life, right? That's it. Yeah. That's, that's what you said that touching on that. That's the same. Yeah. That's the learning every day is, and, but you've got a lot of purpose. You guys are on fire. You guys are like the success you guys have had right now. Uh, since yeah. You I mean, away from hockey. Yeah, just yeah, like, I know. Yeah. Okay. I get yeah. you. What's the gun yeah. law here in, in Wyoming? Do you know? Oh, uh, I got, I'm going to find out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have one yet. Yeah. <laughs> 
I don't, I mean, I wouldn't trust myself with a gun. Yeah, I know. I know. Go, yeah. go ahead. Ray. I'm just going to strangle them, <laughs> strangle the elk, get up and put them in a headlock. Billy talked about your, your North American adventures and on the Boston guy. Hey, you, you mentioned the jumbo Joe Thorne. Where were you in that trade with that? Were you in the room? What was the reaction? Cause it was such a disaster of a trade. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, yeah, they, they, they made like uh, Glenn Murray and, uh, uh, Boynton, a lot of those guys made O'Connell come in and, and kind of like, why did you just trade the best player oh, shit. in the oh. NHL? Yeah. And, uh, he was just like, he, he just like stood there frozen and they were just like giving it to him. Ray Croft, all these guys were like, that was the stupidest trade. What, look what you got for him. Oh and, shit. Really? Oh yeah. Yeah. And we were a uh, young guy and we were just like, Oh my God. Yeah, exactly. Like, why would he's you just, the NHL is we can shit on a GMs. He's the only player oh. in four major sports to ever get traded and win the MVP that season. That same year. I didn't know that, but that's a stat right there. That's Jeez. a tough stat. <laughs> oh, the Ray, guy who traded him. Raycroft yeah. was a young guy too, wasn't he? Yeah. But he just had the, he had won the Calder. Right. And he was, uh, he was their jam, right? So, so um, he still, he still stood up and Tuka. said that. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah. A lot of guys. Those those guys were, yeah. They were just giving it to him, and he just he couldn't, he didn't know what to say. He was just like we, he, he we thought that his time here was was done, and, and they just signed him like two months before that to a fucking yeah, extension. Yeah, and, and we so. we weren't doing so well. I I mean, it was only twenty eighteen games in or something like that, and I, I think we we're not in the bottom of the division, but we were weren't having a great start, but that's no need to trade the best player in the league. It but was yeah. the year prior when in the playoffs he had the broken rib, the most painful injury yeah. to try to play through, yeah. and he didn't do anything against Montreal. That was like the beginning of the of the end. And then yeah, it just will always go down. That's crazy you were there for that. Yeah, it was it was a wild time. And he was such a he's and everybody talks about, it, I'm sure when you when they come on the podcast too, like he was just he's a guy's guy. Like he just took <laughs> care of everybody. I had buddies who come down, like the guys who were at the spit and checklist, and they came to a game in, in Boston, they were staying for the weekend. And uh we were all the team we were going out after, and Joe was like, Your buddies are here, right? I said, Yeah, they're outside, they're on their way. He's like, Come with me. And he went out there and he grabbed them all, brought them all in, sat with us walked around the bar and grabbed a whole bunch of rods for him and paid for dinner. And these guys were in heaven. They loved it. Yeah. He's, he's just that guy. He's just, uh, he's just, he just takes care of everybody. And, and then I kind of saw that. And I saw that when I was younger too, like, uh, with guys like, uh, my uncle was like this and, and just taking care of everybody. And, and that, that kind of, when I played, when I was in Kazakhstan, when I had the money that I, that I made, I wanted to help guys out because I saw guys like that and how good it felt for me to see that I was doing that with some of the guys. And it's, uh, yeah, he's just, uh, just an amazing guy. I'm still I would say, I would say if not number one, I'm sure the guys would agree. He's top three, like white whales for us. Yeah, um, absolutely. Hopefully we can line yeah. it up at some point. But like you say, just like the way guys talk about how much he, he like lived for the locker room. <laughs> oh, so that's fun. it. Yeah. He would just, just, someone said it too. He just shirt off and he'd just have the biggest smile and he'd be running around getting, he'd say to get guys to do push ups. But yeah, he would like it. It's, he'd have his nuts hanging out through his jock and he'd be doing push ups and squats. He's just like various. <laughs> The stuff that he would do, was, and you wouldn't expect it because he's like the best player, the captain. Like you know what I mean? He's just being a goof. Fantastic! It was great to uh, play with him. Hey, that Starlink thing—that thing's amazing to me. So, like, I'm getting just bent over the table by Comcast. What do they hit you a month for Starlink, or is it so like a one-time one payment? One twenty a month. It's a uh, ninety-nine bucks to reserve it. It takes like a couple weeks to to get it, and then uh, it's one twenty a month. For just wow. internet, for yeah, just internet, yeah. Okay. It, but it's fantastic. The streaming, I think it's like. Uh, but if you fuck. cut the cord like RA did, right? I mean, like if you're only using internet for all your TV, which is what you do, RA, right? Yeah, yeah. You yeah, might yeah. have to do this, RA. I know you hate Elon, but fuck, you nah, got to be paying oh, more than a month now. Dude, I just switched to, I just switched to yeah. FiOS. Fifty bucks a month, man. I, oh. I pay for internet. Fifty bucks a month, FiOS. Oh, that's why it's so shit. No, it's no, unreal I just upgraded, now, I guess. motherfucker. I went, Even Grinnelli's like, like, all right, we could finally hear you on this thing. It yeah, six yeah, well, years. Nice. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I would uh, uh, definitely recommend it, yeah. Dolls, uh, another guy in Boston I need to ask you about. So in the lockout year, um, it, Bergeron obviously paid his first year after being drafted, and then the lockout year he went and played in Providence, and you were there the whole year with him. 
what yeah. were your like early signs of, of seeing his greatness? What was he like in the locker room? Just kind of speak to him as, as, as uh, you, as if you were just describing Joe Thornton. Yeah. So he, he was, uh, di- yeah, he did play that first year. Right. And then he came down for the, for the lockout and he, uh, didn't speak very, very broken English too. And he was very quiet. Um, but the same, you could tell on the ice that he was captain material. He, uh, I think he led our team in, in, in points that year. And I think we went to the conference finals actually in Providence, but he, uh, the same, like the same kind of guy quiet in the room. But, uh, when he was on the ice, you could, the presence that he had was, it was a captain material. Um, he got along with, with everybody. And he, like Brad boys was there. There was Andy Hilbert, uh, Keith, a coin. Um, but he was bar on the best player in, if not our, our team, but in that league at that time too. I mean, Eric Stahl was in the league and he went at his prime too. Spezza was there. Spezza, yeah. Like they had some good players, but Bergeron was, was one of those that stood out. You could tell he was going to be, uh, a long time NHL and, and captain, but, but, but very, n- not much English at all. Yeah. Very shy kid too. Well, you also played with another uh, future Selkie candidate in with Anze Kopitar when you were in L.A. He was a, a rookie, I yeah. think, or the first two years. What was what was this uh, experience with him? Similar to Bergeron, maybe? Or Similar, yeah. He, but he was he was a, he was a little bit more outgoing. A little he liked to go out a little, have a little fun too. Um, but he was, yeah, he was the same. And I, I played even international against him too uh, in some world championships. And um, but his first game or first exhibition game that we played, I think he had four goals in it or something like that. Um, and right away he was, he was a star Cuba Gooding jr. Was in the dress room, like Anze, Anze, show me the money. Like this guy and he was just like, yeah, show me the money. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, he, he was, uh, the same, yeah. The same presence that you, you knew the guys like that, even Dustin Brown, like that there's another guy, like I played with him in junior uh, in Guelph. And he just had that, you know, he, you could tell he was going to be a professional. You could tell he was going to be a long time, uh, NHL player. Um, and then I ended up playing with him in LA and living with him, uh, in LA, him and his wife. Uh, but man, did he love video games? Like, Oh, he felt that world of Warcraft. He would play eight hours, 10 hours. I'd be going out with the guys, come back. He'd still be on that fucking thing. Um, but what a player. Yeah. He was, uh, he was another guy. Much respect to those guys. Those guys, uh, great careers. Jeez. And then they won the cup when I left. Fuck, that's another stat. I, th- I thought maybe you would bring this up, Biz. Um, every team that I played with after I left, they all won the fucking championship. Yeah, got rid of the trash. <laughs> See you later, buddy. I was like the guy got rid that... Of the dead that- weight. <laughs> they bring in the team build and then get them the fuck out. <laughs> uh, yeah. Every team. Fuck. Do you, do you think that if you would have came up more in today's game that you would have been able to have a sustainable NHL career? Do you ever think about that? Because the I game think, has turned yeah. more skillful and, and, and probably teams are a little bit more open-minded to keeping smaller guys on the back end. I think so. I, I maybe I I, th- I thought about it a little bit during yeah because a few teams uh, later on in, in my KHL career wanted me to come back to play. And my agent the same, and I was just like, this is, you know, I'm not going to go back to the money now. It's too late. But yeah, there was a my buddies all said the same thing too. They're just like, if it, now do you think? And I said, yeah, I'm sure, but I mean, you can't turn back time. But fuck, it would have been nice. Um, I think I could have done a little bit better, but I wouldn't change it. Everything was great. I mean, we, we've already mentioned his name, but the same goes for a guy like Nigel Dawes, whereas yeah. he was this borderline player in the NHL and then ended up going over there. And I would say that there's no way he would have made more money in the NHL, even if he came back, that, that he made overseas. Right. Uh, and a lot of guys, like a lot of guys, uh, it, it, that's what it was. It was the borderline guys that uh, that went over during and had good good careers over there. Like Bochensky too, even Dustin Boyd had a good uh, run over there too. A lot of those guys. Um, Bidazi, what a player he is. Oh my God, it's the success he had. He just retired too this year. Uh, he was a good player. He always, he, he when he first came in, I gave him a, t- a rough time when he first came in too. Um, he, him and Boyder came in. A li- they played significant games in, in the NHL too before they came over. So they kind of had an arrogance that I didn't, appeal to at the start. So Dazi was like ordering meals before. And anyways, he ordered, ended up ordering a pasta and then going to the bathroom. So I grabbed his pasta and I ate it. I said, this guy's too cocky. I'm going to eat his fucking pasta. 
he come back and he got pissed. And then Lucas Cashbar was uh, ended up telling Dazi that I was racist, and he's like, "Oh, <laughs> he's no. like, oh yeah." <laughs> so no. Dazi, my first year, he thought I was this racist guy. I was like, "Oh man, no, I didn't. I just did it because I he, just ate your gnocchi, buddy. Yeah. Relax. I don't got a hood on." <laughs> oh man, I don't got a hood on. Yeah. Come oh, on yeah. here. Yeah. Hey, then, what's that? What's that? It's the what's the guy in? Uh, oh, for fuck's sakes, Chappelle show, Clayton Bigsby. Oh. <laughs> and then Kevin, Kevin he Clayton he Bigsby. Was, he was <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, and I can see the meme now. Oh fuck! Yeah. He divorced his wife. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Kevin, uh, what? What are the NHL stops? St. Louis. I know you weren't there a long time. They were kind of going into a rough, uh, rough phase, but. You must have had some laughs. You had Dallas Drake, uh, Dougie Waite, and Big Walt in that room. Huh? Must have been a few chuckles yeah. during a shitty year. And that year, yeah, we had 13 first-year guys on that team, too. Oh, so wow. we uh, we had a lot of fun. I mean, we went on a skid where we lost 14 in a row, too. But uh, Big Walt in that dressing room, the biggest chew in his, uh, in his mouth. And he'd always have beers uh, right in the dressing room after. But uh, they would give it to – do you remember Dennis Weidman? That oh, yeah. Oh. So remember his shootout goal that he had where he like, yeah, the show. yeah, went horizontal or whatever. Oh, they put it up in the dressing room and Walt every day would be like, what, why it's what the fuck were you doing? <laughs> just just give it to him. Oh. Um, and then, yeah, there, Mike Sillinger, he was another guy that was uh, oh, v- veteran. He, he went, how many teams did he play on? I think he played on 13. 12. 13. Yeah. Yeah. The most yeah. ever. Yeah. Yeah. He was, uh, he was another guy that was pretty funny. Uh, but I, yeah, like I was only there for a short time. And another uh, Niagara Falls guy, Mike Blumack, was there. And yeah, uh, Brendan Brooks, too, from St. Catharines. Those guys were there oh, yeah. at the same time uh, during when the 13 of the first-year players were there. And we had, So we had a good young group. We were always having fun. Uh, and they, they allowed us to have fun because we were shit. So, um, <laughs> yeah. um I got I got to circle back on the KHL stories. Is there anything that we didn't cover where you had some in, insane experience that we didn't ask you about? One thing I was going to ask you about was the All Star game that you got nominated to, where you guys played an outdoor game. Was that one in Moscow? Yeah, that was in the Red Square in Moscow. Yeah, that was that was probably one of the most memorable experiences that uh, during that my career over there too, because. Uh, Ray Emery was there. There was a lot of uh, North Americans that were there too. And, and um, right in the middle, it was minus, I think it was minus 20 guys. Like it was, we had scarves on, hats on, but they had everybody there. Putin was there. It was just like, got to meet the Putin. It was just like all these legends were there. Pavel Burry, McGilney, all the Tretiak. They were all just like watching and then scarves and then joking on the bench uh, tough to play cause it was so cold, but, um, they had a nice ceremony for everybody, brought all these guys in and, and that was, yeah, biz. Thanks. Thanks for reminding me about that. That, that was, uh, totally forgot about that experience. That was, uh, that was something that I'll definitely, who definitely- was the most, who was the most badass that you've probably intimidated to meet? Beret? Like, Out of those was, guys? Yeah. Well, well, I mean, Putin, Putin's Federer. probably pretty intimidating. I, I was a huge Fedorov fan when I was younger. So, uh, when I got to meet him and then play against him and then play on the all-star team with him then have dinner with his parents and him. Yeah, it was, uh, that was a, that was a huge, huge, uh, I was, what, fan, fan moment. was Fedorov and, uh, and Beret still battling over Anna Kornikova. Uh, what's, what's his I name? I really want to know. Yeah. What's her name? Took her, uh, Iglesias, didn't he? Yeah. I want to oh. be your hero, baby. <laughs> Sing it with me, dolls. I don't want to take your she did, pain she did a away. She number off too, man. He was like, it's, she fucked him up. Yeah, he got oh, fucked, yeah, yeah, money fucked this game too, up. Like, yeah, yeah. Oof. Tough but fight. yeah, no, no, those experiences. Yeah, um, all those All Star games were shit shows, though. Um, the, the, like you said earlier on, like, the, the, the way they party is just uh, they do party to hurt themselves. But every though, I I couldn't even go out to some of those uh, All Star games. I, I just have to be pushed out there because they just fucked me up so much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's the Russians, man. Like Tarasenko, like we had a, and they they don't give a fuck when they're doing it too, like fighting or anything. We went to, uh, when I was in St. Petersburg with with those guys, Bobrovsky and Tarasenko, we went to the ski lodge. We had a couple days off and, uh, they just the banya, the, the vodka shots, the hookah, everything. And then, uh, 
the ski resorts closed that it was midnight and these guys want to go down to the ski fucking hill. So there's those GTs, you know, those GTs we had as kids where we fucking uh, we'd hop on. Hall. G- yeah. These GTs and Tarasenko fucking woo down this fucking hill straight down and flips and fucking snowballs fucking a bottle. <laughs> I'm like, dude, he's going to fucking die and fall off the cliff. We're like chasing down there. He gets up, he's fucking howling. <laughs> fucking this other Russian guy, Berdasov went down. He ended up hurting his hand on the fucking ski hill. But yeah, they just, they, they're, they're just a different breed. Like it's, it's, it's wild. Yeah. Jesus, man. I, I got one more name. Uh, you were briefly with him, but he could end up in the Hall of Fame as well. Mike Sullivan, what was your experience with him? Did you think he was going to end up being as, as great of a coach as he's turned out to be? Yeah, I, I was impressed. He was, he was probably one of my top top coaches that I that I had. Um, even, I mean, I had him in Providence with the Scott Gordon. Um, and he, yeah, he he liked me. He was uh, very vocal, but he's a guy who played, played the game. Um, he was well-liked. He was a great player, a good defensive player. Um, very well spoken. I liked him a lot. He was, uh, he was a great coach and he went on to have fucking a great coaching career. Jeez. And he's still oh, rocked. Yeah. And then me and Wit were talking about this too at the Chicklets Cup and how good, uh, people hockey guys are like the hockey family and, and that kind of stuff. And, uh, my buddy, his, his daughter had passed away and, and that that's how they got Crosby and them to all kind of go say hi to him and say hi to his son and stuff. Um, but yeah, that the hockey family, it's, it's like no other family. You, you'd be gone for so long, like going to Russia and then coming back and seeing you guys. And it's just like picking up like kind of where we left off that kind of stuff. The it's, it's, yeah, you run it, you run into great, guys great that like, you know, we didn't know each other very well, but then yeah. spent an hour and a half just, just hanging out, telling stories at Chicklets Cup. And we, we were saying the same thing. It's like 95% of the people that are a part of the game are, are great guys. And you can just tell stories, have some laughs and, and go over the good old days that, that we all miss so much. But, um, yeah, it, it's yeah. great to have you on, dude. It, it was an unbelievable yeah. career. I, like I told uh, you, I, I saw you. I'm, guys, and, uh, you guys all had great careers and then, and I, I don't know much about you, RA, but, uh, <laughs> you guys, are, you got, no. <laughs> you guys a lot more. Who do you work for? Just go, just just go are, you wear, that. are you wearing a wire? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you don't work speak, for the feds, do you? <laughs> <laughs> but if, if, if you guys are, don't mind if I just plug the rats eating eye heels, yep. uh, oh, no. the clothing company, rats, rats, eating eye heels.com. Um, some cool shit, some cool urban urban streetwear. It's got a little bit of flash of hockey for our fat asses and thighs. Uh, yeah, stretchy. what's your buddy's name? He gave me the the Marshawn yeah. the Marshawn hoodie. It's like Marshawn with like a rat tail, like eat the, with a with a high heel. Eating high hockey. heel, yeah. So he <laughs> his his name is Orby Mike Gore. He was the one that had the the, the chick with the huge tits uh, that everybody was fucking. Oh yeah, oh, oh, that was his right. girl at yeah, the Chicklets Cup. Girl. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. my good first thing first thing uh what'd she say he eats my ass unbelievable that's yeah, what she yeah. was like, oh hey what's no what she said I, I knew he was the one when Sad he ate my ass before he kissed uh, me yeah. i was like whoa whoa i was like check <laughs> <those> cup <laughs> strikes again so yeah he's he's my uh partner in this clothing company and he wanted i got a good story about him too if you if you know you got a oh yeah let's go time. right now all right so he's he was he was a wild kid like his his parents were never around anyways so we uh Starting in, I think it was after my first year of junior, uh, we came back and I was working at uh, a sugar iced tea factory because you don't make money when you're in the American era, when you're playing junior. And I had a job the, the summer before and I spent it all anyways. So I'm working this shift work at this place and the guys started like all our, the pros come back for summer skates and once a week and stuff like that. So we, we're going to, we're going for a skate. Uh, we're all all the pros and uh, there's 17 of us. So after we go to this bar, they're all buying shots. I got 200 bucks in my account. Everyone's buying shot. The shot, the bill was like each round was like 300 bucks. So I go to the guy at the, who's one of our buddies, the bartender. Um, I'm like, I don't have enough. He's like, dolls, it's okay to pay. So anyways, I buy a shot. It's like dolls bought around. Everyone goes crazy. Mike, then Orby buys around. So one of the guys old school just came out with, uh, Will Farrell when he streaks and we're going streaking snoop a loop, bring your green hat. So one of the older guys was like, Hey, fuck, it'd be great if somebody streaked Clifton Hill. 
in Niagara Falls. You know, oh, for Christ's Hill, sake. the uh, tourist yeah. area. Oh, yeah. Hill, right by the falls. They got everything. There. Rumors nightclub was there at this time. So the bar is closing. I'm out of money. They're all the pros. They're like, let's go to the casino. I was like, I can't go to the casino. So I look at the Orbean. I look at my other buddy. I'm like, hey, should we go streaking? Was he daring us to go streaking down Clifton Hill? They're like, yeah, let's go. So Orby's like, I'll drive. So me and my other buddy, we get in the car, we gear down, barefoot, everything, get to the top of the Clifton Hill. He's like, I'll meet you down at the bottom and we'll jump in the car and we'll get the fuck out of here. So we start going and rumors is just emptying out. Everyone, it was last call. So everyone's coming to the street. All the tourists are down there. There's restaurants open. There's, we're like, oh man, we're committed now. We got to fuck it. So I turn up the drunk sprint and a curb and I fucking head first over the curb. And I kind of like skid off the fucking cement. I got burns on my face, my chest, my pecker. Uh, (laughs) My buddy keeps running. He's like, ah. And uh, I look up and a cop fucking takes off after him. A cop grabs me, kind of cuffs me up. So I'm standing there in front of the crowd, right in front of rumors, where everybody's coming out buck naked uh, with the cuffs on. And uh, the, the other cop, Billy Stick, my buddy, took him down, brought him in. And the cop we knew was like, Dolls, what the fuck are you doing? He's like, I'll take care of these guys. So he throws us in the back of the cruiser. He gives us this speech. He's like, he dropped my buddy off. He's like, dolls. He's like, what's going on? Like, you got a career here. Like, what are you doing? I said, we got fucking dared. We're hammered. Like, um, so he drives me home. He's like, what are your parents? He's like, I was staying at my parents' house. So I go in, my parents are just shaking their head. My brother comes out with a fucking trench coat and fucking, he's like, you know, you look like a fucking pedophile. Threw me this trench coat and fucking, I sleep on my parents' couch. I end up waking in the morning, I pissed down on their couch. So I had to fucking my next paycheck. I had to buy them. Oh my God. But, but, uh, so I'm like fucking Orby. I was like, where is this fucking guy? I haven't heard from him. He had the car, had our clothes. Um, I call him the next day. I'm like, Orby, what the fuck happened to you? He goes, dude, I, like, I waited down there for half an hour. So I figured you guys got arrested. So I fucking went to the casino, try to fucking make some bail money for you fucking guys. And fucking, no. yeah, and fucking, so that, that's just his, that's his fucking personality. He's just a wild man. Just fucking, but he's got this girl and then she's, uh, she was a oh. looker at Chicklet's oh Cup. Oh my God. Uh, I'd I suck could, a fart time, out of her asshole. Oh, when she walked by, I could see the eyes. I was just like, oh, fuck. He loves I'd it. Su- he I'd suck it. a fart right out of her. Who? I'd eat the corn out of her shit. Oh, That's yeah. how she was. I hope you had some of that off brand Russian Viagra if you were buck naked in front of a club like that. At least, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was it, boys. That was uh. the. Sorry, oh, you unreal, to- buddy. Thank How you so much. How about getting rug burn on your cock, oh. though? That's oh, awful. So oh. bad. Face, chest, belly, cock. It was just like- That's why you keep the Forzy, folks. You never know oh, when you're going to go streaking with the Forzy. You would have tore off for sure. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Calamari <laughs> outside of Rumors Nightclub. <laughs> yeah. Little bubble uh, Dolls, this is awesome, buddy. Yeah. Congrats on a hell of a career. Um, you know, uh, good luck in Texas, man. Keep doing your thing down there and, and best of luck to your wife with her health as well. Thank you. That's I appreciate a, that. And I appreciate yeah. you guys having me on. Um, you didn't have to do that. And then uh, we talked about it for a little while and, and, and it was great seeing you guys at the Chicklets Cup and, and we look forward to it next year. The guys, like I said, are, are talking about it. They're already talking about it. So Wit, thank you. Biz. Anytime. You know, hey, I got anytime. one last request. Yeah. Can I still get a job in the KHL? Absolutely. <laughs> if you're uh, coaching cool. over there, I could be a seventh D man. You want to play still? Fucking it. I want to be a seventh D man. I want to suck back that play. gas. We'll play. Fuck. Yeah. We'll get the gas. Absolutely. Hey, and uh, if you can't get me over there, at least bring the gas back for the big deal selects for next year's Chicklets Cup because hey, we're going to need it. it. I'll work on it. I'll, I'll get Love my it. neighbor to rig something up. All right. All you're right, the guys. Best, dolls. Thank Great you so much. You. All right, boys. You have a good night. You too, buddy. Thank you so much to Kevin Dahlman. What a career he had overseas. I remember, as I said, playing against him, just dominant. And that's some big side, uh, big time Russian gas info. That's kind of the most in-depth gas description we've had so far. Uh, Quickly, before we get to Jumbo Joe and his retirement, our poll, uh, are you okay with the NHL getting rid of offsides review? 54% say yes, 46% say no. That's 10,000 votes. So a lot closer than we thought. And for all of the comments, and I guess I could be yelled at as well by myself here in terms of kind of trying to blow it down right away and and you have like a certain amount of seconds to blow it down and challenge it and maybe give a delay a game if the coach is wrong. Biz already mentioned. As the example of like, let's say the puck 
goes underneath the crossbar and it's a goal, yes. they don't play it out till the whistle goes. They put the red light on and say, hey, it was a goal. Line up. Let's not waste each other's time here. The problem is that that is a goal. So you're going back and you're stopping the game where it should have been stopped. It was a goal. This time, if you're trying to like challenge it and stop the game, you have no idea if it's going to get out of the zone and go back down the other way and the other team scores. So you're you're stopping the game uh, for a goal in the one instance when it hits the inside bar and nobody knows. You're stopping the game for something that didn't even exist if it wasn't offside. So I, I'm I'm in an absolute um, blender right now in my mind. All I know is I hate going back and I hate all the reviews, but I don't have an answer. Because uh, so, if keep in mind, if the play is slightly offside and they're looking at it upstairs or in Toronto, they're not going to blow it down because even if it's a 45-second sustained offensive zone shift, if that puck gets turned over and it goes to the other end and they score on the other end, that – Nobody knows that offside ever took place because who gives a fuck? The play's continuing, right? So I think we've talked about the offsides enough. Absolutely. Wait, is there any uh, Cadillac margarita in that blender you're talking about over there or what? Ooh. No. No. I'm just, I'm in a blender. I'm in a blender, bud. Well, you know who's enjoying a couple margaritas right now is our boy Jumbo oh. Joe. Congrats. Jumbo Joe Thornton officially announced his retirement. Gee, I, play some of that audio for the crowd. Hey. Judging how many people keep asking me, I guess I have to tell you, I'm officially retiring from the NHL. Thought you guys would have figured it out sooner, but you kept asking. So here I am, retiring. I have so much love for the game of hockey and for countless number of people that helped this kid's dream become a reality. And if you're looking for me, you know where to find me. I'll be at the rink. Peace and love. I mean, just a classic. We knew he was probably done a year ago, but he just does that video. Good stuff. First overall pick back in 1997, 24 NHL seasons with Boston, San Jose, Toronto, and Florida. 1901 regular season and playoff games. Of course, the 2006 Hot and Ross trophies becoming the only player that was traded during the season and went on to win MVP. Uh, he last played 21-22. Uh, also had three different stints with Davos over in Switzerland during his career. So, I mean, what more can you add to, uh, about Jumbo Joe Thornton here with I just I just look back and 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 I think that this guy deserved a Stanley Cup maybe as much as anyone ever. Oh. And, and Biz and I were talking about it, and that's unfair to say is the first thing I think, right? But it's it's more a compliment to him, like the way he played, a mean, angry bastard on the ice, willing to fight anyone. What a setup, man! I mean, this guy's set of hands and his vision. Some of the uh, the the assists he had on the highlight reel of his career. No look, backhand dishes, protecting the puck as well as anyone ever. A monster body that just took time to develop. Talk about not Russian players. What they did to him in Boston those first few years was very smart, I guess, in, in terms of Harry Sinden, knowing that the the sky was the limit for him. But why rush him in? Let him find his feet find his way around the league, and then he went on to be one of the most dominant power forwards I've ever seen. And playing against him, the year we were uh, the eighth seed in Anaheim, we upset them. They were the one seed. He fought Getzlaff. It was, he was a man possessed, and, and we got the best out of him. Or I say Pronger, Niedermeyer, Getzlaff, Solani got the best out of him. I didn't do anything. <laughs> but he was so difficult to play against because of his size. And a lot of guys with size, they don't have the soft mitts. They don't have the vision. And so him coming up the ice with his head up at all times, he was just as good on his backhand as he was on his forehand. And his ability to create space for his teammates was the best part. Like, you'd have to have two guys go to him at a certain time because he'd be the first guy in the corner and then it left someone wide open I mean look what he did to Jonathan Chichu look at the look at the years Jonathan Chichu had playing with him as his setup man he, and, he, and heater and just all these guys that he just put it right on a tee for him always in the perfect spot and for me it was like defensively and physical and fighting it was like that's what made him this true all-around superstar and 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 what a career and I just I wish he got a cup because there's yeah. two guys in my mind um that I believe should have got a cup. Biz, I know you told me Joe's your number one, right? Well, I said, I said if, if like, uh, this is how I feel about the guy. I said if I had one coin that allowed a, a person, you said who never won a Stanley Cup in the NHL, and said you get to have won one based on their career and the person and all things included, he was from my era too. I would, I would give it to Joe Thornton. That would be my guy. Now, did you have any? Like, what would be your my pick guy? On would it? Um, my guy that would kind of fight that 50-50s Iggy um, the way Iggy played and, and Jerome McGinley and just 
the same type of mean, menacing attitude on the ice with the skill to go with it. And, and they got gold medals. I'm glad they got the gold medals, but the cup is, it was one thing both of those guys deserved. And they both were there. They both made a final and, and they were, they were this close, which probably makes it even a little more difficult. Um, but Jumbo also, like I went to BU, I was a freshman, and he was still in the Bruins, and he'd be at Dad's Diner, just a big, good-looking superstar with the long flow. Everyone loved him. You could, and he was a great guy. Like he would, he would take care of anyone. I think that's the biggest thing about Joe Thornton is, besides him loving the guys, loving the locker room, and just wanting to be at the rink, he was somebody that teammates just spoke so highly of because he made them feel so welcome. So to be a superstar and a veteran as, as his career went along and looking out for rookies and just just always cracking a joke and being in a great mood around the room. He's an all-time NHL player and a first ballot Hall of Famer. Summarized perfectly. God damn. And I, 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 yeah, I don't, I don't know him that well to speak on him, but everything you hear about him is exactly the way that Witt just described. And fuck, I wish I was closer with him because that guy's the biggest Me too. beauty going. Me too. That's he's, why he's he's on the white whale list. I mean, he's, he's on in the, the white top whale three list. we want. So hopefully we're able to sit down with him at some point and and get the maybe get a couple of pink Whitney's flowing. A, a, Imagine doing a, a tarps off interview with him. Just all of us, just tarps off. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, Biz, I'm sick today. I can't make that this interview. No, no, all right, come on. <laughs> you can get on a little workout regimen for yeah, him. Yeah, no? yeah, it's in my contract. I'm not taking my top off. Oh, no, I want to no. see your uh, that, your ski slope tits, just like those lady <laughs> movies. Hope hey, Hanrahan, hand. uh, Biz, one of my f favorite memories of, of Joe. It was actually off the ice. It was you know that first year when Pat Burns was was sitting him, and you know they they weren't putting him out to the, to the fire right away, and uh, it was. January 1st, I want to say 1998, and the Bruins were playing Ottawa that day, and he, he was a healthy scratch that day. And he's a you know 18-year-old kid, and I'm fuck, I'm close to 30, if not 30 already. And uh, my buddy Rizzo, who worked Bogey, he's like, oh, look who's over there, Thorne. And he grabbed the puck for me, and uh, one of the shoppies with the silver right. And, and I was like, I was like probably shaking. I was like, hey, Joe, can I buy you for an autograph? He was like, oh, absolutely. He was like Spicoli, dude, just like happy, joyous guy, signed my stub, signed the puck. And it's like the only puck I have on the glass in my bedroom. No so, shit, you got it yeah. still. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, it's you know, I'm not like I said, I'm not a huge autograph guy, but that one's been on the like the one of those cases for a long time. I mean, it's Jumbo Joe, man. So hey, yeah, and it was a no, cool memory. Ra as a bees fan, I mean, they had already drafted Bergeron and Krejci when they dealt his ass. Imagine. And yeah. Who knows? Who knows if Krejci's still there? Right. Like at some point, you might have moved him. But like just just the thought of the Bruins' future if they had never traded oh him, God. like you got to think that they get more than one. They'd be as strong as the Kings up the middle. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a great debate, I guess. But, with, but, but if they, would they not have Char and and, and exactly? Because I think the you know conventional wisdom as well that that opened up money for Savad yep. and um, Char. And I remember I was in Toronto that day. It was what, July first, two thousand six, and I thought I was getting like punked at some bar in Toronto. I happened to be in Toronto with my wife on on a trip. And I called my buddy back home, like, did the Bruins just give Chara seven, what was it, five times seven and a half and Savad four times five? Like, because they never paid anybody. It was like we were flabbergasted. So, yeah, I don't know that it would have played out that same way. I know Mike O'Connell doesn't think it would have, but, you know, it's just one of those things. It, it sucked to get rid of him. They, they got stiffed on the trade. But, you know, a few years later, they got the cup. And, yeah, I, re I really wish Joe would have got one. He's just, you know, one of the most beloved guys in the last, uh, what, 25 years of the game. But. You know, it, it didn't happen, but Hall of Fame, no doubt. Automatic. And it just so aligns that uh, Dolman, a guy like you know, we we had we didn't even know that that was going to come up. I think well, Ra, right, you ask every guy <laughs> who played for the Bruins. He just happened to be there when he got traded, and to hear the 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 dialogue in the locker room, like that was some pretty wild insight behind the scenes of that whole ordeal. Um, what was oh so the I don't really know many Joe Thornton stories but the one that came up was when uh, Todd McClellan was coaching the Sharks and you know he would you know when coaches always do the video sessions and they play back maybe sometimes when you're not playing great not putting the puck in the back of the net and I guess Thornton had like a wide open net and then he tried to thread the needle to another guy so he could score and then he like paused it and he's like Joe He's like, you got to shoot that. And but he would do that like he'd done it often where he'd stop it. He'd say, Joe, you got to shoot that. And then Joe would just say, no, nah, I'm a passer. <laughs> now, nah, every nope, time he said nope, it. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I'm a passer. Just right back in the meeting where most guys, it's like whatever your coach is saying, you shut the fuck up, put your tail between your legs and you do. No, nope, I'm a passer. And you mentioned it with one of the, the the greatest playmakers to ever go down in our game and uh, enjoy retirement, big fella. He's got a he's got a spirit like a young kid. So I hope at some point maybe he dabbles on the media side. I feel like we haven't seen the end of Joe Thornton. 
whether it's management or I think it would be really cool if a guy like that, especially with his stature and credibility as a player, joined a, a panel or some form of media outlet. Maybe I mean, do like a 18, man, a man. 18 to 41 or whatever. Like he, he's not, he can't leave the game. It's, it, this is what he knows and he loves being around the game. That's so clear. Like he, yeah, he's, he's going to be doing a, something with a team or something in media. I, I think he's more likely to be, be front office. I think he's more likely to do a, a, a Manning cast, a simulcast, tarps off simulcast watching games on, on a national network. I think I think he could dabble into media. That's how entertaining Maybe he, is he wants time. to coach so he can just still be on the road and around the guys, though. But coaches, you can't hang with the boys, so it's that might be tough almost. Yeah. But he, he, he has to stay in the game. Let's put it that way. Joe, we're here whenever you're ready, buddy. One of our white wheels. Love to get him on here. All right, before we go any further, here's a few words from our friends at Labatt Blue. Sadly, summer has come to an end. But that doesn't mean the Labatt Blue Light should stop flowing. Whether you're on the golf course, at Beer League, or watching some football, you can't find a better beer than a fresh Labatt Blue Light. Lots of things are better together. Hockey, food, golf. But if you really want to take things to the next level, Drink some Labatt Blue Lights with your friends and live life to the power of we. I can't stop thinking about our time at the Chicklets Cup, man. Labatt Blue Lights flowing all weekend. The beautiful Labatt Silo Blue Lights all over the place right by the river. But remember, take a page out of the old Labatt Blue Light book and enjoy your beers together so you can live life to the power of we. You can find Labatt at labattusa.com slash finder. Uh, not the only retirement since our last episode. Zach Cassian retired as well. Uh, 12 NHL seasons with Buffalo, Vancouver, Edmonton, and Arizona. He went 13th overall back in 2009. 706 regular season and playoff games. Did either of you guys uh, play with him at all uh, during your no, career? No, I didn't. No, we had him okay. in Arizona these last couple of years and uh, got to spend a little time with him. Just, you know, congrats on a heck of a career. You know, he was a... A great player in junior, uh, came into the league as a high draft pick, um, you know, had some troubles early on, but uh, figured things out and and ended up having a great career and, and making some good dough. I would say his best years were spent in Edmonton, yeah. and that fan base loves him. He had some big offensive years yep. and, and carried over that offensive play that he, that he showed in junior. So overall, man, heck of a career. I, I wish it would have lasted a little bit longer for him, but uh, hey, man, that's... Uh, some, some some good time in the league. Absolutely. And, and one more. This is a, a name a lot of folks might not have heard for a while. Thomas Pelkanek, uh, Montreal Canadian for a very long time. He retired as well. He hasn't played the NHL since the 2018-19 season, but he played 1,095 regular season and playoff games in the NHL, most with Montreal, a uh, couple with Toronto. He's been in with Cladno over in the – uh, the well, Czech, I was it not Czech Republic. I know they don't like it when you say Czechia, Czech, Czech yeah. Republic. Yeah, fuck, they they say they don't like it. So Czech Republic, I'll say. Uh, either way, he's all done. I mean, he was a great player. Went back in the day. He yeah, always he had the, was the uh, super skilled, undersized. Before you saw a lot, a lot of smaller guys playing in the NHL. Um, he basically like pissed everyone off so much like he he wasn't a dirty player or anything but he was always there picking your pocket he was always there he's always in the way defensively and then he could make some big time plays I mean those couple runs the Canadians had um the year that they upset Washington I think when Washington won the president's trophy was that their year he was just a big time player and it seemed like the more important the games the better he played so just a super skilled forward that was great on both sides of the puck. And I just remember playing against him knowing he had to know where he was on the ice. He's the guy that's picking off passes. He's the guy that's getting behind you on the offensive side. And all of a sudden, he's going to break away. So he was a great player who had a hell of a run. I mean, I didn't even realize he played that many games, but I should have with yeah. how long he was around. All right, everybody. We're going to wind up the show here in a couple of minutes. And, you know, obviously, it was a horrific uh, weekend for the hockey community and you know, we, we always debate when, when awful tragedies happen. Should we talk about it off the hop? Should we do it later? You know, we, we people come here for an escape to have fun. And, you know, we, we decided we were going to put, put it on the end because it didn't feel right to talk about it at the front and then try to do a show after. And I don't think the the listeners were like it. It, it wasn't really what we want to do. So, uh, obviously, we're talking about uh, Adam Johnson, uh, Nottingham Panthers over in the uh, English League. Uh, just a, a horrific accident. He, he got a skate blade to his neck and... He, he died shortly after um, they took him to the hospital and he didn't survive. And it's it just uh, horrific. This is a nightmare thing to, for any 
friend, family, whatever, uh, people who cover the game. And uh, would you, you just run out of words, Paul? I, Paul, I, I just feel like I got to throw it to one of you guys. I, I just, you just don't know the proper words to say in a situation like this because everyone's just hurt, man. It's just like I, I saw the news official at five in the morning, and I sat in my fucking recliner and cried like a baby. If my wife came out, she <laughs> would have thought I had a midlife crisis. I was just, they were so fucking upsetting that this guy's out there playing a game and. You know, uh, it's yeah. I think it was a freak accident. I know the internet's being the fucking internet, but I, I you know, I, I love hockey players. I love the guys who play this game. I, I can't imagine that there would be any sort of fucking uh, malicious factor to this, but I, it, it's heartbreaking. And Biz, let me go to you first, man. It's just, it's just. Yeah, awful. I mean, all right. Well, first of all, great job. It's a, a very, very difficult thing to talk about, and you're not alone. Like I was on my my hike yesterday, just thinking about like you know what we we're gonna say about this and. Um, I would probably say that the most gruesome thing I've, I've ever seen happen on an ice surface. Um, I just, I, I can't imagine what, what his family's going through right now. And, um, just in, in, in an insane event and, uh, just a traumatic experience for everybody involved. Like the, the, the fans that were there, the, the, the players on both teams, like, the, anybody involved in this situation, this is is, is just horrible. It, it sparks the conversation of, of you know, what are we going to do moving forward in, in order to prevent against this? And you know, in a sometimes people forget like hockey is played so fast. These guys at some points are traveling what 30, 35 miles an hour out there, and they're playing with with blades on the bottom of their feet and. You, you, you've seen it happen before in instances where, you know, guys have ended up being saved when, when something drastic like this has happened. And when, if you, if you have seen the video and like I said, it, it's horrific, it just, it's such an impactful moment. And with the way that the, the skate hits him and they were unable to, to, to save his life. And, uh, it, it's, it's horrible for, for the, for the hockey community. You know, you think you look at, you think of the past of, of days where something happened, in the hockey mu- community that you'll, you'll never forget whether it's the, the locomotive plane crash or, uh, the humble Bronco crash. This is one of those moments where it, it just, I'll, I'll never forget where I was when I, when I found out and then saw what happened and, and wit, I, so the the way that he was described, it, it, he was such a humble kid and a kid who always wanted to to put the work in in order to be the best at what he did. And it's obvious that he did that, where he worked all the way up the ranks to end up playing games for the Pittsburgh Penguins. And you know, some of the time at the end of your career, and after that, you know, he went back down to the minors and then he played overseas. I, I believe in the DEL before this year, where he went to the EIHL, which is the English league, and you think about guys at the start of their career and they, they work towards the NHL and on the back half, they, they kind of want to ride into the sunset and there to be some form of transition before they end up hanging them up. And, you know, they sometimes go to these types of leagues and, you know, I, he went over there to enjoy himself and continue to play the game that he loves. And, and he did so and, and never in a million years did him and his, or his family expect something like this to happen. And it's just so fucking tragic for, a kid this young to lose his life to, 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 and to something that happened playing the game that he loves with. And that's just where it really hits you and, yeah. and how, how quickly it happened. Yeah. It's been, it's been uh really difficult to just read and, and, and see the pictures of them. And, you know, Mike Russo did an amazing job in the athletic. If you can check it out, he interviewed a lot of his former teammates, kid from Hibbing, Minnesota, Um, went to University of Minnesota Duluth he tells a story in there when he was playing high school hockey his team's down 4-1 he goes out gets a natural hat trick in the playoffs Um, an amazing skater right this kid was so fast and 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 everyone just talked about how much they loved him as a as a guy I I saw a former teammate of mine Garrett Wilson a a great a great dude and and he put up a post with him said "We're, we're gonna miss you uh, gone way too soon and I just asked him you know what was he like and he said he was the, the best guy he said everyone loved being around him he was quiet but he just dropped these one-liners I guess he you know he had this dry sense of humor and just cheered everyone up and then to see what happened and and, and I can't imagine um, what his family's going through I, th- I, th- I think he was recently engaged you're just so heartbroken oh. you're just so sad thinking of his family like getting this news like he's four thousand miles away and 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 no one ever thinks this would happen and i mean we had uh 
close to two years ago, the, the kid Teddy Balkan, the same thing happened. And he was playing at Brunswick School. And it's like, at some point, you got to you got to you got to talk about like like neck guards. And, I, and I'm looking at a picture of Ryder and Wyatt here. And I ordered a I ordered a, a, a shirt with a neck guard, you know, right when this happened. It's just so traumatic and such a tragedy to, to have this happen and and maybe have people start talking about like, I don't care how bad you think you look or how dumb you think your gear wear is like we're talking about life and death. And like, what other sport are you seeing people dying in? And, and this this poor kid and and my only thing that I th- that I've tried to think and is is at least he he died doing what he loves, you know. But it, it's not it's not fair because, as Biz said, like he's over there and he's finishing on his career and he's looking forward to the rest of his life. And I I can't not say that 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 was a reckless play. Like I, that kid did not mean to do that. It was a reckless play. And, and and when you're playing on you're playing on knives, you're skating around on these knives, and the game is so fast that you just you see it. And you'll just never forget it. As as you oh. mentioned, Biz. But to be able to to read the stories that Russo had from former teammates, and to be able to talk to a former teammate and kind of hear what type of guy he was, it's it, it just makes you that much more heartbroken and. You just think of his his family and his friends and what he meant to all these people and him getting out and you know that that clip's gone gone online and I I can't watch those things but I I, I had I had to see what happened after all this discussion and I just I just rather rather see the the first NHL goal in Minnesota in his home state for the Penguins or the or the overtime winner to send Minnesota Duluth to the Final Four against BU and. It's just life is not fair, um, and we've talked a lot about just kind of appreciating what you have every day. Like you never know what's coming next, and to get this news and see what happened, it, it, oh, it was just it was awful. absolutely heartbreaking. But I I would like to see and, you know neck guard neck guards aren't even mandatory in USA hockey. They are in Canada. They are in Sweden. Like that should be something they look into. If you can prevent something, if you can prevent this. Maybe that's a positive that it comes out of this horrible tragedy. His family doesn't want to hear that, I'm sure, but it's just looking forward. It's just, what do you say about something like this? I, I think say? it's probably something that that should be grandfathered in, um, and and where like even going back to when um, when Carlson got cut on the back of uh, like in his Achilles. Like I started wearing Kevlar socks, and then you go back to last year when Evander Kane ended up getting skating over skated over on his arm and. You know, I know that they do have the 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 Kevlar wristbands, or but at a certain point, you have to look to evolve, and and I don't know if there's something that they can figure out in order to make like a like a turtleneck type thing that so is to- Kevlar. So TJ Oshie's company, War Road, War makes Road. them, and I actually they're sold out, and I I bought one from Bauer through Pure Hockey, and it is it's an undershirt with the Kevlar protection in the neck. And and I think a lot of thing is going back. Guys, I don't want to wear that. I don't want to wear that. It's like, well, at some point, maybe the league has to make a decision for people. And I hate sounding like somebody forcing an adult what to do, but it's possibly preventable. And Biz, my thing is like going back to Carlson and it happened to Clutterbuck and it happened to Kane and it happened, Jason Dickinson got one in the neck. Look what happened to Lauco. How lucky was Lauco on the Bruins? And the speed of the game, this game is so fast now that this is happening more and more. This didn't used to happen this often. And I think the speed has really changed and, and, and how guys are driving the net. And it's just it's just a tragedy that maybe could be preventable. And who knows, right? If it happens in the right spot, fuck, man. Like, But at least if you have something to, to, to give yourself a chance. Yeah. And, they, but, and, 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 and in some cases, the, it cuts through the Kevlar. And you see examples of it with the with the with the socks, but it's more of like to to try to slow down and and decelerate the the laceration. And uh, I think that I would assume after what's happened that that more of it is looked into. And I wouldn't be shocked if if this is something that ends up being grandfathered in. And you know, I was I tend to view myself as I guess more of an old school guy where you know I wasn't even crazy about when they said that that visors were going to come into play. And I it eventually eventually was something that was going to be grandfathered, so it wasn't going to be something that affected me at the NHL level. It ended up in the minors, but you just have to at a certain point evolve. And with after after seeing that video, I couldn't imagine if you've seen it how you would go against the fact to implement neck guards at a lower level to end up grandfathering it. I just simply can't. And as hard headed as, as I am about certain issues and certain things, sometimes I would. I would definitely recommend that that players consider doing it. So, 
I don't. Uh, but yeah, it's hard I mean, to just end seeing this that, like I, I don't know, I don't know if I could play the game of hockey if I was in the game and, and saw that. Like, I just can't imagine what what teammates and the opponents and, and the Ugh. fans in that building. I just, it's just a, a true tragedy. And we're, we're thinking of Adam Johnson. We're thinking of his family. And like I said, he was doing something he loves. If you're looking for a positive out of something this horrible, he was playing the game he loves and um, gone way too soon. It, yeah, I, I was still his, his family with friends and, and teammates. And I, I guess one thing I want to add is, you know, we know, we know how poisonous and toxic online could be. And, you know, I, I, I you know, we don't know if this uh, Matt Petgrave, I don't think he had any ill intention. I think people like we, we do when we, we watch a hit, we, we kind of frame by frame it. And, and we always make the point, say, hey, this is slow speed. I, I think people are uh, maybe drawing some wrong conclusions perhaps like watching a, a one or two second clip well i just I'm said a, something i just i right. i just said something it was i it was a little reckless and that yeah, kid it, did it, not mean to fucking do that jesus no. christ but like it was a little reckless and i don't think it's fair for me to sit up here and give my honest opinion and, and say otherwise but all right what you're talking about the stuff online that's fucking toxic and yeah. people that have made this somehow political for clicks and views go fucking rotten hell but, yeah, it, sorry, yeah. but yeah, it's just exactly that's what I was alluding to. It's just people exploiting this. I mean, a, a, a young guy is is dead. A lot of people are traumatized. People in the arena, his teammates, everyone around there, and people are exploiting this for, for their own clicks or, or, or whatever. And, and you know, I, just my original point is that you know when you we've talked about it before it hits for the last seven years. When you slow them down, you do it frame by frame. It tends to look worse, or so there looks to be intention where there isn't. And I think if you just kind of go back and watch the whole thing, it happens in a blink. I, I can't, I can't imagine. And again, maybe it's just my my love of, of this sport and, and the players in it that I, I have a hard time thinking that a, a guy would intentionally do that. And the the video's blurry. Uh, it's not the best video to draw conclusions, but you know, just don't be fucking assholes about it. I mean, I, you know, I, people are just being shitheads about it. And like you said, wait, it's they're globbing onto these things and, and making it a, a, a cause for the wrong reason. So uh, we're just, we're broken. We're gutted. It's, it's just a sad thing. And uh, I guess, like I said, we'll end with, uh, again, sending our condolences to, to Adam's family, friends and teammates. And uh, unfortunately, Adam, Adam wasn't the, the, only terrible news this weekend. And, you know, the people might, this might sound superficial, but Matthew Perry, man, a uh, star, one of the, the biggest shows of all time. Friends, I, I know I grew up with it. Some of you guys might have saw the reruns. And I, I was at the Bruins game the other night, and my buddy showed me the, his phone, and I looked at it. It was just one of those, like, what? You know, like, you know, he's had his issues and substance abuse and whatever, but just, it's just like a punch to the gut when you hear like a, a guy like that, that young and that talented and ha had his troubles. It, it, it was just, sucks man it just sucks to, to lose someone that young and also lewis and main i mean we're doing with his wit g uh the fact that this fucking foolishness happens all the fucking time in this country i'm sick of fucking hearing cities and towns with fucking strong at the end of it you know what i mean like this strong that's strong because fucking some asshole fucking blows people away because he's fucking whatever his fucking issue is and these, you know, the fucking no reason that a fucking guy should have a fucking whatever you want to call it, fucking machine gun, this, that, the, look at the fucking thing was designed to kill people in war fucking 30 years ago. Civilians should not have the thing. I don't give a fuck. I'm pro fucking gun ownership. My mother carries. Nobody needs fucking machine guns. And this fucking happens over and over and fucking over again. And the fucking ship sailed in Connecticut when all those kids died and this country did not a fucking thing. They crossed the Rubicon then. I'm fucking frustrated. I hate it that we do this all the time. People need to clean it up. I don't know what the fucking solution is, but our government has fucking failed us. I'm sorry. I get emotional about it, but this shit should not keep fucking happening in this country. Sorry, boys. No, I mean, that's well a, said, that's, brother. All right, that's boys. Well like, said. Yeah. And RA, I think the main message is yeah, treat each other well, be kind. Um, world's hard enough as it is without having support from friends and strangers. So. Everyone, have a good week. Count your blessings. Hug your loved ones. And um, have a great week. We'll see you next week.